Good morning. Yes, we should be starting. Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to the second day of the conference. Uh, we have a, a session three that will start now and uh, I will be the chair. The presenter is Felipe Alves. Felipe is a senior economist at the Bank of Canada. He graduated in economics at NYU Stern Business School in 2020. Uh, he has published in the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking and his fields of expertise are macroeconomics, monetary economics, labor and computational tools. You have 45 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Today I'm going to present joint work with Gianluca, which is called Some Like a Hot, Inclusive Monetary Policy Under Your Coons Hypothesis. Okay. So let me start by saying what is what is Okun's conjecture, right? So we have like this old paper by Okun from 1973, where he conjectured that a high pressure economy, where he's thinking an economy that is running a low level of unemployment has the potential to persistently improve the economic condition of less advantaged workers, allowing them to find steady employment, build up their skills, and climb the job ladder. In the paper, Okun is also recognizing that running this high-pressure economy has potential costs in terms of inflation, right? And has this really nice quote where he says that the sacrifice of upward mobility brought down by this high, running a high-pressure economy must be carefully reckoned as one of the high costs of accepting slack as an insurance against inflation. So why do we think that this is interesting? We think that this is extremely interesting because it seems to be reflected on the change in the Fed's framework that occurred over 2020, in particular with respect to the employment mandate. So the Fed in 2020 changes the employment mandate to recognize that the maximum employment should be a both broad-based and inclusive goal. Okay, and it did so by recognizing that running the economy hot might bring benefits to low-income communities. Now, what does that mean in practice? Let me give you just some motivation by looking at how the Fed behaved over the past two recessions. Okay, so here I have a figure. On the top we have inflation year over year, and the vertical dash blue lines indicate the point at which the Fed start climbing rate following the two past recessions. So we go back to 2016, where the Fed was still operating under the previous regime. And we see that around 2016, first months almost, as soon as inflation starts to pick up, it's still below 2%, but it starts to pick up, the Fed initially starts raising uh, nominal rates. It does by so little at the beginning, and then at a more at a more aggressive rate. And if you look at inflation behavior following that, it seems to be very successful at obtaining a stable level of inflation around 2%. If you move to now to unemployment, unemployment seems to be going down following the Great Recession and a very accelerated speed. When the Fed kind of raises the nominal rate, that unemployment still kind of decreases. It does so whenever unemployment is around 5%. But if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see that the, the level of the, or the speed at which unemployment decreases seems to have this accelerated a little bit. Now we move on. Oh, sorry. Now we move on. Fast forward to 2022, where the Fed is already operating under the new regime. And we see that the Fed only starts raising nominal rates at, two, at the big first months of 2022, where inflation is already running almost at 8% per year. Okay, the consequence of that on the labor market is that that recovery that started following the COVID recession seems to be prolonged and you get unemployment falling at a very high speed and whenever the Fed's kind of raising rates, unemployment is already below 4%. So that is the sense in which we think that the Fed is internalizing or has changed its attitude by recognizing that running the economy hot might be beneficial especially to some specific demographic groups of people. 
So what is that we do in this paper? We are motivated by this shift in policy, which seems to have embraced some of that Ockham's hypothesis. And what we are going to do is we build a quantitative Hank model with three state labor market models. So it's going to be workers that are employed, workers that are unemployed, and workers that are out of the labor force. And we try to include several mechanisms that we think that give rise to this Ockham hypothesis that we can test. We are going to calibrate the model to the US economy and we are going to use that to simulate some counterfactuals under more inclusive monetary policy rules. We are going to use those simulations of counterfactuals to then access what is the trade-off between inflation and both aggregate and distributional labor market outcomes. What is that we find? What is that we find, at least so far? Okay, we're going to, I have to say that these are all very preliminary results. First rule that we are going to try as inclusive is exactly the average inflation target. And what we find is the average inflation target does not look like an inclusive policy in the sense that it doesn't seem able to run a high pressure economy. And as, as we kind of working on it, we're realizing that any symmetric rule, and that's the way that we implement the average inflation targeting, is not going to be able to run an economy persistently hot over a long business cycle. So to the extent that average inflation targeting does promote some force to keep rates, real rates lower for longer following recessions, you have the same force that would keep real rates higher for longer following high inflation. What we do find that seems like a rule that could potentially run the economy hot or run a high pressure economy in the sense of cone is an asymmetric policy rule. In particular, a rule that is more accommodative to during expansions and reacts more aggressively during recessions. And that rule can generate at the cost of two to three percentage points of additional inflation on average, at least on our current calibration exercises, effects over the labor market. So on average, we are obtaining that average unemployment is falls by half percentage point and the participation increases by half a percentage point. And again, in, in align with the Okun's conjecture, the effect seems to be larger at the bottom of the skew distribution. So the effect at the 10th percentile of the skew distribution is that participation to increase by almost two percentage points, while labor income increases by 6%. Because the effects are larger at the bottom than at the top, we also get the fact that this alternative rule reduces earnings inequality, here measured as the P90 to 10 ratio, by over five percentage points. Okay. Now, before I go into the model, Kuhn is writing his paper back in the 70s, and from the 70s to today, we have somewhat accumulated a lot of empirical evidence of the mechanism that he's kind of conjecturing whenever he's, I cited that code, right? And I wanna go through, before I go through the paper, three of the mechanisms that we think are important and that we're trying to include in the paper. The first one, you kind of have heard yesterday, again and again and again, is the fact that workers are unevenly affected by recessions, okay? So yesterday, in the presentation of Alice Dair, we kind of talk about these incidence functions where some workers' labor earnings are more affected with recessions than others. I'm going to do that over the unemployment space, okay? So what we have here is the level of unemployment for workers of different skill level, you can think of those as basically wages, during different points of the business cycle. So, Pick the blue line, which would be a kind of the unemployment rate doing an expansion. Unemployment rate for workers of high skill is low, around 2.5 percentage points, while the unemployment rate of workers at the bottom end of the skill distribution runs at almost 8%. Now, over the business cycle, this unemployment is going to go up, say, during a recession for all workers of the skill level, but workers at the bottom seem to be disproportionately affected by that with their unemployment rate going from seven to almost 15%, while workers at the top see their unemployment raising by 2.5 to 5%. So here, a monetary policy rule that keeps this high pressure economy is especially beneficial to the low income groups, okay? Now, it's not only operating through that, the fact that workers at the bottom end are more successful to unemployment, we do know today that there's a large evidence that unemployment tends to have very large and persistent effects. 
So a second change that we think is important is through this human capital accumulation. Workers' earnings tend to grow while they are employed, and workers do lose earnings upon displacement. They are very large, persistence, and higher during recessions. So here we have a plot from Davis von Watcher showing exactly comparing the, the path of earnings from workers who get displaced versus workers who do not get displaced during expansions and recessions. So you can look at each either graph for the first point is earnings kind of upon displacement fall by 20 to 30 percent. And you can see that those effects are very persistent. So even five to 10 years after displacement, these workers relative to workers who did not lose their jobs is still somewhat 10 percent below. So again, a monetary policy that runs a high pressure economy can either raise the level of human capital by keeping these people in employment, or at least limit the loss by avoiding that these people lose their jobs. And finally, the last mechanism that we want to consider is what Hobjin and Sain call the participation cycle. So here we have a figure of participation over, uh, from 1980 to until 2019. The actual participation is plotted by the, the black line. It's kind of hard to see the shaded areas, but if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see that over some periods of recessions here, participation tends to fall a little bit. So around 89, around 2001, and during the Great Recession. But now looking at actual participation is, and trying to identify the cyclical moves is kind of hard because there are other confounding factors, long-term trends like female forced participation, and aging of the population. What these guys are going to argue is that if you isolate the participation movements that comes from flows between employed and unemployed, you actually get the participation is pretty cyclical. And that is the red line in the bottom. And that tends to fall on every single recession over that period and tends to recover over every single expansion. That's maybe seeing a little bit counterintuitive at first, right? How it can be that a flow that is not crossing the participation margin affects the level of participation. After all, these people are still moving between employed and unemployed, so they're still participating. And the reason why it does is that the attachment of these two groups of people to the labor market is very different. So the unconditional rate at which unemployed workers drop out of the labor market, so the U to N flows, is an order of magnitude higher than the rate at which employed workers drop out of the labor market the e 2 n flows. So again, a high pressure economy that sustain employment and avoid these people from losing their job is going to potentially have an effect by sustaining the labor force participation. With that said, let me then jump through the, some details of the model, okay? So workers are going to be heterogeneous on skill. That is going to be for us similar to what Adrian and Alistair was presenting today, the idiosyncratic income risk, okay? But we think of skill as both capturing observable characteristics as well unobservable characteristics that affect workers' labor market outcomes and earnings. Workers can be in one of five labor market states, which we denote by S, okay? So workers can be employed. They can be unemployed and ineligible for unemployment insurance that is U0 or they can be unemployed eligible for unemployment insurance that is U1. And there's going to be two states relative to a non-participant. We have what we call a passive non-participant and an active non-participant. And these are going to be different along the margin that the passive non-participant is not going to be receiving any job offers and is not going to be actively choosing whether or not they participate. So this is just one state where we force people out of participation. They have to sit on that participation until they are hit back to an active non-participant. And the reason why we do that is that in the model, the active choice to participate or not is going to be made solely on the level of wealth and on your productivity. But in the data, we think that there are other dimensions through which people may decide to leave the labor market that we are not capturing the model. So think of you leave the labor market in order to take care of a relative because of childbirth, because of a health shock. So these are all modeled throughout this transition to active non to the passive non-participant. Now, there are going to be transitions among all these states, some endogenous, some exogenous. So there are going to be exogenous job separation rates, so transitions from employment to unemployment, exogenous unemployment to employment transitions, job finding rates, 
and also with a lower rate, some job finding rate out of non-participation. And we are going to make those all a function of this QZ. So if you remember yesterday Gaston presentation, he was exactly showing us some evidence that the separation rates tend to vary across people in different quintiles. That's exactly what we are going to allow here. There's going to be this exogen switch in and to and out of passive non-participation. They state N is zero. And there's going to be an endogenous participation choice from workers that are on the active non-participant state. They may choose to join the unemployment pool and from the participation state back to the active non-participation. Now, how is that your skills are going to evolve? Your skills are going to evolve depending on your employment status. So there's going to be some reversion to the mean captured by the parameter theta and some volatility captured by sigma z. If you are employed, your skills are going to tend to appreciate and go up by a rate delta z plus. If you're unemployed or out of employment, I should say, your skills tend to depreciate. They go down by a certain rate delta z minus, okay? So workers who do not are currently employed, they observe their skills depreciate and again, because their frictions that they face depend on their Z level, they see their prospects in the labor market to deteriorate, okay? So this is going to create this slippery slope experience in the labor market, that whenever you get fired, your skills tend to go down, so your earnings upon replacement are going to be lower, but also your prospects in the labor market tend to deteriorate. So it's going to be harder for you to find a job. Whenever you find a job, there's going to be a less secure job, which is more likely to throw you back to unemployment, okay? So utility is going to be log consumption. Individuals pay a fixed cost of participating. That is different whether you're employed than unemployed. And there is some this utility cost associated with hours worked for the employed. What about the budget constraint? We can write the budget constraint depending on the state of the labor market that you are. If you're employed, you're consuming, you're saving here on um, a mutual fund, much like what at least that you had yesterday. You have some return RT on those savings. You receive some lump sum transfer from the government of IT, and you receive labor earnings that are proportional to your skill level Z and the number of hours worked HT, okay? And those get taxed by some certain fraction. If you are unemployed, but eligible for unemployment insurance, your budget constraint looks pretty much the same, but instead of receiving wages from firms, you're receiving some unemployment insurance that depends on your skill level. If you're on one of the either states, either ineligible or out of participation, the only income that you receive is basically this lump sum transfer from the government. Now, we don't allow people to save, so they face this borrowing constraint. They must hold like a positive level of liquid assets. What are the choices the individuals are going to be making? As any, as any heterogeneous agent setting, individuals are going to be continuously choosing between consumption and saving, correct? But here they also have to make this participation choice, right? If I'm employed, do I want to keep working? If I am non-participation, do I want to join the unemployment pool? So that combines, here is just the, the language in continuous time, is combines this optimal control problem with our optimal stopping time problem. So how these things usually look like, this a problem with the fixed cost is just going to split the state space of the household or the worker into two regions. One region where you participate, a region where you don't participate. So here we have the state space for employed worker with his level of savings and say his log productivity. There is a threshold here denoted by the EN. Workers who fall to the right of that threshold decide to participate. Workers who fall to the left decide to leave the labor force. So participation is actually going to be more likely whenever you are productive. So you do want to work whenever you have high returns on working or whenever you're poor. So that, that extra income that you get from labor earnings is actually more valuable because of marginal utility of consumption. Workers who kind of fall close to the threshold may hit the threshold either because they save themselves out and they accumulated enough that so they feel comfortable sitting back home, or they may get hit by a negative productivity shock, which in point they decide to drop out of the labor force. Alternatively, they may also get hit with that passive non-participation shock, they are forced out of participation. What about the remaining model ingredients? That is going to be looking very similar to what 
Adrian presented yesterday, what Alice Day presented yesterday as well, and not by coincidence, mostly because I learned from reading you guys. <laughs> so there is going to be a monopolistic producer with flexible pricers and a linear technology. Okay, so output is just equal to, to the total input of labor, which here combines hours worked by the employed workers. There's going to be a labor union that sets wages subject to quadratic adjustment costs. So in a representative agent world, think of ERSEG. In a heterogeneous agent world, think of the work of Adrian, Ludwig, and Rogli. And as uh, Alice Dari was presenting yesterday, we are going to use the marginal rate of substitution in that union problem of a standing representative agent. So in his case, it was kind of we're using the representative agent of all workers. We are taking a standing representative agent representing the employed workers. Okay? So that is going to basically determine wage inflation as a function of the marginal rate of substitution and the real wages. Now, because firms are basically going to charge a markup over the marginal cost, and because of linear production function, their marginal cost is just nominal wages, that wage rigidity gets transferred to price rigidity, and we have that price inflation is equal to wage inflation. Okay? So I said that household wealth is just shares on this mutual fund. The mutual fund itself has some instruments that it can invest. It's either going to invest on government bonds or on, on firms' equity. So the markup generates a source of profits here for firms. Now, regarding labor market frictions, we could do two things here. We could do as Mario did yesterday, which is to set up a matching function, having firms posting up vacancies in order to meet up with workers, having workers searching and searching to the other side. Because of the heterogeneity that we want to include in terms of the Z, we're going to be doing something different. So at steady state, we're just think of these frictions as exogenous. And we are going to calibrate to match the average flows, and we are going to calibrate the dependency on Z as we get from the data. Now, out of steady state, I want those frictions to react to level economic activity, and I'll just make them a function of average hours work per work. Okay? So to the extent that there is a demand shock that pushes up the demand for labor, workers are going to be required to work additional hours. That's immediately going to affect the level of frictions to bring more people into employment. We have a government is going to issue that, taxes spent on transfers, and a monetary authority that sets a nominal rate based on central policy rule. Okay? What are the sources of aggregate fluctuations that we are playing around at this stage? We are thinking of having one demand and one supply shock. The demand shock is a wedge to the Euler equation, while the supply shock is just a wedge to that wage Phillips curve. So before I go to the exercise, let me just talk you through a little bit how the labor market looks through the lens of the model. And in terms of calibration, well, this is still somewhat preliminary, but I would say we are doing a somewhat reasonable job. So by picking up the level of frictions and some of the preference parameters, we are able to get close to the flow rates, okay? And in particular, see, observe that we do match the fact that I was referring to that the exit rate of unemployment seems to be an order of magnitude than an exit rate out of employment. We also do reasonably well at matching the stock level across the skill distribution, which we do not directly match. So we have that the solid lines are in the data, so the low skills tend to have higher unemployment rate and lower participation rates. The dotted lines are the model, and we do seem to capture the point at which these things go up, okay? Now, I told you a lot about the mechanism through which we think that the Occlusive hypothesis might be operating. How is that we include those to the model, okay? So the first, the uneven instance of business cycles, we are going to be including mainly through those skew-dependent transition rates, okay? So here we're back to the data. I want you to think on look at the blue line as the level of the job loss probability and the level of job finding probability across the skill distribution at steady state, okay? So, of course. Say a little more about the stochastic process for ZT. I can, 
let me see if I need to go back. Let me, there's no problem. So ZT is basically IAR1 in continuous time, right? So it has some reversion to the mean captured by theta and it has some volatility, so DW is just like a Brownian motion that gets affected by lambda Z. Now that mean, which you are reverting to, depends on whether you're employed or unemployed. So you have a positive, we are writing in terms of drift, so you have like a positive drift whenever you're employed. So for most of the state space, your skills are kind of growing up, and you have a negative drift whenever you're unemployed. So if you're out of a job for most of the space, there is some random is occurring for the most of the state space, you just tend to go down. So the, I was saying like the, the unevenness, so yesterday we saw, uh, at least they're kind of introducing that as unevenness through that incidence function that mapped your idiosyncratic productivity IT to a level of labor earnings. We're going to do that through the frictions. And I was calling attention, say, to the blue line, which tells a little bit how we calibrate those frictions at steady state. So on the left, we have the job separation rate for different levels of skill. On the right, we have the job finding rate for different levels of skills. And what I call attention is that the labor market experience for say someone with the average level of one seems to be very different than a, a, a low level of skills. So it's not only the case that low skilled workers have a much lower job finding probability, they also feature a much higher job, find, uh, job destruction rate. So again, it's that idea. It's harder for them to find a job. Whenever you do find a job, they tend to lose that job more frequently. Now, over the business cycle, here we have a, uh, how these transition rates are changing in the data. They seem to be moving mostly proportionally. And that's the assumption we're going to have in the model. In the model, they're going to move with respect to hours, but we're going to make it so that they move proportionally along the skill distribution. The rates are moving proportionally, but the impact on the unemployment, as I'm going to show you, is going to be disproportionate. In particular, we're going to capture the fact that work, that unemployment rate of workers at the bottom of the skill distribution is going to be more sensitive to shocks than the unemployment rate of workers at the high end of the skill distribution. Now, one thing is that not only workers are going to be unevenly exposed to the business cycle, that exposure is going to propagate through time exactly through these persistent effects from job losses. So on the left, I have the same figure that I showed you before. It's kind of the empirical evidence that average earnings of people who end up losing their jobs tends to fall by 20 to 40% on the year of displacement. It's very persistent. On the right, I have that replicated experiment in the model. And you can see that we don't get, we, we get close to the same amount of earnings reductions upon displacement. We don't get as many following five to s or 10 years, but it's still quite substantial. So the blue line is kind of the experiment done at steady state. Still the case that five to six years after earnings for the group of individuals who are, lose their job is almost 10% below and it's higher upon say a negative demand shock, okay? And it's higher upon negative demand shock because again, their job finding probability upon losing their job upon negative demand shock is smaller, so these people tend to spend more time unemployed, which through that skill process is going to depreciate their level of skills further and further. Finally, the third mechanism, which we call the participation cycle. So what we have here is the participation response to a negative demand shock in the blue we see that participation is strongly pro-cyclical, falls upon the negative demand shock. But I want to think how much of that movement in participation are coming from the movements between employment and unemployment, right? How much of that is coming from the fact that the employed face a higher attachment to the labor force? So in orange, what we do is that we draw what participation would have been had we changed only people from employment and unemployment while keeping fixed the inflow and outflow rates out of participation. So 
Once we do that, you see the participation is basically not moving at impact because we're just shifting people from employment to unemployment. But the fact that that unemployment pool kind of grows during recessions puts downward pressure on participation because their overall outflow rates higher than there was their employment. And that's comparing like the blue and the, the, the orange, you see that a large fraction of the moving participation is coming exactly through that channel. So when you put all those things together, right, and we look at what is the labor market outcomes to a de negative demand shock at different points of the distribution, what do is that we get? So here I'm plotting the unemployment rate, the participation, and labor earnings at the 25th percentile of the skill distribution versus the 75th percentile of the skill distribution. It's not only the case that unemployment rate goes up by more at the low end of the skill distribution, goes up by 25 percentage points relative to 10 percentage points. Participation rates falls by more, falls by 15 percentage points versus 0.5 percentage points. But it's also the case that labor earnings not only fall by more, it's falling almost by double, they're also more persistent. And again, it's also more persistent because they are triggering those other mechanisms, right? So people are going to stay long, there's a uh, larger fraction of people losing their job, but they're going to stay longer period unemployed, which depreciate their skills. So while on the 75 percentile, it kind of takes around 20 months to recover half of the losses on earnings, that is taking almost 60 months over 25th percentile. All right, so with that, let me use the, the remaining time that I have that I'll go through the counterfactual policy experiments. So we are going to focus on the period from 1990 to 2019, and our baseline simulation is going to assume that the Fed has followed a standard inflation targeting from that period, okay? With the RFs we have from the model, we are going to then invert the model to obtain a path for demand and supply shocks that perfectly match the unemployment and inflation rate during that period. So we are basically going to replicate in the model the unemployment rate from 1990 to 2020, as well as the price inflation. And then we are going to ask, how would the US labor market and inflation dynamics had been had the Fed followed a different monetary policy rule over that period. In particular, had the Fed followed a more inclusive rule. And the way we're going to do that is exactly using those filter shock, assuming that monetary policy was operating on inflation targeting, and feeding in under alternative monetary policy rules. So what are those rules? Our baseline rule is that the Fed's basically following inflation targeting with a standard reaction to inflation of 1.5 and a reaction to deviations of output from steady state of 0.05. Okay, we are going to look at two alternative inclusive rules. One of them is going to be average inflation targeting, which is basically the same reaction plus an additional consideration to pass average inflation, which here I'm denoting as gamma pi t, that is just a geometric average of past inflation. Here we are taking the, the rate to consider an average of the past, say, four years, so the past 48 months. I'm also going to look what I'm calling an asymmetric rule that is basically having different reactions to positive versus negative deviations of output. So here we want to consider a rule that is more accommodative during expansions and reacts more aggressively during recessions. So we are choosing an extreme case where it's basically not reacting to positive deviations on output gap and has uh, doubled the reaction to negative deviations to a negative output gap. So when we do that, what is that we get? So let me first focus on unemployment on the right-hand side. And let me first compare, say, the blue line, which is the one generated from inflation targeting, which again matches by construction the unemployment rate, versus the orange line, which is the AIT. So here, by the symmetry of AIT, I already kind of mentioned that you shouldn't get any persistent effects, so this should, series shouldn't have any different than average, but it could still look very different in terms of their volatilities. What we are finding, though, is that while AIT seems to dampen the responses to demand shocks, it does amplify responses to supply shocks. 
at NAT through the kind of filter demand supply shocks they're getting, we end up getting that AIT has very similar implications, at least in terms of quantities, as inflation target. It does generate, though, a less volatile inflation rate on the bottom, okay? Now, what does the asymmetric rule does? It does, as you would expect, it prevents unemployment from going to, to, to up during recessions and allows unemployment to fall by more during expansions. So the green line is not going to kind of fall always below the blue line of the recession. What we see in unemployment rate translates to participation as well as to output. And on average, we have that unemployment is running 0.5 percentage points below while participation is running 0.5 points above. The counterpart of that is exactly higher inflation. So we do see that inflation is on average three percentage points above what you would get on the blue line following, averaging, following the regular inflation target. Okay, so this is the impact on aggregate outcomes. What about the distributional ones? So here I'm plotting the unemployment rate at the 25th percentile on the left, unemployment rate at the 70th percentile on the right. So first, independently of the monetary policy rule that's being followed, you kind of see that these workers at the bottom end of distribution have a much more cyclical experience of the labor market than workers at the top. So their level of unemployment is fluctuating to a larger extent than workers at the top. That is what Erickson kind of calls this worker beta experience, right? Now, in terms of the rules itself, it seems that the asymmetrics benefiting both workers at the top and the bottom, the, the magnitudes of the difference are somewhat larger at the bottom than they are at the top. And that does translate not only to the labor market outcomes, but also to their consumption. And consumption, the gap between the blue and the, the green lines is higher for the consum average consumption on the 25th percentile than the 75th percentile. Another way of seeing those impacts over the distribution is to look at some inequality measures. We think of two. We look at the 75 to 25 percentile ratio for labor earnings as well for consumption. So first observation is that these things seem to grow up every single point in the recession, at every single recession episode of this period. AIT, again, is not doing much in terms of the, the results. The asymmetric rule is preventing inequality to go up by much, and it's reducing inequality by more during expansions. Now, going back to that Okun recognition of the trade-off, he kind of mentioned, right, that the sacrifice of upward mobility must be carefully reckoned with a high cost of accepting slack insurance as an insurance policy against inflation. I showed you the results of simulation for one particular asymmetric rule, what you could think of doing is varying those coefficients on inclusive rule and trace out this trade-off, okay? So the more asymmetric I get, more inflation I'm going to get from that rule, but potentially a higher benefit in terms of labor market outcome. So that's exactly what we, I'm plotting over the bottom in terms of the unemployment rate, participation, labor earnings, and these are all normalized so that more to the right means larger gain, okay? The red line shows the impact on the average of those variables. So that's why I was kind of mentioning that for a three percentage point higher inflation, you kind of get a half percent point reduction on average unemployment, half percent reduction in participation, and a one percent increase in labor earnings. But as the shaded region shows, and that is exactly the impact on the P10 versus P90 of the skill distribution, the distribution effects are also very large. So the gains in unemployment for the P10 are almost three times as large as the gain on the average, same participation, same in the labor earnings. And you can go from almost go back to inflation targeting, or you can consider potentially even more asymmetric rules, okay? With that, let me conclude by saying that today I showed you that monetary policy can, in principle, run a high-pressure economy that improves the labor market prospects of low-skilled workers at the cost of high inflation. What do we think are interesting things going forward? Again, inspired by the work that 
we saw yesterday, we want to do the comparison to fiscal policy. So potentially, do we also want to think on asymmetric fiscal rules? Okay. Second, right now, we are observing that these rules induce larger inflation, but it's not clear first what is this cost of average infl higher inflation in the model, and second, this cost as it is is kind of getting equally distributed cost. And we know from this recent episode of inflation that who bears ends up bearing the cost of inflation might depend heavily on the, the, on the on many factors, right? Now there are potentially many channels for which individuals are differentially affected by inflation. One we think that is interesting is and relates to what Elisa presented yesterday is exactly that the, the compensation of individuals along the, the wage distribution seems to be very different. In particular, the compensation of individuals at the high ends of the, the wage distribution is much more dependent on profits and bonuses than at the low end. To the extent these bonuses and profits can potentially react more flexible to the level of economic activity than say someone that is earning the minimum wage at the bottom, they could potentially have differential effects on inflation amounts, okay? With that, let me say thanks and let me pass the the mic door discussion. Okay. okay, thank you, Felipe. So now the discussant is Alexandre Janiak. Alexandre is associate professor of economics at Pontifical Uni Catholic University of Chile. He earned PhD in economics uh, jointly from two institutions, ECARES and, uh, and Sciences Po and his research focuses on macroeconomics and labor economics, and he has uh, published in European Economic Review, Journal of Monetary Economics, Economic Journal, uh, among others. So you have uh, 15 minutes. This works, yes. <laughs> Hello, so um, I, will be discussing, I will be discussing this paper by Felipe Alves and Jolo Caviente. So, Felipe, I liked your work. <laughs> so, um, in the paper, they, um, they hold like uh, several margins, uh, kind, I mean, exogenous, uh, the typical things that uh, referees don't like, you know. And in spite of uh, holding what uh, is exogenous, they, they get this rich dynamics, and uh, I found it was a very interesting uh, work, okay? So I, I tried to, I'm sorry about the, the kind of the heavy slide. I wanted to, it to fit in only one, you know, but basically what they do, you've seen, so they, they investigate the implications of several Taylor rules, and um, they, they have this uh, Okun hypothesis uh, in the, as, as a benchmark. Uh, basically, uh, they are asking whether um, uh, monetary easing, if I can call it this way, uh, can uh, improve labor market condi condition of the poorer workers through a better upward mobility, okay? And so they, they compare um, three types of rules, inflation targeting, average inflation targeting, and then at the end they show that um, uh, this asymmetric rule that is more aggressive in a recession can actually uh, improve the situation of the, of the poorer workers. So they rely on, on three empirical facts. Oops. Ah. Uh, so um, the first one is that poorer worker are more exposed to aggregate fluctuations. So in, in a recession, they would be hurt a lot uh, as compared to, to richer workers. Also, uh, when you reduce your job, you may suffer long-term productivity losses, okay? So this is not nice for them, you know? And finally, uh, poor workers are more likely to leave the labor force, okay? So as I said, they, they keep several transition pro, uh, probabilities or rates in this case because the continuous time model uh, exogenous. But the model uh, allows for endogenous participation decision. And also uh, they have like, um, uh, like the monetary part where uh, the, the monetary policy can affect uh, employment. No? So and they show that basically a recession uh, may affect primarily uh, marginal workers at the bottom of distribution, uh, uh, they would lose human capital and uh, they would suffer these persistent effects. Through monetary policy easing, 
uh, this would improve uh, the labor market condition. And in the end, they conclude that uh, the asymmetric Taylor rule uh, would be like the most friendly uh, from this perspective. Okay, so that's the paper in uh, chat. Okay, so I said um, um, the paper like keeps some margins exogenous, which are typically um, endogenous in uh, like I would say a textbook search and matching model. I'm thinking about the job creation condition uh, in their model, it's like, uh, I mean, there is a priority to move between employment states, but it is held exogenous. And also they have um, this assumption of, about wages. So, um, so what I want to do here is to basically convince uh, the potential referee, if I could say, that uh, actually in the end, if you could make these things endogenous, uh, you will likely get uh, the same type of, of mechanism in the model. Okay? So for instance, um, one assumption is they have is that they have this union that set wages for uh, all employed workers. They do it in a way to improve their welfare. And on the other hand, original search and matching models consider large bargaining. So clearly this assumption is made for practicability. You know, if you, uh, given this union thing, agents can take, the, can take wages as given uh, which is a lot like the resolution of the, of the model. Otherwise, when you have bargaining, so it's, it's well known, you, you may have like wages depend on the asset position of the workers. It's not very nice to, to, to work with this, uh, this element, uh, as uh, has been shown in this uh, paper by Crossland and Quarters. On the other hand, when you think about it, so they're talking about the US, it's true that the Bureau of Labor Statistics has been documenting that in 2021, about 10% of the workers uh, were be belonging to a union. So it's kind of weird to have this kind of assumption. Also, um, Colin Kruger uh, document uh, that a substantial share of uh, workers actually bargain over wages. That being said, I think that if they had gone through a more traditional route, um, their mechanism would be preserved in the model. And the reason is the following. So as it is well known also in the search and matching literature, the size of the, the match surplus influences um, the reaction of uh, job creation to aggregate fluctuation. Uh, typically, once your surplus is small, uh, you will have a large uh, reaction. When the surplus is big, uh, you would have a slower reaction, a smaller reaction. If you think of uh, lower skilled workers as having a smaller surplus, and you could have like a labor market for low skill, a labor market for high skill, you will naturally obtain in this context that um, the employment of low skilled wor worker would be more responsive to aggregate, oops, what did I do? To aggregate fluctuations as they do in their paper, okay? So this has been confirmed by um, this paper by uh, Longo and co-authors in a linear model. It's true that in the case of Felipe, he has a nonlinear model. So there are other things that may uh, go in the other direction for instance, like poorer worker, maybe more attached to the labor force, and in, this, and in the end, this, when this may dampen job separation, but I'm pretty confident that um, they would get nice results in, even in this uh, uh, alternative framework. Another thing you want to do maybe is to introduce capital, okay? So, um, just because Sofia Bauduco is the chair, I, I brought up uh, this paper, you know? So she, 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 well, it's not only her, it's uh, also uh, Algon and Rago who published this paper in uh, our, uh, Review of Economic Dynamics in 2010. So basically uh, what uh, Sofia Bauduco was doing is like to look at the impact of trend inflation in the context of uh, IRE type of model with capital accumulation. And she was looking at the, the intergeneity of the impact. Okay, and she was having a, a different impact uh, depending on where you are in distribution. So it's true that in the case of Felipe, it's not that he's looking at trade inflation, but you do have higher inflation under your asymmetric rule, okay? So what they, what, what you found is that um, inflation gives incentive to hold real assets. And in the end, the economy will uh, accumulate more capital, something that will happen in uh, Algon and Rago, okay? And so given that you have uh, more capital, on the one hand, you will have that the return on capital will go down because uh, capital uh, supply goes up. On the other hand, wages would go up because in the model, capital and labor are complement, okay? Given that 
um, poorer workers, basically their income depends on, um, on labor rather than capital, you would get that inflation is context would favor more poorer agents because they would earn higher labor income uh, as compared to the richer ones who would suffer a, a lower risk. Okay, so I, I'm pretty confident too that if you had to introduce capital into, this, uh, into, into their framework, you would also get uh, something that could help poorer workers like on the other market. That being said, um, that's what a model says. But it's true that um, when you think about it, um, in reality, it's not clear whether poor workers could face, I would say, um, a change in financial conditions would be more adapt, uh, would be as adapt um, as rich um, agents. Uh, so there is like, a, especially in development, like this huge literature on financial literacy um, that may imply that poor agents actually uh, would have a harder time to re-optimize their financial portfolio uh, when you change economic conditions, okay? So this idea has been pushed in a paper by uh, Erusan Ventura. Uh, it's like a, a paper 20 years ago uh, in the GME, where they show that actually, uh, because poor workers uh, basically hold more money, uh, inflation would act as a regressi regressive consumption tax, okay? Uh, on the other hand, you could say that uh, inflation would favor borrowers and would hurt lenders. Uh, so given that uh, some of the poor agents, people closer to the constraint maybe, would be borrower, this could also uh, act the other way around. Okay. Um, so I was very interested in this um, asymmetric rule uh, uh, you showed us. And when I was reading the paper, I had this um, subjective belief that actually a monetary, monetary policy is asymmetric in, the, in reality. Okay. Um, like being more aggressive in a recession and not so much in an expansion. I must say that uh, that belief is clearly uh, biased by the fact that the underlying chunks, the underlying shocks are typically asymmetric too. Uh, so in a recession, uh, typically, it hits harder the economies so than the expansion. So I, I tried to do some Google search and try to find whether um, uh, people have been documenting that um, the Taylor rules for, uh, I would say, there is inflation targeting in theory, but maybe in practice, they do behave asymmetric. So I found this paper by people at DCB that were saying that um, uh, for the Fed, actually they've been um, behaving kind of asymmetrical especially in, so in times of financial recession, they would have this um, uh, asymmetric bias. Um, however, my guess is that, so I cannot really compare the numbers in the paper because it's like Markov switching process, you know, you, you, you don't have a coefficient that you compare to your point 0.10 that you had in your, in your paper. Uh, my guess is that uh, your asymmetry would be stronger than what people have been documenting. But uh, that's something that, um, I was thinking about. So finally, I have like um, some other questions, uh, comments. Uh, will be, it would be great to, to give a bit more information about um, how the intensive margin and the extensive margin behave in the paper. So um, especially for the mechanism uh, that is going on. So I don't know whether the volatility of the extensive and distinctive margin are in line with the data. Um, that, that would be great to to document that. Um, you were talking about um, labor earnings inequality. Uh, it was, wasn't clear to me whether it was like in nominal terms, in real terms. If it's a real terms, given you divide by the price at higher inflation, do, do you have like uh, mechanically that inequality goes down because just, you're just increasing the price? I don't know. Uh, it would be great to, and then I have like some minor comments about that I can send you about typos and uh, precision. So thank you, uh, Felipe, for the opportunity. Uh, okay, thank you. So now we have time for questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, so I was just wondering whether the incidence 
of these separations and things, since you're focusing on the skills acquisition and stuff, whether there might be a way to think about it across age profile. Across the age profile, yes. So like maybe if you had some form of a perpetual youth model, but then you put in an eight, uh, like a drift on, uh, on your ZT process, that's why I was asking about the ZT process, it might be a way to kind of get at that, so that the incidence um, across different age groups of skill acquisitions. I mean, everybody seems to be saying that you know, the, the downturns hurt young people so much, and, and it might be a good way to get that. Uh, thanks very much. This is a, a very nice paper. Uh, I learned a lot, and I thought it was very interesting. I just have, a, uh, I have several comments, actually. Um, the Fed did change the language in our, in our uh, long-run statement that we do every uh, January. And we did include this new language, broad-based and inclusive uh, employment. So uh, I'll just give you my take on that. Uh, without It's Big Ten language, so you tried to get everybody on the committee to sign on to this. But the, uh, my take on it was that it was a recognition of uh, how we talk about macroeconomics, generally speaking, because usually we look at some social welfare measure or something that tries to take into account everybody in the whole economy. So uh, we were getting criticism from you know, some quarters that we only care about Wall Street or something like that. So this is a way to say, no, uh, macroeconomics is about everybody in the whole economy. So to me, that's what we were trying to do there. And I, I would just point out for this paper especially that we did change something else in the uh, long, statement of long run uh, goals which is the word deviations uh, was changed to the word shortfalls. So what this meant was that the deviations language came, I believe, from Ben Bernanke, uh, who was doing a kind of standard geeky thing like we would do at a conference like this, uh, where you say, uh, okay, it's deviations from the natural rate of unemployment that we want to minimize. Uh, we change that only to shortfall. So that's where the asymmetry would come in, and uh, it would mean that if unemployment was low, but inflation was also low, you know, we would be less concerned about that situation than we used to be. And this is very tangible because in the 2015 2016 period, uh, uh, when uh, Chair, uh, Janet Yellen was chair, we actually the committee worked hard to raise rates during that period, even though inflation was below target, on the grounds that we thought the, uh, the labor market was too tight and we were going to get inflation in the future. So it was a reaction to that. And so I think the shortfalls is something maybe you should cite here as a, um, as a motivator. On the labor force participation, um, I didn't, I'm not sure I got the whole uh, picture here, but it looked a little exogenous. Um, I've always felt on this issue that participation, if you want to get serious about it, would have home production as part of, at least a simple model of home production as part of the calculation. And then you'd be wondering if you're distorting the home production margin, uh, you're sort of enticing people into the labor market that would really be have higher utility from being at home uh, and producing home goods. And uh, so I think I've, I always harp on this in all these conferences because uh, the way policymakers talk about labor force participation and a lot of economists is just that we want everybody in the whole economy to participate. And I don't think we really, uh, that's not really what we want. We want the sort of the optimal allocation of work within the household, something like that. Um, average inflation targeting was also set up to confront the zero lower bound on, uh, on the policy rate. Uh, I didn't see any discussion here about the zero lower bound. So um, the idea was to, uh, because of the zero lower bound, uh, you're going to miss your inflation target to the low side when the zero lower bound is a factor. And because of that, you should probably overshoot sometimes. So I think if you want to address this issue, you probably have to bring effective lower bound. Also, I don't know if the simulations that you had ever produced a zero 
uh, policy rate or not. So that would be something to look at. Uh, the inflation tax uh, was discussed here just now. Um, I, th I do think you know, something like a Rosa Ventura where uh, inflation is a regressive consumption tax, you know, should be in here in order to get a balanced assessment um, of what's going on. And then finally, uh, the, do the Phillips curve estimates coming out of this, would they fit the data? Uh, this sounds like there's a very strong Phillips curve. In fact, there's a long run uh, Phillips curve that isn't vertical. And so that would be consistent with Oaken who certainly thought there were long-run uh, policy trade-offs, but the international evidence, I think, goes the other way, where countries that have run higher inflation don't necessarily have any different or better uh, unemployment experiences than those that have run low inflation policies, and that's why there was so much focus on inflation targeting starting in the 1990s, and, and you really set an international standard for 2% uh, inflation. So. Um, uh, but this model is certainly one at, where you can sort of formulate, you know, sort of what was Oaken thinking in, in, you know, in modern terms and what would you need to get Oaken's ideas. So I think from that perspective, it's very interesting. So thank you. Presentation, great paper. So uh, I have a few questions. One is technical, which is you have, if I understand correctly, a linear model, but the asymmetric rule is, of course, non-linear. So I understand you guys do a trick. And Gianluca asked me to ask you what's a trick, because <laughs> that would be very interesting. Um, second, if I understand correctly, people go to non-participation because they have a utility benefit from it. Is that correct, Felipe? Yeah. I w would imagine that that utility from non-participation must be huge because in this model, if I were an agent, I would do anything to work, right? Because I'm, if I don't work, I'm getting screwed because I get the drift. And not only I lose productivity, but all the probability go against me as I lose pro productivity. So, w <laughs> you know, what really makes people go out of the labor force because it's a terrible thing, a terrible decision to make. And then finally, I mean, going back to, to what President Buller was asking, I mean, it seems to me that one super interesting experiment that you could be doing is the following. The, F the Fed, arguably, or you know, some people argue, did run the economy hot in 2021, partly because whatever possibly inflation persistent was misforecasted. But part of the reason was precisely to get participation, you know, is concerned about the labor market getting participation back up to kind of toward pre-COVID levels. And so you, with your model, can investigate quantitatively that trade-off. Thank you. I mean, I thought everyone was going to be asking, why is there this long-run trade-off? And um, I was wondering how, in your analysis, you treat long, very long-run inflation expectations. Is there an assumption that eventually we're going to go back to some initial level of inflation? Yeah, so just to follow up on this, um, uh, if you, the wage setting uh, block seems to be uh, like in the standard New Keynesian model, is that right? And do you have a like a log linearized wage inflation, New Keynesian wage inflation equation around zero inflation, presumably? Okay, so so I think that then the the there is some kind of Lucas uh, critique that one could apply to this because when we when we do the log linear the log linearization around zero inflation, a nice feature. Of, of, of that is that on average the the wage markup that uh, workers experience matches the desired wage markup the one that they would have in the absence of uh, wage stickiness when uh, if inflation is positive on, on, on average as it is in your case then the the wage mark the average wage markup is below the desired wage markup so in a sense workers are being fooled 
like systematically by, <coughs> by the policymaker. So one would expect that they would respond to this, you know, by uh, adjusting wages uh, upward. Now the real wage cannot increase in your model because you have, because of your assumptions and so on. So the only way to bring back the wage markup, the average wage markup to the desired wage markup is to increase unempl unemployment, to, to, to reduce employment, and hence to, you know, unfortunately go bring back inflation down to zero. So again, it's, I, 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 it's, it's a possible critique of the, of the approach. I uh, just want to echo some of the previous questions. It seems that a key part of your story is uh, this heterogeneous uh, job finding and separation rates um, across the wealth and skill distribution. Um, so it seems that in the model, if I understand correctly, this, uh, they are exogenous or fairly exogenous. So my question is, do you have, I mean, this is totally fine for the analysis, but do you have a sense of whether it comes from more like the worker side or the employer side? And I would guess that as Marco was suggesting, the welfare implications might be different. Thank you very much. But, uh, developing what uh, President Bullard said about the US, uh, that it already is to a certain extent asymmetric, I think it would be interesting if you could look at that, but also maybe look at other countries uh, to see whether the response is already asymmetric. And then from that, you could also uh, draw from the empirical evidence, but also think, you know, how, whether it should be more asymmetric or whether the job is done and so on. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll not do justice. I wanna thank first for, for the comments, okay? And let me start with our discussions. So, yeah, the, the, regarding the wage setting, it's a practical decision, kind of, I wanna keep the model as close as it is to the Hank literature. To the extent of the share of people that are unionized or not, I, I think that the important thing is, does the union kind of capture the forces for wage adjustments, even for people that are not necessarily unionized? So people kind of don't like to see their real wages decreasing, the, the driving force to the union would show up there. So I think that is capturing at least some of the forces that are driving the adjustment in wages. I, I completely agree with your uh, intuition regarding the size of the surplus, that potentially the, sur the size of the surplus is small for these low skilled people. Nakajima does it all the way for a different demographic group. That's exactly what we find for the advantage, black, Hispanics, et cetera. So I completely agree with that. I love that you talk about the capital. So we, Gianluca and I, we kind of discussed that we potentially think as an extension. And is even more important in heterogeneous agent setting by the work of Adrian. I think Ludwig was there as well, I don't remember. You, but in kind of realizing that the indirect effects of investment are particularly important in the model with heterogeneous agent because of the high MPC, this feeds back to their labor income and kind of activates the Canadian multiplier. Thank you for the reference on the symmetric rules. We are going to take a look at that. And please send the slides, I wanna go over through the other comments, okay? So on the uh, age profile question, that's something that we're thinking. We're, Gianluca has like previous work which has some life cycle dimension. We start with something simpler just because we wanted to add, but I completely agree. And that can even add us to talk about the effects of entering during expansion and recessions and the long passing effects. James, thanks so much for all the comments. Uh, let me see things that I can address, okay? So uh, the short falls, that is kind of also in our motivation I took it out from the slides because the asymmetric rule enters a little bit late. We should bring those back. The, I, I'm sympathetic to the home production argument and we should probably put more, a little bit more thought of there. The zero lower bound is also in the back of our minds. So I didn't show you the real rate or the nominal rate. We're clearly hitting the zero lower bound over the, the, the great recession at least. Uh, I'm hoping that we can extend the method to kind of include it and think about it. And it would be nice because as, as you can correctly pointed out, the zero lower bound is exactly a force that drives the average inflation bias down while our asymmetric rule is exactly pushing the other direction. 
So I think it would be nice to extend our figures on the trade-off exactly along those lines. Uh, Marco, so the way that we are doing the technically implementing the symmetric rule is by using monetary policy new shocks, which I learned from these guys. And so they kind of made the argument that you can think of alternative monetary policy rules. Households don't really care of what is the, the, the rule that's kind of driving. They only care about the path of the nominal rate and you can implement different paths of nominal rate by using monetary policy shocks. The only thing about the asymmetry is that instead of solving a linear system, you solve a linear complementary system where these shocks have to be positive only if they hit the constraint. Uh, people don't like to participate because there is a utility cost of being employed. We can check off how big that number is, but there is also a bunch of people just forced out of non-participation through that act, uh, passive non-participation state. And it's actually like a big fraction in our current calibration. Uh, at least there is long run effects. If we stop shocking the economy, we just revert back to the steady state. So there is no final steady state long persistent effects. It's just that the asymmetry, as long as we are shocking the economy, right? By just making expansions larger and recession smaller, generates a different average. Thank you very much, Gali, for the comment. I think it's a very nice point. We'll dedicate a little bit more thought to it. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> and Elisa, thank you as well for the comment. We should think of where that's coming from. I currently don't have a, a great idea. And Stephanie also thinks we're going to look at the other countries and we use the reference that you made from the symmetry. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. And uh, we come back at 10.45.
to the second paper of the session, so please take a seat. Okay, thank you. So now we're going to have the second paper of the, of the session. And the presenter is Valerie Rami. Valerie is currently a professor of economics at the University of California, San Diego, and the research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the Econometric Society. She currently serves on the panel of economic advisors for the Congressional Budget Office and on the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee. And she is an associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics and the Journal of Political Economy. Uh, Valerie, the, the floor is yours. You have 45 minutes. Ah. All right. Uh, well, thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to participate in this great conference. So uh, this paper is joint work with Jacob Orchard and uh, Johannes Bielen. Jacob was our student. Now he's at the Board of Governors, so the usual disclaimer applies. So this is a paper I've been thinking about since at least 2011, just saying, I need to write this paper. And, and we started talking about it and finally wrote the paper. So this is preaching to the choir, um, which is, you know, we're really interested in marginal propensities to consume for a lot of reasons, but you know, particularly in heterogeneous agent models. And what we're trying to answer here is what is the marginal propensity to consume out of a temporary tax rebate? or any kind of stimulus payment. Um, of course, for liquidity reasons, behavioral reasons, uh, you can have a higher MPC than would be predicted by the life cycle permanent income model. Um, Microestimates suggest that MPCs can be 50% or above, and we saw some high MPCs yesterday. Um, now, if you take that and calibrate a heterogeneous agent model, then you can get the prediction that temporary tax rebates can be a powerful stimulus, such as we saw during COVID, okay? Now, we're gonna focus on the 2008 rebates because it's a much clearer experiment, but we have follow-up work, yes? I know, there's a lot of static, so let's see what we can do here. Let's try this one. All right, let me know if that, oh, that's much better. Yes, <laughs> great, thank I was wondering if you were hearing what I was hearing, thank you. Okay, so um, turns out there's a micro-macro tension with regard to the 2008 rebates, okay? In the summer of 2008, Marty Feldstein, and then just a few months later in January 2009, John Taylor did some very simple analysis of macro data. They looked at saving rates and aggregate series and ran some simple regressions. And they saw a big saving spike and no consumption spike. And they concluded that the MPCs out of that rebate were very, very low, all right? But just a couple years after, Jonathan Parker and his co-authors uh, started with a working paper in 2011. That's when I became really interested in this. They had, you know, just beautiful, impeccable uh, applied micro study where they added rebate questions to the consumer expenditure survey as well as the Nielsen survey. They had a great natural experiment because the randomized timing of these rebates and they applied micro methods. There were state of the art micro methods at the time and they found very high marginal propensities to consume NPCs between 0.5 to 0.9, all right? So everybody just sort of forgot the Feldstein-Taylor uh, analysis because this was such great applied micro that Jonathan and his co-authors were doing. Now, there was uh, a paper by Sam Shapiro and Slemrod, and this paper did a lot, but at the very end, it was sort of talking about how big the Parker et al. estimates were, and uh, they did a little calculation, and later in a discussion, I did a Follow, extended that for a counterfactual. And let me just show you the updated version here. A big part of the high MPCs that Parker et al. estimate is for motor 
vehicles, okay? So what Sam Shapiro Slemrod did says, well, if you take their estimated MPC, you could kind of uh, calculate in an accounting sense what the implied induced expenditures on motor vehicles are. And they put this in a little table at the end of their paper, nobody else paid attention to it. But I knew about it because Matthew Shapiro had showed this to me. So what this does is create a counterfactual based on this, all right? So the black line shows you actual expenditures on new motor vehicles uh, during 2008, and it shows you a little bit of time around it. And then it takes that induced spending and says, okay, if we follow this, if we don't do any partial equilibrium, general equilibrium, just the accounting exercise, and say, if there had been no rebate, what would expenditures on motor vehicles have been in the summer of 2008? That's what the purple dashed line shows you. It shows that motor vehicle spending would have declined by almost 90% in this dramatic V shape, and then mostly uh, recovered right when Lehman Brothers is failing, all right? I've studied the auto industry in, uh, for many years. Nothing like this has ever happened before, all right? So this is why I had been thinking about this for a while, and unfortunately, uh, Johannes and uh, uh, Alistair had their wonderful paper on durables and everything came together. Okay, so how do we reconcile those microestimates with the macro counterfactuals? So other fact, are there other factors that could have led consumption to be lower in May and July than in August and September had we not had the rebate, all right? We provide narrative evidence, we provide forecast, professional, our own. Nothing suggests there should have been that V-shape in the summer of 2008. A second possibility is measurement error in aggregate personal consumption expenditures, all right, particularly at the monthly level. And Jonathan Parker had made this argument to me uh, a number of years ago. Um, we look at alternative ways to look at this retail sales, we aggregate up the consumption expenditure survey, and then the same point that I made to Jonathan, I said, motor vehicles are always well measured, so it's not a measurement error issue there. We go through that, that cannot explain it, all right? What the na uh, national income and product account is picking up in terms of what happened to actual is exactly, you know, very close to what you get from alternatives. Now, that was just a simple accounting exercise I showed you. So what about general or partial equilibrium dampening? What we're going to suggest is, because a lot of that MPC was motor vehicles, is that, you know what? There's an upward sloping relative supply curve of motor vehicles, okay? And what that will do is that makes the general equilibrium MPC, you know, allowing for all the feedback effects, less than the micro MPC. Now that will help a lot, but it doesn't go all the way. What we also look at, and this is one reason why we started on this paper and we couldn't quite figure out what could be wrong with the micro MPC estimates, and then we figured out because of a flurry of new research in econometric methods, which is that the standard OLS diff and diff or two-way uh, fixed effects treatment tends to bias things in a lot of situations, and that overstates the micro MPC. And what we do here is, the problem is it uses previously treated households as control groups, and I'll give you more detail if I get to that part in my talk. And we use the new method by Borshuk, Hanavel, and Spies, uh, their two-way, uh, their diff and diff estimator, and we get a 40% reduction in the MPCs uh, using the same data as Parker et al. And I should say that Gianluca and Greg actually noted this issue. They, they told us last summer, we went back and looked, and they had this wonderful experiment saying, you know, are they really using the right control group? And this is, you know, before this literature even got started. So we're following up on that as well. Okay, so let me start with, the, take you back to 2008, all right? So just a review of the data and the major economic events. All right, so details of the 2008 rebate. It was passed in February 2008. Most funds were distributed between April through July. Uh, it was $100 billion, which was equal to 11% of January disposable income. That's at the monthly uh, basis. 85% of what are called tax units received uh, some non-zero amount, and it was phased out at higher income. 
And then among households receiving a payment, the average payment was $1,000. It depended on how many children you had and all of that. All right, so if you look in, in uh, the data, well, this is the rebate, you know, it's huge, and this is the timing, and almost 50%, so as I said, it was passed in February, a little bit was sent out in April, but almost 50% was sent out, sent out in May, with still some, you know, quite a bit sent out in June, and then July, and then it goes back to normal. In the following graphs, you're gonna see that same red line for May 2008, so that you can just see how things look relative to that, all right? Here's disposable income and consumption, all right? And I'm showing you both real and nominal. So uh, the nominal is the green line, and we see you know, a big spike in disposable income. So you, it's big relative to the aggregate, so you see that spike in the aggregate data. Uh, for consumption, you see an increase, and these are, the, even though the, uh, uh, the y-axis is adjusted, it's the same scale on both. So you can see that there's an increase in nominal consumption, but not as big as the other. But then if you look at real, uh, you still see that big spike in the disposable income, but you see this little tiny hill in the blue line for consumption expenditures. And uh, if you look by product, you can hardly see anything there. And then if you look at motor vehicles, uh, you, uh, you, can, you don't see very much there either. Okay. Now, why is there such a difference between the nominal and the real? It's because of what was happening to inflation. So this shows you total PCE inflation with the blue, with the uh, diamonds, and then the green excludes food and energy. So this is actually not inflation, this is the price index, all right? So prices are rising, and the rate at which they were rising was accelerating uh, going into 2008. They then plateaued, this is you know, later on when uh, uh, Lehman Brothers is failing, and then they actually fall, the price level, so that the price level at the end of 2008 is about equal to what it was at the beginning of 2008. Now, excluding food and energy lets you know that a big part of it, again, was because of oil prices. So excluding food and energy, the rise in, inflation, in, in prices is much more uh, gradual. And the uh, graph over there shows you what was happening with energy goods and services, they were shooting upwards, and then they uh, fell like a rocket, I guess you could say. All right, so energy prices were a significant contributor. So when you look at the real things, you only get the little bump in consumption. All right, now something else that's really important for our dampening effect is what happened to the relative price of new motor vehicles in that summer. So. The black line, or sorry, the blue line shows you the trend from about August 2007 through April 2008 before those big payments were made. And the black line shows you the relative new vehicle price. And this is using the BLS series that also uses private data, so you have much more, many more observations. And look at what happens. Right after that big chunk in the red line of rebates are given out, motor vehicle prices shoot up and then down which is, suggests that supply curves might be upward sloping. Okay. Now, what was going on with the behavior of monetary policy? So uh, the nominal federal funds rate was uh, coming down, and then after the employment report for December 2007 that came out in early 2008, the Federal Reserve became very worried and started uh, lowering the, the federal funds rate, in fact, even between meetings. Um, and then they paused after the stimulus payments went out and then continued uh, lowering them when Lehman Brothers uh, was failing. The ex ante, uh, the real ex ante rate looks similar. Obviously, it's at a lower level, and we use the Michigan consumer expectations. Uh, the real rate basically went below zero just as the stimulus payments uh, were coming to the economy, all right? So we don't see a lot of funny things going on with monetary policy. It's just how you would uh, expect them to behave. All right, now do any forecasts at the time suggest that there would be a V-shaped consumption path? So first we look at professional forecasters. They too became 
much more pessimistic after the release of the December uh, 2007 employment report. Some were predicting rebates, but using past behavior of Congress, they were saying that um, it probably wouldn't be passed till the second half of the year. Nobody expected it to be passed so quickly. So some of them predicted rebates enacted in the second half of the year. And then I'm going to show you a graph that shows forecasts made to them. I don't have time to talk about our forecasts, but we try to become even more pessimistic than the professional forecasters by taking our own perfect foresight that oil prices went up so much in the summer, whereas the professional forecasters weren't forecasting that. We also had perfect foresight that Lehman Brothers was failing, and even then, we cannot get a more, you know, much more pessimistic forecast than the forecasters. So what were they forecasting? So here's a whole bunch of them. The uh, dark green is the Green Book forecast. This is for consumption. They were forecasting sort of a slowdown in the growth rate of consumption, but overall, the path was slightly upward. All right? The, uh, that was in 12, 2007. Also similar for the Green Book forecast from January. The blue is actually the median survey professional forecasters forecast. That was just, you know, consumption would continue to go up. The, um, some of the most pessimistic, well, let me just say the minimum survey professional forecasters one is that blue line. But you can see a slight dip there, but it's just minuscule relative to the other sorts of numbers that I gave you. And I, and I always kid, that must be Nuriel Rubini, you know, the only one who was really uh, pessimistic about things. Goldman Sachs, among the big groups, was also quite pessimistic. But you can see the actual uh, real consumption path looked like that and then started declining in, in the last quarters of the year. Okay, so there's just nothing suggesting there should have been a V-shape where you get, uh, you know, a contraction in that second quarter and then going back up. All right, so we're going to think about allowing for general equilibrium effects to see what happens to these V-shapes. So we're going to create macro counterfactuals, and these are basically historical macro counterfactuals. So what we'll do is construct a medium scale, two good, two agent new Keynesian model. It's gonna have non-durables and durables. Uh, we're gonna have optimizing and hand-to-mouth households. We'll have sticky prices and wages, non-competitive labor markets. It's basically a combination of the model that I use for my infrastructure chapter, which itself is an extension of Jordi Galli's 2007 model, and then it's merged with Mackay and Veland's uh, Econometrica Durable Goods Analysis. Okay, we're gonna calibrate, one of the reasons we do a two-agent model is because it's so easy to calibrate uh, the MPC, because we're gonna do experiments for a lot of different MPCs uh, just by calibrating the fraction of, of hand-to-mouth agents. Uh, we're gonna simulate the response of consumption to rebates okay, that have the same timing as what they actually had and the same size relative to the economy. And then look at that simulation relative to steady state in our model and then use that percent deviation and subtract it from the actual consumption data to get the counterfactual path. Okay, let me just show you a, a couple of equations for the model because otherwise everything's quite standard. Um, so the utility function of both types of consumers, they care about non-durable goods consumption, uh, they care about uh, the flow of services from durable goods D, and then hours work to have this utility, okay? And we allow for different uh, uh, exponents on each of those, all right? Durable goods accumulation is, DT is the st a real stock of durable goods, XT is durable expenditure denominated in non-durable goods. So if you want sort of the real flow, say the number of cars into durables, we divide by the relative price of durable goods. It's just the way we set this up. We've got a standard depreciation rate, one minus delta D. Right now, and this is, we're still working on this. When we calibrate our model, we wanna match both the elasticity of intertemporal substitution for durable goods, and this is for the optimizing households, as well as the intratemporal elasticity. 
with the standard model, you cannot match the estimates from the literature for both of those. So you've got to have some kind of wedge. In the summer, we just we had an adjustment co convex adjustment cost, and we got really good feedback from Gianluca's group, including people who were on Zoom who later emailed us. They said, "That's going to screw things up." Sorry about. I'm doing this. That's going to. And they were right because we went back and looked at it, and and. We, that's what was giving us W shapes rather than V shapes in our thing. So for right now, we're just having this sort of stochastic additional depreciation that's trying to pick up these things. The key is that's not uh, uh, time shifting things like the other one was. And what we want to do is find a, a simple way to uh, have sort of a fixed cost, which is what we're really trying to pick up. But um, we've already started looking at things and it's not you know, going to change the timing of things as far as we can tell. Durable goods production, all right? So for simplicity, rather than putting an entire uh, sector with its own uh, uh, Calvo pricing and all of that kind of thing, uh, what we do is we assume that you can use non-durables to produce durables, and that's given by this supply curve, and the supply elasticity of these real durable goods is given by the zeta inverse, all right? Now, if zeta inverse is equal to infinity, then non-durable and durable goods are perfect substitutes in production, which is basically what you're implicitly assuming if you just have a one good model. All right? So household behavior, we're going to have a fraction one minus gamma of optimizers. They receive all the profits. Uh, then there's a fraction gamma of hand-to-mouth uh, consumers. Now, standard models assume they neither borrow nor save and simply consume all their current income. However, we want to match some of the stuff in terms of the timing of the spending that Jonathan Parker and his co-authors found. So we're going to allow for lagged effects of an income shock spread over a few months calibrated to the micro MPC evidence, okay? And it's just, instead of uh, consuming everything in one month, we're going to let them do it over three months, basically. So uh, we're actually going to assume that they, they spread this spending equally over three months, uh, beginning with the current month. The best estimates, this is from Broda and Parker using the Nielsen data where they had more high frequency data, was actually two thirds of the spending occurred in the current month with the sixth in each of the next two months. By assuming just one third, one third, one third, we are making our counterfactuals less V-shaped, so we're weighting the case against us. We assume that households allocate 83% of that extra expenditure to durables, and that's going to be ba that's based on estimates that I'm going to present at the end, because a big part of the MPC was the durables expenditure. Okay, we calibrate the durable adjustment cost elasticity of substitution to match long run uh, demand elasticity of minus one and a short run durable demand elasticity from Bachman et al. based on the value added taxes. All right, so our baseline supply elasticity is going to be infinite. So this is what is usually assumed implicitly. Um, and then we're going to have a less elastic alternative, although still very elastic, and that's equal to five. Okay, so we're going to use our two good tank model to simulate the dynamic general equilibrium consumer spending responses I told you. We're going to match the anticipation lag, the size, and the timing of the actual rebate. We're going to run the experiment for micro MPCs equal to 0.3, which is similar to uh, Shapiro and Slemrod's estimate and our new estimates, and then also 0.5 and 0.7, which are in the low to midpoint of the Parker et al. things, because they go up to 0.9 even with some of their estimates. Okay. We can show 0.9, but it just makes the graphs <laughs> look weird. All right, so here is our counterfactual simulation for the baseline model. The left hand just shows you the micro MPCs. So that is what I was showing you before with that V shape, except that now we're allowing uh, a little bit of uh, uh, smoothing over the three months. The top is total consumption expenditures, and the bottom is motor vehicles. All right, and you can see in both of these cases, you get these pronounced V shapes, and you even get them with the micro MPC of 0.3, but even more so with 0.5 and 0.7, and then 0.9 would be even more V shaped. Again, you're seeing this recovery, you know, right when Lehman Brothers is failing. 
the right panel shows you the general equilibrium equivalent, so uh, for consumption. So at the top, that's for total consumption. You can see that in this kind of model, uh, you actually get mag amplification, all right? The V shapes are even more pronounced because that's what a good New Keynesian model does. It amplifies things, all right? So the problem gets worse over there. The same thing with motor vehicles, all right? So you put it in general equilibrium and the puzzle is even greater. And uh, if you look here, say if you have a micro MPC of 0.3, the GE MPC goes up to close to 0.4. And then because of nonlinearities, if you have a micro MPC, say a 0.7, the GE MPC is double it, all right? Same with motor vehicles, you get the same kind of little bit of amplification for the lower MPCs, but more so as the MPC goes up, all right? So the, as I said, the puzzle's even worse. All right, so how do we reconcile these, okay? So what we need is some kind of significant general equilibrium dampening forces. Now one could just take the standard model, say I'm gonna lower the fresh elasticity, I'm not gonna allow so much uh, capital utilization, I'm going to make a Federal Reserve be less accommodative, all of those sorts of things. But we actually think, given the prominence of durable spending among these MPCs, is that um, let's, you know, and what that relative price tells us, let's see what happens when we allow for a less than infinite elastic supply of durable goods. So we're going to change that elasticity from infinity to five. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna do, we're also, so first I'll show you these results and then we're gonna go on to a re-examination of the micro MPC estimates. Okay, so uh, here's the counterfactual when we have the less elastic durable supply. So the left-hand panels are the same micro MPCs I showed you before, so those are exactly the same. The right-hand side is in our amended model where all we've done is made durable goods supply less elastic. Suddenly, the V shapes just become much less, all right? And in particular, if you look at uh, when the micro MPC is 0.3, the blue line, um, that actually looks similar to the sort of forecast that we had shown. For motor vehicles, it's the same again. It doesn't look so strange, particularly with the micro MPC of 0.3. You still get some V shapes as you let the micro MPC get bigger, but 0.3 seems to get rid of that uh, uh, disconnect between the micro and the macro, All right? So uh, if we look at the numbers, so remember when we had a micro MPC before 0.3, you know, we were getting a, a, a GE MPC of 0.4, now it's dampened down to 0.2, okay? Before when we had a micro MPC of 0.7, uh, in the baseline model, it was doubled up to 1.4, now it's basically 0.7, all right? So even with that very high micro MPC, we're just not getting any amplification or dampening, all right? And similarly for the motor vehicles and the non-durable goods. Okay, so relatively elastic demand for durables is important for dampening, and with only the micro MPCs, that's wrong, with only, oh, oh, yes, this is important. With, suppose that we amend the model and there, there's a, a, a table in the paper, so that we only have non-durables in our model. We don't get this dampening in, all right? So if you have only non-durables in the model and the micro MPC is 0.3 and it's all in non-durables, your GE MPC is 0.4. You still get the amplification because now we've just taken out the durables. Uh -huh. I think you said something like 83% of the spending was on durables. Is that, is that something you calibrate to? I mean, in steady state, it's, it's only a relatively small share of total spending. Or, or are households choosing the durable, non-durable mix 
or, or are, are you kind of forcing them to yeah. spend on tourism? No, 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 the 83 percent is the spending on the X. We're, we're basically, this is not a general, uh, think of our calibration as not sort of a general thing. All spending is always going to be 83 percent on durables, but rather during the summer, the increase of those spending their checks, 83 percent of that tended to go to durables. So that's, that's what we're hitting there, and it's not the steady state value. Okay, so yeah, thanks for, for the question. Okay, so there's some lessons for Hank models, all right. So the addition of durable goods is crucial for our dampening result because durables have uh, more elastic demand than non-durables, all right. So when uh, you start looking at these partial equilibrium relative price forces, which then go into general equilibrium, um, it's really important to keep in mind how the optimizing households respond to those changes in prices in equilibrium. And they're going to respond much more to a 1% price increase uh, in, uh, for a durable good than they will for a non-durable good. So that's why we focus so much attention on that elasticity. So the increase in durable price means that the optimizing households intertemporally substitute away from durables. The hand-to-mouth households are basically robots in our model. You know, you give them a, a, a dollar, they're going to split it one-third, 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 and um, they're going to do 83% of that on households. Obviously, that's a simplified approximation to what's probably really going on, which is some people are buying, you know, a car, an entire car, because they got enough from the stimulus check to put a down payment on it, you know, and so, so that's something to think about in the future, but we don't think that that messes up our counterfactual, all right? So both the overall MPC and the distribution of spending across goods matters for the GE outcome because of this fundamental difference between non-durable and durable goods. Now, if, as I mentioned, if we calibrate the MPC to 0.3 in a one good non-durable model, we still get implausible counterfactuals because the general equilibrium forces still amplify things. And so our little message here for thinking about MPCs and spending on stimulus is that heterogeneity of goods is as important as heterogeneity of households. Okay, so we've gone far, but why are we focusing on 0.3 when Jonathan Parker told us that, you know, the MPC estimates are 0.5 to 0.9? What we're going to show now is, oops, what did I do? Wait, 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 somehow, sorry. What we're going to do now is talk about our new estimates, and then this is going to be the second part of our reconciliation of micro and macro. Okay, so we're going to focus on the indicator specification of Parker et al., and that's because the Borushuk Haravel Spies, which from now on is BJS, because there are two, three different languages trying to pronounce their names correctly is hard. So it's BJS is, is the great team <laughs> for the econometrics. Um, Okay, so the Parker, their method only uh, works with an indicator method. All right, so Parker et al., it's the same kind of specification that people have used for decades to test the permanent income hypothesis, and they've always used this for the rebates. So you look at the change in consumption of, of a household, uh, say in period T plus one, relative to period T. They put in month fixed effects, you know, for each month, for their whole sample. There are some control variables in X, and then there is uh, an indicator according to whether they received a rebate that month, all right? So that beta two is a key parameter. C is consumption expenditures, I said. And of course, because it's the consumer expenditure survey, you have all of these complications where they're only interviewed every three months, even though they're reporting what happened in the previous three months. There are fixed effects, as I said, and then the household can Controls that they include are for age and change in household size. And then, as I said, the rebate. Okay, now they were used, just running that with ordinary least squares was the way thousands of papers and applied micro was doing it at the time, okay? But then people have figured out that there are some issues with that, you know, who would think? Because you, ha you have a randomized treatment, how could you go wrong? 
Well, it turns out standard two-way fixed effects es estimate effects, which later on I noticed in the table I should have put it here. It's, that's going to be called TWFE, okay, estimators, assign weights under the implicit assumption of homogeneous treatment effects, which is that every, everybody is going to respond to that rebate similarly across the months. Now, it turns out these weights are inappropriate when treatment effects are heterogeneous, and the object of interest is the average effect of treated on the treated population, the ATT. So we use the BJS method, which is very clever because it imputes a counterfactual spending paths based on untreated and not yet treated households. So let me get, I, somehow the, the graph, I noticed that the graph that we used, let me just make sure, yeah, the graph that we used last summer disappeared from this uh, presentation. Here's the idea, is if you're doing the standard method, all right, so remember 50% of the households uh, received their rebate in May, and then you had some more in June and July, and then it petered out. Meanwhile, we're looking at the consumer expenditure survey where people are interviewed in, say, September about what their spending was three previous months. Okay. Suppose the MPC is positive all right, and, and higher than the permanent income hypothesis says. Then consumption will go up, up for a lot of households, will go up in May, okay, and then will go down afterwards. So, so we're going to let them, it's going to go down afterwards. All right. Implicitly, that simple OLS estimate, when it's then looking at the MPC for the people uh, later in the summer, it is implicitly using the previously treated people as the control group. But remember, those guys had a high of consumption. Wow, we got our check, and then they're coming down. So the control group is saying, oh, for people not treated currently, consumption uh, growth should have been negative. So when you look at that difference between that small positive of the people who were treated in, say, July or were interviewed in September, your control group is saying that there's this big bunch of people who have negative consumption. That's why you get the upward bias, all right? Now, because also of the heterogeneity in the treatment, it's not enough to put in, you know, lagged rebates and lagged consumption. Because right? otherwise, if it, was, if it was homogeneous treatment, you could just put those lags in and you would be okay. All right? So BJS have this very nice method. What they do is they estimate a regression on the households that were never or not yet treated observations. All right? And because they're not getting a rebate, there's no rebate in there. So, so it's the same equation that Parker and them use, but there's no rebate indicator because none of these people are receiving it. You then use the fitted values to impute the change in consumptions, consumption for all observations as though no rebate were received. Then you create this difference for each household, which is their actual consumption, minus that imputed change in consumption had they not received a rebate. All right, so you're using the control group right, and then you just take the average of that. Okay? So let's see what happens. All right, so the top is what Parker et al. used, the two-way fixed effects. Thousands of people had used it in their papers, all right? So you get an estimate on the rebate indicator. Remember, the average rebate was about 1,000, of 483. And if you uh, use the fact that the average was 1,000, we do that with the second regression, you get an implied MPC of 0.52, okay? Now, if you uh, put in a few more controls than they did, it actually goes down some, uh, down to 0.35, which we, because we had just tried some controls, which is interesting. But if you look at the rebate only sample, and this is where Parker et al. get their huge 0.9, you know, close to 0.9, you get an implied MPC of 0.86, all right? So that's where their estimates come from. So then we apply the BJS estimator, so here, on the rebate indicator, the coefficient is 287, not statistically different from zero. The uh, standard error really isn't any bigger. It's just that the size of the coefficient uh, shrunk. The implied MPC is 0.3, right? If we put in controls, 
we actually get even less, 0.12. But again, even with this great natural experiment that Parker et al. looked at, you know, you're still getting uncomfortably big standard errors, but you know, 0.12 is small. Now, when we try to do the rebate only sample, shouldn't be a surprise once you think about it, we get gigantic standard errors. It looks like these huge MPCs, but why is that? Because as time is going on, um, there's hardly anybody who hasn't gotten the rebate, so you just don't have a good control group, all right? So our estimates just are not worthwhile there. And we also do it for subgroups. Now, we can look at the weights that you get and um, the treatment effects for the two-way fixed effects versus the um, uh, uh, BJS estimator. And the black is the treated versus the not yet treated, and the red is the past treated. The estimators aren't that different for June or July or August. What happens, it really shows up in September, because remember in that September interview, they're asking about those three previous months. There's this big weight on the past treated, and that's what's pumping up the MPC in the two-way fixed effects estimator. Okay. All right. So to summarize, when we look at total consumption expenditures uh, and the full sample, two-way fixed effects in the standard case gives you an MPC of 0.5. In with the BJS, we get an MPC of 0.3. And I should say that BJS in their paper um, actually do a little application and they do it to Broda and Parker's MPC estimates using the Nielsen data. We're, doing, we're using the consumer expenditure survey and guess what? the MPC shrink by 50% in that case, all right? So both sets of estimates see this big shrinkage. Most of the change comes from non-durable expenditures. We were surprised by this. Um, according to our TG tank model, with less elastic durable goods supply, a micro MPC of 0.3, where 83% of that goes to autos, corresponds to a GE MPC of 0.12, okay? And I'm trying to remember why that's this. That number might not be quite right. I think that's, I think that should be a little point two. Um, since there's a negligible investment response to the temporary tax rebate, our mo and our model is a closed economy, the GE MPC is approximately equal to the Keynesian multiplier for output, because consumption is the only thing changing. And so this suggests that the multipliers on these rebates were probably point two or less, and when I say multiplier there, I'm saying, you know, MPC over one minus MPC kind of thing. All right, conclusions. Uh, so we've used a too good tank model calibrated with the micro estimates of the 2008 rebate to create counterfactual consumption paths. Based on narrative events, we argue there's just nothing to suggest, had there been no rebate, that you would have had a V-shape in consumption in the summer of 2008. And I showed you forecasts and all kinds of other things going on. Now, two possible rep reconciliations that we look at. One is that the GE force has dampened the stimulus effects of these high micro MPCs and or upward bias in micro MPC estimates. We think that it's a mix of the two, all right? One thing you can think is, you got to get rid of the V-shape, all right? You can do it by dampening things more in your model or by shrinking down those micro MPCs. You almost have an indifference curve. You can choose what mix you want. You know, we chose it, tried to do it based on the data, but you've got to hit to not have those implausible V-shapes. You've got, you've got to be somewhere on that curve, all right? So both of these imply smaller multipliers because that particular isoquant I just talked about is, is a, a, has to do with the aggregate multiplier. Okay, so more broadly, we propose this new method uh, for evaluating microestimates. If you're looking at an experiment, such as the one that Marios talked about for Chile, check what those estimates imply about what the counterfactual would have been had there been no payments, all right? And I've done it before with Gabe Chatteroy Reich's ARRA, suggesting ridiculously big increases in unemployment during the Great Recession had there been no Obama stimulus. And uh, 
we're also looking at the 2001 rebate now and a number of other uh, cases. So we think that this is useful, kind of a reality check on all of our estimates and then they can help us guide our models and make us dig a little bit deeper to see whether you know, there might be something wrong with the estimates there. Okay, thanks. So now uh, Ernesto Pastén will be discussing. Ernesto um, is a senior economist at, at the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank of Chile and a research associate at the Toulouse School of Economics. He obtained his PhD in economics at Boston University and his research interests focus on, on macro. Uh, he has published in leading journals such as uh, Journal of Monetary Economics, Review of Economic Dynamics, and Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. And Mr. you have 15 minutes. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, first, Sophia, for doing the introduction short. Um, also like to thank the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. Uh, there are two big reasons for that. One is that this paper called my attention since the first time that I saw it presented uh, somewhere, probably the Summer Institute. Uh, I thought that there was an important paper to keep in the radio for the agenda of the bank, so I suggested that this paper could be presented in our webinar series. Uh, this is something that happened, and, and, and the reason is because I think that this is a typical Valerie, this is typical Valerie, basically stepping, seeing one literature, getting one step back, breathe a little bit, and try to think out of the box, and this is exactly what this paper is doing. The second big reason I feel uh, honored to discuss this paper is uh, having the opportunity to discuss on Valerie. This is like, uh, I don't know, like an average tennis player like myself uh, commenting on the game or one of the top uh, players that you can only see from, uh, on TV. This is a little bit like that. Uh, anyway, so let's, let's start. Um, okay. So let me start with a spoiler. This is going to be an enthusiastically uh, supported discussion. If I have to, uh, so don't expect so much criticism on the details and I just, I, I want to talk a little bit about the big picture. Uh, on that, if I have to uh, summarize the paper in one bullet, this will be the bullet. So when using microestimate uh, MPCs in a macro model, be careful, handle with care. So what I'm going to do, the plan for today, uh, for me, is to review the main points of the paper scattered with some thoughts. So let me start with a bird eye uh, view of the paper. The paper start, start from the observation that estimated micro MPCs in a standard macro model produce suspiciously too strong IA counterfactuals. In particular, what it does is that it, uh, it makes that the uh, rebate, the 2008 rebates are going to have an extremely large effect on uh, aggregate consumption, which is something that Valerie uh, spent part of the paper suggesting that is implausible uh, according to uh, history, according to forecast, and uh, try to, uh, and then she come up with uh, two possibilities uh, to reconcile this a little bit strange counterfactual relative to uh, the way that could be fixed. So one possibility is that estimating micro objects in general is tough. MPCs are not the exception. So she argues that one possibility is that there is some upward bias in the estimation. I will come back to that uh, later. The second possibility, which is complement to the previous one, is that those estimates are really micro MPCs. But what we really care for this counterfactual is the macro MPCs, which may, they may not be the same. So she pushes that general equilibrium may make a difference. I argue that uh, aggregation may also make a difference. And the paper then argues that uh, counterfactual past the smell test when the upward bias in the micro MPC estimates are corrected and when some GE forces 
are introduced into the model to create a wedge between the micro NPCs and the macro relevant NPCs. The particular G forces that she's put it in is uh, durables in a, in a tanked model. So for durables, think about cars, and, uh, and again, I'll, be, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But the reason why I like this paper so much is actually beyond the discussion of NPCs and beyond the discussion about the heterogeneous ages model. It's, about a, it's a methodological point about how we sh should think about uh, when we uh, look at microdata to inform models. And this is what I mean. Models, at the end of the day, are there to perform counterfactuals. Make microdata is useful in the extent that it informs counterfactuals. So we never should look, should forget uh, uh, that perspective when we look at the exciting new things that microdata bring us could bring to, to macro. Of course, which counterfactuals depends on the question that we have at hand. And this is what I, what I mean, is that quite too often we see papers, to be honest, including some of my own papers, that do the following. They document some micro uh, features that look interesting, add some degrees of freedom to a standard macro model, claim success, then do counterfactuals using the model and never look at the data again. So what this paper is suggesting, is inviting us, is that after we do this, go back to the data, but not to any data. Go back to the data and evaluate inputs from microdata in the extent that they produce plausible counter counterfactuals. This is no different than just saying that we need some external validity. But it's not any external validity. It's not untargeted moments. It's basically look at the counterfactuals that we can estimate and we could have like a good sense of what we should get out of those counterfactuals and contrast our models where they give us something that, again, pass the smell test. So now let me look at a little bit, bit in more details about the paper in particular and about the um, heterogeneous agent models. So, this idea that micro NPCs may be too high from a macro perspective is something that is not unique of NPCs. It's something that we have seen before. So the discussion about risk aversion has that flavor. Micro uh, risk aversion seems to be much higher than what makes sense for a macro model. The same thing happened with the fridge elastic elasticity. So in that sense, it shouldn't surprise us that micro estimates don't give us the full picture of what a macro uh, NPCs or what is consistent, the macro evidence with, uh, uh, with, with NPCs. So talking a little bit about the model, and this is the only thing I'm gonna say about the model, it's kind of easy to shoot at the paper because it's a tank model. I mean, some people argue that tank model give you a lot, uh, allow you to go a lot, a long, long way of what a, a heterogeneous agent, mo a hang model is gonna give you. Some of those people are in this room. On the other hand, some other people said, no, 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 if you do a tank, you're gonna missing some important ingredients. Some of those people are also in this room. Uh, but beside that, really, I, I see this as an example. I see it like, a, we, let's take a simple model, let's add some ingredients, let's see whether those ingredients can change, can create a wedge between the micro NPC and the macro NPC drive it by uh, GE forces. And the particular mechanism in the paper is about adding durables. Again, think about cars. And the mechanism is the following. As rebates increase uh, demand for durables, prices of durables should go up. Key in the mechanism is that the expectation is that the increase of the price of durables is short-lived. So, rational agents, what they should do, they should smooth out their demand of, of durables in a way that we won't see that big spike in uh, consumption when those agents get their rebate. In the model, a price spike of only 1%, which is consistent with what Valerie documents in the paper, is enough to produce 
substantial delay in the demand of durables, and that's justified the fact that there is this big wedge between the micro MPC and the macro MPCs. In the preferable estimation and calibration, the micro MPC is 0.3, the macro MPC is 0.2. So about the model, this is just one model. This is one example. We can think of other examples. But we can think also on other questions. But I think the point stands. We should look at, uh, we should use counterfactuals that we can measure and estimate in the data in a reasonable way to use them as external validity for which microingredients we should add to our models. So aggregate consumption response, for sure, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an important question. But it's not the only one. And one may be interested, for instance, in welfare, or may be interested between the interplay of monetary policy or some other type of policy with the, with the rebates. Then the answer may not be exactly the same that Valerie got, but the methodological point stands which you always do what Valerie uh, is doing here. And uh, so if we have these other questions, and this, what I'm, go what I'm going to do now, I'm going to push a little bit Valerie's argument a little bit, uh, a little bit to the limit, is that we should not contempt ourselves looking only at uh, macro counterfactuals as a external validity for our models. We could also use the richness of uh, cross-sectional variation to do that. And that is, is maybe particularly important if we want to use microdata to inform models and to inform uh, how we should think about mechanisms in for those questions for, for which the mechanism may be important. For instance, we could have, unfortunately, the, my understanding that the literature of MPC is not being so successful on related heterogeneity on MPC with observables. But in principle, that is one way to go. It could also be related with geographical variation, and some observable characteristic of those regions can give us a lot of information about what is really the nature of the heterogeneity of MPCs, and therefore why MPCs can be high in some times and, and low in others, or high for some groups and, and small for others. For instance, if financial frictions are behind the micro MPC, we should observe that some measurement of financial frictions, of the extent of financial frictions affecting agents, should uh, be correlated with the MPCs. Also, if it's true that financial frictions are related to, uh, to the nature of MPCs, that is going to be very informative for either for some, some questions that we may have that may not be related to the bottom with the question that this paper is, is putting forward. For instance, there could be the interplay between different type of policies uh, at the time of the rebase, go through uh, relaxing or tightening financial constraint if financial constraints are basically the main drivers of, uh, of MPCs. That's just one example. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the uh, MPC estimation. The bottom line point of the paper, to me, on, uh, on this front is that asynchronous rebates create upward bias when diff and diff estimate includes, include in the control group those who already got it. To be honest, it was a little bit surprising to me that uh, Valerie had to make this observation. My, my understanding was that it's the standard in diff and diff estimates when there is a, 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 a synchronity in, in the treatment is to exclude those who have been already treated, but it seems that it's not. So what Valerie does is that uh, excluding those already treated uh, substantially reduces uh, diff and diff uh, estimate. However, to my taste, so this is what is the uh, what is the message that we get is that uh, MPC is probably smaller than we think, and the some models are being calibrated to too high MPCs. But there are quite a few papers out there which cal are calibrated to uh, average MPCs that are not so different from the micro MPCs that Valerie is finding in her work. So to me, the really the main main contribution comes from. Let's think about what ingredients are going to give a wedge between the micro MPCs and the macro MPCs, and this is something that we should add into the models. 
this is something that I already mentioned. Uh, uh, the empirical literature, I think, uh, could move forward a little bit on, on that front, which would be very, very informative, very, very useful. Uh, there is also the possibility that typically when we teach macro, we say that it's different than micro for two reasons. We don't need to, basically, we don't need to care all the, we, no, we don't need to include all the richness of micro data because that may not survive two forces, aggregation and general equilibrium. Valerie pushes forward the general equilibrium part. But there also could be some story behind the aggregation, which is going to be related to understanding what uh, observables might be correlated with uh, the dispersion of MPC across region or across different individuals. And, uh, and again, if we can relate this estimate of MPCs, of heterogeneity MPCs, may help us to guide modeling. And that's going to be very very useful, very informative. Again, what I'm doing here is putting, pushing forward exactly the same argument that Valerie is giving us at the aggregate level, also at the cross-sectional level, also to step back and think what are the ingredients that we need to add to the models and which of those we can ignore. So just to uh, uh, finish, I think that this is a neat general message to be honest it's not completely novel. What I'm saying is not, I'm sure that it's no surprise to anyone in this room. But still, we see a lot of papers, a lot of work that overlook the fact that we should use external validity. The counterfactuals, not any counterfactual, not any moment, not any uh, untargeted feature of the data, the counterfactuals that we can measure that are closely related to the questions that we have in mind and the reason why we build these models, because we build them to do counterfactuals. And uh, in the context of heterogeneous agent models, micro MPCs are less important than you think for some questions. They may remain important for others, and this is for us, for all of us to investigate. So thank you so much. Okay, so now we have some time for questions. Yes, please, Jonathan. Uh, it was a super interesting paper, and I hadn't seen it, and I was, it was really, in, really interesting. I, I was thinking of more about this 83% spending on durables feature. I mean, I was wondering, firstly, is <laughs> are, are we still confident that that is, a, that is a fact, that we can measure that right, and we got it right? And then, and then I was wondering, in your model, are you, are you replicating that somehow? Um, Maybe it just happens endogenously. I was thinking if you have these hand-to-mouth people, maybe if you give them a rebate, what they want to spend the money is, is, on, is on durables because it's a way for them to save. Well, they're not allowed to save in, in traditional means, but a, a durable gives them a consumption flow moving forward. So maybe it just falls out of your model, or, or are you somehow kind of, is there some other parameter you're using to kind of get that 83% feature right? And I, I thought that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agreed also with uh, Ernesto's point about aggregation. You, you said that some of these rebates didn't go to the top of the income distribution. Those are probably people who account for a disproportionate share of aggregate consumption. So that would be another natural way to get a smaller sort of macro response than you get from the aggregate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So in your conclusion, you mentioned there were two ways to get rid of the V-shape. You could have... Um, GE dampening or, sh or smaller MPCs. And it, it occurred to me that there's a third way, which is to have some kind of GE smoothing effect. And that seems quite plausible, and Ernesto kind of touched on that. And I think that would have a sort of different implication in terms of policy. In the just If it's just pure dampening, then these rebates don't stimulate demand. If it's smoothing, they do, but it just comes later. So I was wondering if you have a sense of in the model whether or not this smoothing is playing a role or if it's really just pure dampening. Uh, sorry. Nice paper. Um, <laughs> so uh, since Ernesto brought up this tank versus uh, Hank uh, question, 
I think this is an application where it actually does make a very big difference uh, because there's two things that you don't like about the counterfactual in your tank model. One is that it's a V-shape and one is the, ma is the other one is the magnitude. So on the, the V-shape is entirely driven by tank. So if you had a Hank model, these uh, tax rebates, they'd be spent over time, over a relatively long period of time. And so actually your macro counterfactual would be prolonged. It'd be, it'd be, much, it'd be much smoother uh, than the V-shape that you get. So this is a place where it does matter. It also matters when you're thinking about the, the micro estimation of MPCs later, because this, is this, it's pers this persistence in the spending response of people that got the transfer in the past is also what's creating this wedge in the estimation. So I think it's, like, it's a place where it does really matter. Now, it's true that you still have the magnitude point, which is, this is a really big magnitude. So in a, in a, in a one good Hank model, um, the counterfactual uh, would be, there'd be enormous amplification, uh, and so you still need something to dampen the general equilibrium, and so I think that the way you're doing it is, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a very nice way, it's, an, it's a nice point. Um, but, but I do think that for the V-shape alone, uh, Hank is actually one way to get rid of that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Valerie, very nice paper, and also uh, very insightful discussion. Uh, my quick question is on prices. So, so you, you motivated uh, several times this idea of, uh, of uh, imperfectly in el elastic supply curve with the uh, plot on prices, right? But you, I wonder if you have explored in the model whether uh, the model can account for this price uh, spike. Because uh, it, it, it would seem to me that this is an important uh, metric uh, in terms of the performance of the model, especially if you want to push the idea uh, about the supply curve. Thank you. Um, so I, I haven't reread my paper with Greg in a long time, so <laughs> there are uh, some things I remember that I don't remember well, but I, I seem to remember that um, in that table that you mentioned, um, so depending on whether the control group was, um, you know, the ones who were treated or the ones who were not yet treated, then you could get biases in both directions. So for example, if the control group are, are the not yet treated, uh, which uh, it seems like w uh, what, what um, you, you, you do in, in one of your, um, your uh, uh, columns at least, then if there is an anticipation effect, right, and the division effect is, is large, then there will be a downward bias uh, because, um, you know, at the time in which you receive the news, you increase consumption. And so you're comparing essentially the treated with a group that is also increasing consumption because of the news. Um, so depending on the size of anticipation effect, you can get a downward bias there. Now, my recollection from Broda and Parker is that they don't find large anticipation effects. So maybe that's not a, you know, not a large uh, downward bias. And certainly the, the, uh, the, uh, upward bias is, is obviously there, and it's probably very large because of the declining consumption growth. So, yeah. In the audience, Luciano, and then Jorge. Thank you. Um, very nice presentation and very nice discussion, very insightful. Uh, have two questions related to the empirical part. Well, one question has been already asked by uh, Gianluca. So the second one is, is related about um, what I see, what creates a problem in the two-way fixed effect is this heterogeneous effects of, of the, the treatment. No? Um, according to macro models, why we should think on heterogeneous effects in these MPCs? Maybe because of some differences in, in state variables, no? in assets, maybe in age. I wonder if you can actually control for this if you see a, a, a important differences between the, the two-way fixed effects and your proposed methods. So once you control for observed heterogeneity if you want in some state variables that could create heterogeneity in the MPCs, whether you still uh, find the, the differences between the two methodologies. Oh, hi, uh, this is Jorge here from the bank. Very nice uh, paper and, and discussion. So uh, there is one thing that calls my attention. So in the data, April, June, you don't see much of the consumption going down. So it's, it's kind of after. 
So even though you reduce the MPC to 0.1, still you might not get the timing right. And there I was thinking uh, some of the things I'm working on might be relevant <laughs> there. Because you have this asymmetry that households, even though they have income declines or they expect that, they don't want to decrease consumption. They have these minimum consumption thresholds that are relevant for them, right? They don't want to move out of the house or sell the car, etc. And that might help matching at least that part of the, the smooth, uh, which is related to the smoothing uh, question before. Um, that's, that's essentially my, my comment. Yes. One more question over there. Hi, I'm uh, Carlos Madeira from the Central Bank. Uh, I was going to ask about the policy implications uh, given this hand to mouth consumers cannot coordinate. I was wondering if there was a staggered rebate, like uh, you would get a rebate on the month of your birthday, uh, then maybe it would help smooth out this uh, large rebate uh, and one could get uh, a welfare gain. But uh, I don't know, uh, I wanted to ask. I am again. I always forget the scarves are not good for microphones. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everybody for their comments, and, and particularly Ernesto, who um, is way too modest, um, and, and, and also uh, about himself, and perhaps too laudatory about me. So my, my co-authors were absolutely key on this uh, project. Um, I like his idea. You know, he has extra uh, additional ideas on how to do things, and we'll certainly look into those. And then the heterogeneity of NPCs is something that came up in several comments, and, and that's something we're working more on right now is trying to understand that. Uh, one point I want to make, you know, now Ernesto might be really creative because he's figured out a way around this, but as far as I can see, these are historical counterfactuals, and if you're going to go to the aggregate, or you could even do it at the state level if that's the example, whatever the experiment is needs to be large. So for example, we could not use this method on say the Norwegian lottery results because the lottery is not big relative to the aggregate. Um, so it is limited in when you can apply it, but fortunately these days governments are just giving out huge checks. So, so we get lots of experiments um, from, from that point of view. Uh, so let's see. Uh, okay, so Jonathan, he asked 83%, are we confident? We've, uh, that is based on our estimates and theirs. And again, this is not the overall steady state of the economy, but rather just what these robots are doing, you know, the hand to mouth. Um, and, and you could move that around some, and it, you know, it's just gonna, it, if we move that around, what it means is that a particular 0.3 MPC for total consumption, a different weight will be put on the durables, and so then, if we still get the V shapes, then that would just mean that the overall MPC would have to be a different value to get rid of the V shapes. So I think we're okay there. Now on the replicating it, we actually now, based on the really good uh, feedback we got at summer MBR Summer Institute last summer, we now generate households from our model and estimate, uh, estimate MPCs on that and make sure that we get the same timing that uh, our, you know, Parker and then our new estimates get on that. So we're really trying to keep it consistent that way. So even though our micro foundation isn't great necessarily, you know, we're really not trying to explain micro level data, but rather this disconnect, um, we're at least making sure it's consistent in our model, our, with our macro model. So we don't think that there's too much coming from that, from that 83%. Um, you asked if there's another parameter, we'll look into that. So Alice, Alastair said, uh, the GE smoothing could come later. So, so let me try to clarify what you're trying to say there. Is that um, the GE, can you, say, can you say that again? Because that was a good point. V-shape, yeah. You could have that they don't spend. That they don't spend. Or you could that they have that they spend later. That they spend, but but see, our households have to follow that path that we see that they spend immediately. You know, two thirds. I mean, we have it one third, one third. 
one third. So it would be hard to have that spending by households and yet still get this genius but it moving isn't, later. Isn't that one third one? What, that's a partial equilibrium timing. Yes. Yes. So and so, so the GE effects would shift their potentially shift some GE spending later. I know. We could. Yes. We yeah, yeah. I mean, we can look at that, but I think we wouldn't sort of match our, you know, simulated household stuff. But 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 we'll look at that. So, so that's a useful thing to. Do. So Adrian, um, you're the first because I tell people, give me a reason why we should do Hank rather than Tank because we want parsimony just to make the point and and you've made one of the best arguments and we will look at that so um, again I get you know it's somewhat related to um, Alistair's point about the smoothing that comes from the GE and what you're saying is it could be through the heterogeneity so, so we will we will look at that um, and then Andres asked um, can the model account for the price spikes in uh, Durables, in particular motor vehicles, yes, it can. In fact, that's in the paper. I just didn't have time to talk about it. So, so the reason that we picked five for the elasticity of relative durable goods supply in the extended model is because that generates that same uh, magnitude increase in um, the, the prices. Okay. So Gianluca, yeah, the anticipation. We were also worried about anticipation, and we did our own tests for it, and we couldn't find it. So, you know, if anybody wants to reject the permanent income hypothesis, or at least that, or alternatively, that households just don't believe anything the government does, and they'll spend it when it arrives, which could be an alternative, but you just don't see anticipatory spending. So, so, and, you know, again, we saw that in your experiment. That's a really good paper. You should go back and read your paper. <laughs> um, let's see, Luciano said, uh, he was talking about two-way fixed effects estimator. Can you control for the heterogeneity in MPCs based on observables? That is such an interesting idea, and this is kind of like estimating a state-dependent model, which I do a lot, uh, you know, at the aggregate. So one could imagine doing that. It's, you know, Jonathan Parker has an interesting paper. Is this, who are these hand-to-mouth people? And it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, patterns there. And there's a new paper by Karina Bohr and Mark Bills that I talked to Karina about briefly, but I put it on my to-read list. So, so there, you know, we see some, we might see some other observables that they've, they've come across. And then let's see, Jorge, um, the June and July, you said the spending in June and July and the asymmetry may be important. That's an intriguing thing and, and I wanna ask you about it afterwards because I think it might take a little while to, to describe it, but, that, but asymmetry is certainly an interesting idea there. And then Carlos, the policy implications. That's a really interesting idea about having a staggered rebate so that you don't get all of those price uh, uh, effects on there. Or, or, or like, you, you know, doing it so that, you, you know, you could even have it, say, uh, uh, for industries that have a little bit of extra inventories, you know. So I can tell you all kinds of detail, if people want to hear more, about exactly what was going on in the auto industry that summer, because that rise in oil prices was doing the usual thing that I've written, published papers on, which it was shifting demand from those SUVs that the domestic companies love to build because they have a high markup, to fuel efficient cars, which the foreign companies are very good at doing. And so you have all these interesting things going on there. And, and it's sort of like those rebates on top of the increase in oil prices made it really tough to find the car you wanted, which showed up both in prices and just in low inventories there. So, so that, that's a really interesting idea. So thank you for all the great comments. So now we have lunch that is also going to take place in the, in the room next door, and everyone here is uh, welcome to join us.
Markets, firm level, and bank level heterogeneity in shaping the transmission channels of monetary policy. Today, we're going to have two blocks of 75 minutes with a 15 minute coffee break. Um, the presenters will have uh, 45 minutes to present, discussion will have 15 minutes, and then we'll have uh, 15 minutes for QA. And the organizers asked me to pass the message that if you can please uh, pose your question through the microphone so the streaming works fine. So we're going to start with uh, the first paper, Monetary Policy and Firm Dynamics, the Financial Channel. And our presenter is Andres Fernandez. Andres is currently a senior financial expert at the IMF's Capital Flow Unit in the Monetary and Capital Market Departments, MCM, since April 2022. Previously, he was head of the research department at the Central Bank of Chile between 2019 and 2022 senior economist at the research department of the IDB in Washington between 2012 and 2019, assistant professor at Universidad de los Andes, Bogotá, Colombia between 2010 and 2011. Andres holds a PhD in economics from Rutgers University since 2010. His research, his research focuses mainly on open economy macroeconomics with an emphasis on emerging markets economies. Andres has published in important journals as the Journal of International Economics, IMF Economic Review, International Economic Review, among others. Andres, the floor is yours. You have 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Le let me, uh, before I jump into the paper, uh, let me say a couple of words. First, uh, I'd like to thank the Central Bank of Chile, uh, the contributors to the program, and in particular, the, the board uh, of the bank because of their continued support um, to, for this conference, um, which has been has become really a landmark in the in the circuit of uh, conferences of central banks, and I think this this conference is not an exception to that rule. Uh, I'm very happy to to uh, to be here with you. Um, the the other thing I want to say is w when we first started to think about this conference with Gianluca and Sofia. Uh, this was two and a half years ago, more or less, maybe more. And uh, so we were very excited about the research that was done at the bank, uh, looking at the heterogeneity uh, in the microdata, the very rich microdata that the bank has put together. Uh, there were many exciting projects going on, uh, many ideas, and uh, we had a lot of fun with Gianluca. He came and uh, gave us a course on, on Hank models. And we were, when, when we were discussing about future uh, research agendas, uh, it came natural to think about this conference, to, to get together a, a group, an excellent group of researchers in topics of uh, heterogeneity and macro and uh, help us continue push forward the, uh, the agenda and also showcase a little bit of the, the, uh, the very ambitious agenda that we had set uh, several years ago. So with that in mind, and also it, uh, it gives a, a great excuse for me to come back to, uh, to the bank and, and see many of my former uh, colleagues and friends. So with that in mind, um, let me jump in to, to the paper. This is two cents of this very ambitious agenda that uh, I, but many other researchers in, in the bank um, started. Uh, this is going to be a, a different paper from the others because we're going to look at firms, firm heterogeneity, uh, trying to pin down the financial channel of monetary policy. This is joint work with uh, Boran Aruova um, from Maryland, with Bernabe Lopez and Will Lu, two former colleagues of mine here at the bank, and Felipe Safi from, uh, from UVA Darden. Um, the usual disclaimer applies. This is our views and, and not the bank or, or the IMF. Uh, it's the first time we're going to present this paper after a uh, much work. It's, uh, it's still work in progress. I'm going to talk about at the end of uh, the, the things that we're still doing. 
but uh, uh, very much looking forward to the, your comments. Okay, so let me uh, begin by motivating the, this topic um, with uh, a couple of observations. The first, very uncontroversial, any textbook macro that uh, you can think of, introductory textbook macro, that talks about the transmission of monetary policy, uh, talks about firm investment. And the assumption there is that the monetary policy rate affect, uh, uh, has a direct impact on the opportunity cost uh, of resources. And hence, if this opportunity cost increases because the bank increases the monetary policy rate, well, then fewer uh, investment projects are going to be made, and hence aggregate investment is going to fall. This is in the, in the textbook uh, example. The second observation is that because of that, there has been a lot of effort in trying to understand um, this transmission of monetary policy. Several uh, researchers in, in this room have uh, made great contributions towards that end. And uh, in that process, a perennial question uh, is how much financial factors matter in uh, this transmission mechanism. Very uh, excellent papers have been written on this, on this topic, both theoretical and, and empirical. Uh, and in particular, a question that we will be asking and we will be zooming in uh, quite closely is, uh, for instance, how much does the access of debt matter for the transmission of monetary policy through this financial channel? Does, this, uh, does having more debt does the fact that firms have more debt in an economy matters for the transmission mechanism? Does it amplify or dampens the transmission mechanism of monetary policy? And this is not just an academic uh, question. It's actually a very uh, policy-relevant question, particularly nowadays where central banks have been tightening uh, their monetary policy rates uh, in an environment of corporates that are highly indebted because of the uh, COVID-related uh, debt issuance. So should banks, central banks, tighten more aggressively or less aggressively uh, in this environment of highly indebted corporates? Uh, I said that many people have contributed to an understanding of this financial channel, uh, yet I think it's fair to say that it has, it has proven uh, to be a challenging task because at least two um, shortcomings. First is you need very detailed data to really pin down this financial channel. You need data, you need high frequency data on investment at the firm level. Uh, at the same time that monetary policy is uh, changing, so at very high frequency. Um, and you need, and this is very important for the, the message of the paper, you need to look at the universe of firm. If you look at a subsample of firms, which is what is uh, generally done, uh, you will likely have biased results because the firms that uh, you researchers generally have access to are large firms that are well capitalized, have access to financial debt. So that might bias the identification of this financial channel. There's also a lot of modeling challenges. Uh, if you really want to look at the uh, entire cross-section of firms, you need to account well for uh, particularities in their life cycle. For instance, how investment is lumpy, how their access to finance might be highly heterogeneous across firms. So with this in mind, with these observations in mind, what is it that we do in this paper? We're going to do two things. We're going to do a lot of empirical work and also some theoretical work, some, some modeling. Um, let me highlight the, the key uh, takeaways from both uh, endeavors. On the uh, empirical front, we're going to quantify the impact of monetary policy surprises on firm level variables, such as uh, the, uh, the rates at which they borrow, so the, the, the pass-through of the monetary policy rate to uh, the, the rates at which these firms borrow, their investment um, decisions, as well as their, their uh, hiring decision in the labor market. 
We're going to do this uh, because, uh, or aided uh, by a uh, fantastic data set or several data set uh, on both real and financial variables for the universe of firms in, uh, in Chile at a monthly frequency. Uh, we're going to have loan level information, very rich and detailed uh, in terms of quantity, maturity, and rates of these loans. Importantly, this is going to uh, allow us also to capture non-performing loans or the non-performing status of firms as a proxy for uh, their imperfect access to, to credit. And we're going to couple that with monetary policy surprises um, that I'll say uh, a few words. On the modeling side, basically the contribution is going to be uh, to build a heterogeneous firm uh, model where firms are going to have uh, there's going to be a heterogeneity in their access to uh, finance. And uh, among many other um, characteristics, they, going to, they are going to endogenously uh, decide whether they enter the credit market. And if they enter, they're also going to decide whether they default and hence are excluded. So um, this is going to be central in, in the modeling, trying to capture w what we observe in the data. We calibrate the, the model as uh, much as we can to this uh, very rich micro data from, from Chile. Uh, and what is going to be central in uh, the lessons that the model is going to uh, deliver is that the fear of losing financial access is going to be central in shaping the transmission of monetary policy through the so-called financial channel. Um, so um, in terms of the, the uh, real uh, variables, um, we're going to document the high pass-through uh, to firm level loan rates after a monetary policy surprise. We're going to quantify this dynamic effect of investment and labor um, following the monetary policy surprises. Um, we're going to show how financial access by these firms and the heterogeneity in this financial access is going to be central for the, for the transmission of monetary policy. Um, ergo, and for, um, for we're going to establish, uh, as a result in, uh, in coming from the data, that having access to debt is what determines, after all, the dynamic response of uh, investment and labor. So this um, imperfect access to debt is going to be central in shaping uh, the transmission mechanism. We're also going to uh, establish that um, there's an, uh, an additional or a co complementary view of the uh, financial channel uh, of firms that are accessing debt but that somehow are more risky than others. So we're going to capture this through uh, a proxy for uh, deteriorated debt. Uh, we're, what we're going to find is that risky firms, that is firms with uh, relatively higher spreads, are going to decrease investment by more after a monetary policy surprise. And they're going to increase investment by less after an expansion. right? And uh, we're going to capture this in, uh, in the model, in the theoretical model, uh, by something that we're going to call default aversion. Um, that is, firms with higher default uh, risk, um, with higher spreads, are going to decrease their investment more to avoid losing financial access. So th there's going to be this fear uh, by firms of, of losing uh, financial access. And we're going to do what uh, Ernesto was saying uh, in, in his discussion. After learning this from the model, we're going to go back to the data, to the microdata, and try to validate this mechanism that we learned uh, through the model. Um, and last but not least, uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, look into the policy relevance of these uh, implications. Um, particularly uh, discussing the way in which the distribution of debt matters for uh, the, the calibration of monetary policy. Okay, so um, just a few words on the literature. There's many uh, 
and several important papers uh, that uh, our, our um, worker is going to speak to. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, uh, the seminal contributions of Bernante, Gerkler, and, and Gilchrist on the financial channels. The, there's uh, a set of very uh, nice, relatively new papers that have started to look at financial uh, variables uh, and, and from heterogeneity from a, an empirical perspective. There's also some nice quantitative work. Uh, perhaps the most well known is that of, of Pablo, my discussion with Weinberry in Econometrica that uh, taught us how to start to think about how to model this financial channel. And uh, the last uh, uh, literature strand that the paper is going to talk to is that of quantifying monetary policy surprises uh, in high frequency, which we're going to do leveraging on, on earlier work that we have with other colleagues at the, at the bank. Okay, so let me jump into the data. I need to say a few words about the data because th this is really the, the core. Um, so we take advantage of this massive effort that the bank has done over the years. And here I need to praise uh, many people, uh, starting with Elias Albagli, the chief economist that has pushed uh, for the bank to have this repository of administrative data set that we can now uh, do research, but as well as policy uh, to inform policy discussions. But many others have contributed um, to, this, to this effort. What we're going to do then is we're going to merge several data sets on both real and financial uh, firm level information for the universe of firms in Chile at a monthly frequency. Very quickly, uh, I'm going to go through the, the nature of the, the three types of information that we merge. We merge ta tax records, uh, credit, the credit registry, and monetary policy surprises. Um, so tax records are going to give us monthly information, uh, mandatory uh, uh, forms, uh, that are going to inform things like sales, purchases of inputs, purchase of machinery and equipment, um, we're going to have also access to a match uh, employer-employee data set that, among others, uh, it's going to inform about headcounts, wages. We're also going to have balance sheet information at an annual frequency, which is going to be crucial for uh, several controls that we're going to run. We're going to clean these data so that we end up with real firms, that it firms that have at least three uh, employees that report consistently, um, that invest at least twice in the sample. Um, the credit registry is going to merge three uh, data sets. The monthly bank debt stock consolidated at the firm level. So we're going to know what is the debt stock of, the fir of each firm vis-a-vis -vis the financial system. Importantly, that's going to tell us not only the type of debt, but whether it's what we're going to call deteriorated debt, whether it's def debt that is defaulted, restructured, or in arrears. Um, we're going to have access to loan level information, um, so flows, a very rich in detail about uh, the amount, the interest rate, the type of the loan, the maturity. There's a shortcoming in, uh, with the data set for flows, which is it starts around 2012. All this data, most of it starts in the early 2000s, except the flow data. Um, so that's going to limit our, our analysis. I'll mention a few more words on this. And we're also going to see domestic and foreign bond issuance. So essentially, we're going to have the 360 degrees uh, look at the sources of finance for, for these firms. And we're going to merge this, or we're going to complement this uh, firm level information with monetary policy surprises. Uh, we, with others uh, in the bank, Ernesto and, and others, we did uh, an earlier paper where we looked at, uh, we took a deep dive in, in measuring monetary policy surprises in Chile. After several, uh, uh, several attempts at quantifying these surprises, we ended up uh, choosing the Bloomberg forecast, which is, if, in case you don't know, it's a, a forecast that allows market participants to provide what they think is going to be the monetary policy rate, and it, this, allows to, uh, this allows these market participants to provide their forecast just a few hours before the monetary policy uh, is announced, the monetary policy rate is announced. Um, I, I need to be uh, clear here. 
we're not saying that monetary policy in Chile is done through surprising market uh, systematically, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, that this is a constant feature of monetary policy. In fact, since 2009, where analysis are gonna, is going to start, we have only 15 surprises, five positive and uh, 10 negative, right? So we, we have only a few surprises, but these are precious for us because these are the instances where we can pick and identify the transmission mechanism of, of monetary policy. Okay. Um, I don't have much time to go through the, the descriptive statistics of, of this data. Let me just uh, present two that I think are important for the story. Um, this is leverage, total debt to assets, um, and employment. So this is their, their uh, distributions over the near five millions of observations that we have in the sample, or close to 60,000 firms. And two, two clearly distinctive patterns uh, emanate from, from these plots. First, both uh, distribution plots are highly skewed towards the origin, so um, very little or no debt, and small firms as per employment. On, on debt, 25% uh, of the observations in the data set uh, come from firms without debt, but up to 60% of the firms that we observe through their life cycle um, at some point didn't have debt. And this is essential if you want to build a theory about the financial channel through the universe of firms. You need to account for the fact that many of these firms don't have access to debt at some point in their life. Uh, and it also needs to account for the fact that these firms are relatively small. Okay, so let me jump uh, to the empirical analysis. I'm going to walk you through five uh, empirical facts that we think um, characterize the, the, or allow us to identify the financial channel. First, the, the, the obvious starting point, which is, is there evidence of this transmission uh, mechanism, of this pass-through from monetary policy surprises to the rates at which these firms borrow. Um, so this is the first assumption that I mentioned. It's in the uh, typical textbook, right? So for that, what we're going to do is we're going to go through to the loan level information. As I told you, this loan level information starts in 2012. That restrains a lot the amount of the number of surprises that we uh, have available. We are going to zoom in on three surprises in particular, and we're going to do an event study uh, analysis by regressing um, the rate uh, of firm J in period T to a dummy that takes the value of 1 after the monetary policy surprise takes place. And we're going to run this uh, event study between 30 days before the surprise takes place and 90 days after it takes place. And importantly, we're going to look at firms, only firms, that we see borrowing before and after the surprise, right? And we're going to uh, control further by firm fixed effect and the size and the maturity of the loan. So this is the, the, uh, the ideal uh, setup to, to try to quantify what would have happened had a monetary policy surprise has not occurred. The way we plot the, the, uh, the, the result is by uh, scaling the, the uh, estimated coefficient on the dummy by the, the size of the surprise. So 100 here in this scale, in the vertical scale, means there's a one-to-one -one pass through, right? And as you see, uh, the pass through is quite big and takes place within more or less the, the 20 days. Yeah? Surprise as opposed to a one zero dummy? Because you know, no? You know expectation, then you have the X pulse, you can compute the size. We could, we could, but we're, we're scaling, in the, the way we present this, we're scaling the beta by the size of the surprise. Ah, okay. so it is the size it, of the surprise is. effect. It is. Okay. Right. So it's telling you how much of this 
uh, surprise, whichever the size was, was passed through, right? Um, so, there's, so, so this is the first smell test that there might be a financial channel behind this, right? It's not a definitive proof of a financial channel, clearly, but without this, we couldn't claim that there is a, a financial channel. Let me move on to the second result, which has to do with the investment response, right? So we're gonna move from the loan level information to the monthly information. We're gonna use 15, the 15 surprises that I mentioned, and we're gonna run local projections of uh, this object, which is the investment in firm J, scaled by the uh, assets of that uh, uh, firm. We show in the paper that this is proportional to uh, the change in uh, the capital stock, H periods ahead. And we're gonna, uh, the, the key uh, element here in this regression is gonna be the monetary policy shock here, epsilon, right? And we're gonna use firm fixed effect, uh, industry quarter fixed effect, and several important controls that, um, that allow us to include some of the hypotheses in the literature. So we're gonna have age, we're gonna have size, we're gonna have assets, uh, um, sales to assets to account for possible liquidity uh, mechanism, which has been postulated by, by others. Okay, so uh, what you have in front of you is the, the, uh, the, the local projection results um, up to 36 months um, uh, of horizon. Two things stand out here. First, the, the, the shape of, uh, of this uh, response, it starts to become significant, these are 95 uh, confidence bands, after 11 months, and stabilizes somewhere around uh, the 23rd month. This is remarkable given that the monetary policy horizon in the framework for, that the bank uses as monetary policy framework establishes a horizon of two years. So th this is uh, a good validation of, of this. Now, in terms of the size of these, um, if you um, back out this in terms of the decrease in the capital stock that this coefficient uh, implies, you get a pretty sizable uh, result and a decrease of the total stock of the firm of around 3%, 3.2% after 24 months. So let me move on to result number three um, that follows uh, from, from the previous result. We now want to assess how much of this impulse response, uh, of this uh, dynamic response of investment, is, can be traced back to having debt or not. So this, the first question that I ask in the introduction, how much does having access to debt matter for the transmission channel of monetary policy? And what we do is we expand this local projection by including a dummy, which essentially takes the value of one if uh, in period T, firm J had debt or not. Um, and hence, the, the, uh, the total uh, coefficient that we're interested for these firms with access to debt is uh, the sum of, B, uh, of beta H plus beta HD. This sum is exactly this a local projection. On your left, you have the previous result that had established that there is a dynamic response of, of investment. What you have uh, in uh, orange is those firms without debt, so this, only this coefficient, the beta H. What is, um, is clear from this is that the entire dynamic response of investment is driven by firms with access to debt. Now, of course, you might be thinking, well, but uh, having access to debt is not or may not be considered as a binary uh, uh, outcome, right? You might have uh, access to debt, you might have debt today, but as a firm, you might be a little bit more constrained than the firm next to you because, for instance, you might have a more uh, difficult financial situation, right? Uh, so you might have defaulter, you might be in the process of restructuring, that that might um, prevent you from fully accessing the financial system. Okay, and so this is what we're gonna zoom in. We're gonna look at the extent to which 
for those firms that have debt, how much uh, action do we see in uh, heterogeneity of this, uh, this um, ability to access finance? And for that, we're going to uh, include a, um, a variable that uh, here is DD, that's deteriorated debt. It's a continuous variable that uh, is computed as the sum of defaulted debt plus a restructured debt um, plus debt in arrears over total debt as a way to capture the potential uh, problems that these firms that might have deteriorated debt have in uh, accessing the financial system. And uh, we can show you and we can, we can come back in the Q&A, we have some statistics that show that these firms with high DD, deteriorated debt, have less probability of um, uh, accessing uh, debt and have higher rates, right? So what we do is we, we want to explore these coefficient. And I should say that this, um, this time fixed effect is now monthly to fully absorb the effect of the monetary policy shock. And what we're interested is in this new coefficient which is going to capture this differential act, uh, access coming from deteriorated debt. And we do see that it's significant. It increases. So if you think about a, a, a monetary policy surprise that is contractionary that decreases investment, this dampens the effect of the monetary policy shock, right? So, uh, and it's also uh, economically uh, meaningful, the coefficient. A firm with 50% delinquent debt will invest half of a percentage less relative to firms without delinquent debt, right? So this channel also works through, um, through this um, non-binary access to debt. Last result, um, in a compact way, what happens to the labor market decision, so the hiring decision of the firm? This is very novel. To our knowledge, this is the first paper that has looked at labor outcome results following monetary policy surprises uh, at very high frequency, at monthly uh, frequency, which is key to, to uncover this financial channel. Uh, and what we have qualitatively the same results. We see a negative uh, impact on uh, employment growth um, following a monetary policy surprise. Um, if you want to quantify this, 100%, 100 basis point increase in the policy rate decreases uh, employment by 1% after 12 months. And this, importantly, this channel is also coming exclusively from firms with debt. Um, and what is even more interesting is that this dampening effect of having delinquent debt uh, is not only active there, but it, it kicks in much earlier than for investment. Right? So this dampening effect takes place much uh, earlier after the shock. We believe that this is related to the fact that uh, firms uh, borrow to pay part of their, um, their working capital, um, their labor. OK, so let me now shift gears to the model. So, just to fix ideas and to set expectations, what is it that we want to do with the model? We want to build a model that can help us rationalize these empirical uh, facts. And importantly, we want to have a, a feature that in the models allows us to capture differential degrees of financial access, which to us is, is relevant for explaining this empirical result. We're going to. Um, we're going to use non-convex uh, cost of accessing debt. And we're going to also feature entry and exit from default. So this possibility of losing financial access is going to be present uh, throughout the model. And we're going to, uh, with this model, try to quantify um, the extent to which the presence of this uh, possibility of losing financial access matters for the transmission of monetary policy. So um, let me mention a few key ingredients of, of the model. So we're going to have a fixed mass uh, of firms that are going to be making investment and, and hiring decisions. Um, 
to produce a unique good using uh, DRS technology. Uh, we're going to try uh, the, uh, our best to fully account for the life cycle of firms, so to account for the fact that they uh, very slowly accumulate capital. So we're going to have quadratic adjustment cost in, in investment. We're going to have idiosyncratic shocks to, to TFP. Uh, and the, these firms are going to die at an exogenous probability uh, rate of uh, omega, right? So new firms are going to replace these, these firms that die. Um, firms, uh, these new firms, when they're born, uh, they're not going to have access to dead markets. They can gain access to dead market after paying a one-time cost uh, for accessing this. Um, and after paying that cost and being able to issue debt, um, they might have the, they can have the possibility of uh, defaulting, uh, in which case they incur in a productivity loss and can re-enter with some probability. Um, after that, investors recover a fraction of psi of, of their debt. So what is essential for you to retain from, from this setup is that we're going to be keeping track of three types of uh, firms. Uh, firms, uh, the first kind of firms are firms that have access to debt and are in good standing, right? So they, they haven't defaulted, they can, can issue debt. The second type of firms is firms that have never accessed debt markets, so they haven't paid this, this one-time um, cost. And then the, the third type of uh, firms is firms that did pay that cost, did borrow, and are in delinquent uh, status, okay? And hence, have been temporarily excluded from markets. Yep. You know, there are some firms that are very innovative and may not have a lot of uh, guarantees, uh, but th they are very risky, but more in the technological sense, not, not because they don't pay and so on. Yeah. Would they fit in those categories? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so we're going to have a heterogeneous TFP. So we're going to have this dispersion of TFP. So you, you can think of a very productive firm that is borrowing precisely because it's very productive, right? Now, whether what does firm eventually decides to do with that is going to uh, be determined by future productivity uh, uh, shocks, right? So if that firm, very productive firm, uh, receives uh, a sequence of negative shocks, that might lead that firm to default, right? Um, so monetary policy is going to be captured in a very simple way here. It's going to, there's going to be a, a, a one-time unexpected increase in the real rate. And uh, so far, the analysis is going to be uh, in, in partial equilibrium. Yep. Permanent? So, permanent increase in the real rate? No, 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 no. no. One period? One period. Okay. One period. And then back. Yeah. OK, so I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, the idea it was to walk you through the, the dynamic problem of uh, these uh, three types of firms. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, let me just say uh, an important uh, um, element in the model, which is uh, the, 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 the lenders here are risk neutral the lenders who provide funds to this firm. The, the price of the debt is going to be uh, directly influenced by the probability of debt. This is very important because the probability of default is going to be directly mapped to the spreads that these firms uh, face. Um, so higher firm level interest rates are going to uh, indicate that um, firms are going to have higher risk of losing uh, access to, to debt, right? So we're going uh, to be looking at uh, the distribution of rates that is the distribution of risk in this economy. OK. Um, we, some parameters we, we take from the literature. This is not terribly exciting. There are some other parameters which we calibrate, um, trying to match some targets. I don't have the time to go through each one of them. For instance, uh, a, a key parameter is this fixed one-time cost for accessing debt. Um, perhaps more important is what are the, the targeted moments. 
So we have uh, 10 targeted moments, um, one that we care uh, much, we care about all, but one that we particularly pay attention is this share of firms with debt as per the motivation that I mentioned. So this is critical that we're targeting uh, this, um, this share of, of firms that eventually have debt. But there are other um, moments associated with delinquency status, with leverage that we want to, uh, to match. And the, the calibration so far, this is preliminary, uh, does a reasonably good job in, in matching uh, the 10 moments. Let me jump to the, the quantitative uh, experiments that we do with this, this model. First, as in the data, we see what happens after a monetary policy surprise. On your left, you have the path of investment. On your right, employment, employment growth. And as you see, the model can reproduce this stark difference that I showed earlier in the empirical result between firms with access to credit and firms without access that in the model are firms uh, that haven't accessed yet or firms that access but are temporarily excluded because they are in default. So the model has the ability to match this, this uh, important finding of the financial channel. But of course, we, we want to go deeper into this and as we do with the empirical results by looking at firms with access to debt, but looking at the heterogeneity in firm uh, risk. Uh, by looking at, for instance, or comparing what happens between uh, less risky firms, some firms with low interest rate, and firms with high interest rate more risky. Okay? And what we do here in this experiment is we shock the model uh, following a, a 50 basis point uh, shock uh, on the left, we have uh, a decrease, so uh, an expansionary monetary policy surprise, and on your right, uh, a contractionary monetary policy surprise. And what is interesting, and is one of the lessons we, we draw from the model, is that uh, there is an in interesting asymmetry. When there is an expansion of monetary policy, so that is uh, uh, on your left, firms with high interest rates, so risky firms, expand investment less than less risky firms, okay? But the opposite happens when a contractionary uh, surprise hits. It's firms with high interest rates, so more risky firms, that reduce investment the most, okay? What is going on here? So the next obvious uh, variable to look at is what happens to debt, right? Um, so. This is the model-based input responses associated to these two types of shocks, expansionary on your left, contractionary on your right. And what you see is basically these firms uh, that are more risky are increasing debt, in the case of an expansionary shock, less than uh, relatively less risky firms. But when the monetary policy contraction shock hits on your right, they're deleveraging higher uh, at, a, at a more... Um, it, with a stronger force. Um, so what is, can we validate this uh, process uh, or this fact in, uh, in the data? So this is where we go back to the data and we see the following. So we're, what we're trying to do is we go back to the loan level information and what we ask is what was the pass through uh, from the surprises to the uh, firm's uh, interest rates uh, after a monetary policy surprise. So we go back to these three episodes, so these, these three surprises. Uh, we have two expansionary surprises on uh, your left and on your right um, of minus 25 basis points and uh, 50 basis points in uh, 2013 and 2019. And what we see is that in these two episodes, the riskier firms get a larger rate cut, right? Um, so the pass-through is stronger for them. In this case and in this case. What happens uh, in the contractionary shock that we Andres, have? The one Andres, can I ask a question? So 
there's no, there no feedback in the model between, say, uh, an expansionary monetary policy shock and the aggregate economic conditions, or say the productivity level, the aggregate productivity no, level. Yeah, of no, no. Okay. There is no feedback, no. Okay. no. Um, so what we observe in the contractionary surprise in the middle is that riskier firms deleverage so much that the risk actually decreases. That's why you have this result here, which is below zero. So we find, we think that this is evidence that validates this default aversion mechanism that the model taught us. Um, so this is where we're, we're, we're still working on in trying to tease out some of the policy implications of this. Uh, one obvious policy implication is that the, the distribution of risk that is a, um, what is the mass of firms that have high default uh, probability vis-a-vis -vis those that have relatively less matters for the conduct of monetary policy. So uh, in a tightening cycle, it should matter whether firms are more or less indebted. And that this is where, where we are working in, in polishing, uh, policy counterfactuals. So let me, uh, in the 40 seconds that I have, let me conclude by um, saying what is it that we find in this paper. So we uh, identified a set of facts in the data that we believe uh, offer strong evidence of a financial channel uh, in the transmission of monetary policy. There's a strong pass-through uh, from monetary policy surprises to rate, rates at which these firms borrow. Um, after these surprises, there are a significant and protracted uh, effects on investment and employment at the firm level as well. Uh, these largely impact firms with debt, so we, we are able to uh, identify that these important dynamic responses come from firms uh, that have access to debt, and that uh, the ability to borrow uh, this heterogeneity in, uh, in financial access matters for the response of firms to monetary policy surprises. And we develop a model um, that we believe um, helps us rationalize some of these facts. And essential to the model is this fear by firms of losing financial access. And that has the potential to shape the way um, the firms respond to monetary policy surprises. Let me stop here and uh, thank you very much for your time. Good. Thank you, Andres. Thank you for a very interesting presentation and paper. And uh, we'll hear from Pablo, your discussant. Um, and we'll hopefully we'll have time for questions uh, later. So Pablo, he's a Keenan Fellow of the Department of Economics and Princeton University. 2022-2023, Associate Professor of the Department of Economics at the University of Michigan. He's also a research associate at NBR and associate editor of Journal of Monetary Economics and Journal of International Economics. He received a PhD from Columbia University in 2015, a BA from Universidad de la República, Montevideo, Uruguay. Vale. Pablo has published in top journals as Econometrica, Journal of International Economics, Journal of Political, Political Economics Macro, and among others. Pablo, you have 15 minutes. Testing, yes. All right, so you hear me with the microphone? Yeah? All right, so thank you very much to the organizers for a fantastic conference and for inviting me to discuss uh, this paper. Um, I think this is a, a great paper, but as Jordi uh, increased the bar, I really think this is a <laughs> great paper. Um, and, um, and given that this is the first session on from heterogeneity, just to add a kind of a once mot mot motivational slide about it. So this is um, showing you, this figure shows the dynamics 
of um, investment um, from CompuSat firms during the last three recessions pre-COVID. On the left panel, you have the average investment dynamics of firms. You see a contraction of investment. On the right panel, you have the histogram of investment rates in recession periods and non-recession periods. You see basically a massive amount of, of heterogeneity across firms. So, so this is uh, kind of a first order um, uh, importance uh, from the perspective of thinking, for example, of, of policies. And this is what the uh, uh, paper asks. Uh, how do firms with different financial positions, in this case, you know, you can have many different many reasons for heterogeneity, but focusing on financial positions, how do firms with different financial positions uh, respond to monetary policy? And the answer to this question is theoretically ambiguous. On the one hand, um, firms that, for example, have risk uh, face a steep marginal cost curve to finance investment, and that dampens the response uh, to monetary policy. On the other hand, to the extent that monetary policy alleviates these frictions, for example, by increasing cash flows or improving collateral values, that can amplify the response uh, of these uh, uh, risky type of firms. Okay, so it is uh, also very important here to, to have evidence. Most of the current evidence that we have uh, comes from uh, publicly traded large firms. So one thing that the paper does is to have these um, excellent data set that covers universe of firms, has also high frequency that is important for monetary policy, real and financial variables. So you know, when the paper says that it has a unique data set, they also really mean <laughs> that they have a unique data set. Uh, they, they, they can really do um, uh, um, very interesting work documenting these heterogeneous responses. The paper has many findings, let me highlight two. So first, the response is driven by firms with uh, access to debt markets, it's a very interesting finding. And also that risky firms uh, increase their investment by less in response to monetary expansion and uh, contract uh, by more following monetary contractions. Okay, so overall, the overall takeaway is that financial positions matter for the response of monetary policy, and I'm going to focus my discussion mostly on the different sources of financial heterogeneity that the paper considers um, on other potential sources of heterogeneity and on the main uh, model mechanisms. Okay, so I'll start with firms that have access uh, to that market, um, and uh, I'll consider kind of a benchmark um, um, kind of with some simplifications of the model, for example, no exit, a value of zero in default. Instead of adjustment costs as I do, I'm going to consider kind of a price of capital, which is easier for the characterization that I'm going to show. And I'm going to potentially include here the possibility that there are general equilibrium effects, such as changes in the price of capital or changes in uh, real wages uh, that these uh, firms uh, pay. Okay, so now what is the optimal investment choice of a firm that finances its investment uh, with debt um, and, 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 and with a debt that is risky. Well, it, it, its investment expenditure is going to be financed through its flow fund constraint, through its uh, earnings net of dividends, and these earnings pi here um, denote the, the, the max over labor of, uh, of your revenues minus uh, wage spending. So if you, know, if you have any general equilibrium force, it will enter through this uh, 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 T subscript that you have there, and then you have some borrowing uh, flow, and importantly, you have this price Q, which is a bond price scale that the firm faces that depends on, on productivity and depends on also on uh, the choice of the firm of capital and the choice of the firm of debt. All right, so that's the flow fund constraint. Uh, then we have um, the Euler equation that characterizes the firm's optimal capital choice. So here I'm combining the Euler equation uh, for capital and debt. Uh, and I'm rearranging it in a convenient fashion to analyze um, the differential response of different type of firms. So on the left-hand side, I have something that I'm going to refer to as a, a marginal cost um, uh, of investment. Uh, it's a product of two terms, one that captures the price that you pay for your unit of capital, and also that takes into account that when you accumulate capital, you decrease your spreads. The other is uh, the fact that when you borrow more, you increase uh, your borrowing cost because you are riskier. Okay, on the right-hand side, uh, we have the uh, marginal benefits of investment, uh, and I'm going to be focusing on particular on the marginal revenue product of capital, which is a relative of, of revenues with respect to uh, capital. All right, so now, now let's think about the question of um, how different firms respond to, to this monetary policy, and this is, um, I, I think, trying to dig into, into the model's mechanisms. So I'm going to first consider 
the case of a risk-free firm. And I'm plotting here on the horizontal axis a choice of capital, on the vertical axis, marginal cost and marginal uh, benefit uh, from uh, investment. Um, the marginal cost uh, is set at the flat region in which the firm that is borrowing is currently not facing any risk, so their marginal cost is only the price of capital that they pay. The marginal benefit curve is decreasing because of decreasing returns, uh, and the um, optimal choice of capital is determined as the intersection between this marginal cost and marginal benefit. Then uh, a marginal, now, now a, a risky firms face an upward sloping marginal cost curve to finance investment. That's because any additional unit of capital that the firm wants has to be financed by debt. That is risky, and therefore every additional unit of debt uh, implies a higher marginal cost uh, to finance investment. Also, we are considering here uh, the optimal choice of capital as an intersection between these two curves. Now think about a monetary expansion, a decrease in interest rates, so the decreasing interest rates here will be a shift in this marginal uh, benefit of investment uh, because I put the real rate on the, on the side of the marginal benefit. So uh, a declining rate makes uh, the benefit of investment uh, uh, more valuable and therefore both uh, risk-free and risky firms are willing to invest more. Now the interesting thing here is that the risky firm which faces an upward slope in marginal cost curve to finance investment, uh, is going to be less willing to increase its investment precisely because uh, that additional unit uh, implies a higher marginal cost curve to finance that investment. Okay, now you see how this model with default risk can be consistent with the evidence that firms with access to ed markets uh, are uh, less responsive if they have risk, are less responsive to monetary stimulus. You also see because of the shape of this marginal cost curve that this model can lead to some uh, asymmetries, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's nice that the, the paper is uh, finding these asymmetries that have been uh, harder to find in the data. The fact that they have very rich data uh, is useful in that regard. Now, this is kind of the, the, the model they consider is in, in partial equilibrium. Uh, I, I think it, it's nice to, to fit some features of the data, but something I have to mention is that if when you put this into general equilibrium, there are many other mechanisms that arise that I think to fit but particularly quantitatively the model are very important to consider. So first, the fact that the increase in investment of all firms pushes up the price of capital, therefore increases the marginal cost curve. Uh, second, that there are additional shifts in the marginal benefit curve because of the increase in demand. For example, if you have a new Keynesian block close in the model, an increase in demand will push up the price at which the firm uh, sells its capital, therefore incentivizing more investment. And importantly here, if you are uh, a, a risky firm, your cash flows are going to be also increasing because of demand, so you're going to be able to finance more um, uh, investment out of your uh, revenues from earnings. And also the, f the marginal cost flattens out because the collateral that you have now is more valuable, and that is what the financial accelerator mechanism is going to try to capture. Okay, so, so in principle, uh, the nice thing is that the paper has a benchmark in the data, so we know overall what the response has to be. But again, kind of quantitatively, I think these general equilibrium forces are important, and, and I'm going to take them with me for the other case that I'm going to be analyzing. Okay, that's the case of firms with access to credit. Now let me focus on kind of the most um, novel aspect, which is about these firms that don't have access to credit markets. And remember here, the finding is that firms without access exhibit little response to monetary policy shock. I'm going to be focusing on the model definition uh, that is th that of firms that never borrow. One small comment here, I will think that in the data it would be nice to, to have that definition also close to this, only considering firms that, for example, have never borrowed as a definition. But that, that's kind of a, just as a, as, a, as a small point on the mapping. Now, let me try to enter more into uh, what is the choice of these firms that never borrow and why in the model uh, the, the, the paper shows that these type of firms are not responsive. Well, again, we have the flow of funds constraint, uh, and we have um, investment being financed by earnings and by any liquid assets that the firm has. And then now we have a portfolio choice that tells us that in principle this firm has two assets, has these, these liquid assets, and has its uh, uh, capital in which it could invest. So the firm will be equalizing the returns of these two types of assets. And of course, uh, I'm considering here the firm that has chosen or that, that, that chose not to borrow. So there is a Lagrange multiplier telling us that uh, that uh, choice of debt has to be consistent with no uh, borrowing. All right, now, if we see this portfolio condition here, we will say, well, but this firm will be responsive 
to changes of monetary policy. So how does the paper, or how does the model, or this is my reading of the model, how does the model uh, generate that these firms are not responsive? Well, there are two key assumptions here um, that, that I, I think when I'm a bit faster, let me kind of revise them. So one is that the model assumes that if that interest rates on these firms do not change with monetary policy. Okay, so the paper assumes this RF here equal to one. Right, so whenever there are changes in monetary policy, that not, does not create a portfolio incentive for a firm, for example, to accumulate more capital if the return on the uh, risk-free asset uh, is, is changed. The other is that there are no general equilibrium effects because, again, if we have, for example, general equilibrium effects and you have more earnings now, that will make that these firms respond. Now, on the first point, let me elaborate a bit further. Uh, and, and here I think the paper, something the paper could do is to see if it could try to justify its assumption that interest rates uh, do not change for these type of firms that do not have debt but accumulate liquid assets. Uh, this is some evidence from a paper by Espinosa Vega and Rebucci showing uh, deposit rates and monetary policy um, for the Chilean economy. Right, so what you can see is that these uh, deposit rates uh, that are from the retail sector track pretty well um, the, 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 the monetary policy, um, uh, changes in monetary policy. Okay, so I think it will be important to try to think, okay, in, on what type of liquid assets these firms that do not have that invest, and to what extent is it, you know, a, a, a sensible assumption to think that the returns of these, these assets do not change. Also, in, in that spirit, it will be nice that if, if the paper enters further into what is the level of liquid assets that these firms have, the strength of any mechanism that has to do with fluctuations in this rate is going to be uh, linked to the how much liquid assets these firms have. This is another a Chilean paper that shows, for example, that small, small firms have more uh, cash than uh, the rest of the firms in the economy. So it would be nice if the paper could elaborate more uh, into that. Um, uh, so, so kind of to, let, let me kind of come back to the finding, right? So we know that these firms do not respond. So um, we know that any model that we write down needs to feed that. Now, I, what I think the, a, a model that now incorporates interest rates that move and that incorporates these general equilibrium effects will potentially need some additional frictions to explain this inaction of firms that do not have uh, that. So, you know, the, the nice thing about having the data is that anchors a result. But I think it will be also important to try to explain them in the context of rates that do move and in the context of having uh, these G effects. Okay, so um, two additional suggestions in terms of additional dimensions of heterogeneity that I think the paper uh, could try to analyze uh, because precisely it has a, a kind of a very rich data set. One is on the um, uh, path through of firms with different interest rates. Like the key insight of the model is that if you have firms that have different path through, that is going to create heterogeneity in responses. In the model, those are firms that do not have that or that do have that. But I think the, 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 the paper has, in principle, the potential of mapping that mechanism, for example, of firms that exhibit different type of contracts, fixable, variable, or, or mixed rates that the paper mentions that it has this data. So, you know, it, the, the question will be empirically if the, is, for example, the investment of firms with flexible rates more responsive to monetary policy, and uh, can an extended version of the model uh, match differential responses by different type of interest rates? I think that will be very connected to the main insight that the paper has about heterogeneity in path through of firms' interest rates. And now the second uh, suggestion, and, and this is kind of a, a bit more um, uh, outside of the exact mechanism that, that the paper model is considering, but I think it's very important for the field in which it's uh, contributing to, which is that in, the, in emerging markets, a central financial considerations that both policymakers and academics tend to have are about currency mismatch and uh, contractionary devaluations. There are many models that give you contractionary uh, devaluations, uh, for example, through balance sheet effects or through, for example, household uh, heterogeneity uh, in, in more recent work. Um, now, Chile has something that is kind of a, something that the rest of emerging economies admire, which is that it has very little uh, uh, dollarization. Most of that is denominated in local currency. Okay, so only 12% of that in foreign currency. However, I think still uh, the fact of having that source of heterogeneity can provide uh, evidence on whether this uh, balance sheet effect exists for firms which is something that will contribute significantly to this literature, right? So the literature on currency mismatch and contractionary evaluation is, is vast, but, but I think it, it, this kind of sharp evidence about that mechanism will be very useful 
uh, to inform uh, those models. Okay, so to wrap up, a uh, very interesting paper. Um, I found it, uh, the findings fascinating. Uh, excellent data quality, and I will consider enriching the model to account for the lack of response of firms without debt and liquid assets in a context of changes of rates and general equilibrium, and I will potentially analyze these other uh, key sources of financial federation. Very, very grateful to have enthusiastic comments after lunch. So I know you may want to address some of, of, of his points, but we're going to take a few questions from the audience, and, and you can. Sure. Here you go, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. It's a very interesting paper, and I, I, I uh, the, the data sounds great. One, one. I mean, you, you talked about having debt and having access to debt, sort of interchangeably, and, and, and I guess they're not exactly the same thing. I mean think that there are firms that just have access to debt but choose not to And the empirical stuff, it seems like, I mean, it would be nice to, if you can split whether by, by whether they have debt or not no debt, that's nice, but you could also maybe look at large firms, small firms, young firms, old firms, fast-growing firms, slow-growing firms, shrinking firms. I mean, it would be just interesting to see whether the same, you get any uh, variation in the, in the response to these shocks across other dimensions that you can your Stephanie? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I just, following up Jonathan's point, um, I want to elaborate a bit when I interrupted you. Um, I, 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 when I've been in conferences with people who are sort of more in the, in, in a tradition of innovation and how you, <coughs> new firms, in sort of Schumpeter tradition, when they talk about risk, they talk about technological risk. You know, you have something, or uncertainty even, that is different from what we think about as financial risk, inability to pay. Um, I mean, there's some overlap, but this is like good risk, because if, if the project works, it can give you very high returns, even the society, even though it may be big externalities, but if it doesn't work, you lose the money. Um, so I was just wondering if now, or maybe in another paper, you could look at that, because those firms um, are particularly valuable because they increase productivity, they introduce more innovation, which, for example, in Chile we're very short of. Please, Marco. Nice presentation, actually. Great discussion. Just a small point, I mean, it seems that uh, to compare the data analysis with the model, right? I mean, in in in, in the data, probably the, the not revert to a surprise after one period, as I understand you do in the model. There is some persistence, definitely there is in the U.S. So maybe what you could do to calibrate that, you know, that that persistence is you could do the the um, uh, local projection on the real rate, uh, right, and get a sense of, of you know, uh, things. Here's another question. So, Carlos, and then. Whether it is possible to use an instrumental variable for the financial positions, because these firms without debt and these firms in delinquency maybe they are in that financial position because they don't have good investment projects, right? So it would bias your results because perhaps if this firm had a good financial, a good economic project, uh, then it wouldn't be in delinquency. And therefore what you are capturing is something correlated but quite different from financial position. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Very interesting results. Uh, I was wondering, and this is a point uh, which is, uh, was mentioned by Gianluca, uh, the probability of default depends on the aggregate productivity shocks, I think. So if uh, the surprises, which are three, are happening at the same time that uh, the economy is being hit by a productivity shock, 
then maybe you may be having some identification problems if the shocks uh, move uh, in the direction of uh, increasing the, the probability of default when the policy surprise is positive. So then uh, the identification is going to be difficult. But if the productivity shock is in the opposite direction, then uh, maybe you are uh, underestimating the results uh, you are, that you are showing. So my point is, uh, perhaps it will be interesting if you can identify whether the, the economy was, uh, when the surprises hit the economy, the, the monetary policy surprises hit the economy, whether the economy was in a boom or in a bust cycle, so to speak. So let's start with these questions. Yeah, no, th thank you so much for, for all the comments. They're great for, uh, for us to continue pushing this, uh, this agenda. Uh, and especially thanks to, to your comments, uh, Pablo. I was anticipating the international macro aspect. <laughs> uh, um, so le let, me, let me say a few words. Um, general equilibrium effects, totally agree. This is something that uh, we, we would like to incorporate, uh, and, uh, and definitely we, we will. Um, I should say, however, that, and this I think touches upon some of the things that were mentioned, in, uh, in the empirics, we are capturing for, uh, or we are controlling for things like aggregate demand. So we are having uh, sales as a control. We're uh, controlling also for cash flows. So th these are things that might have second run or general equilibrium effects. But definitely, I'm not going to argue with you in that in the, we, we need to have a good understanding of what happens in the model once we turn on these G effects. Um, and what you said about the price of capital is a, a really good example. Um, so you are right and thanks for clarifying this i didn't have the time to go through the details of the model we are making this very sharp assumption that if you have not paid the cost of entering credit markets you can only accumulate assets right and these assets pay no interest and th this is an extreme assumption we have started to look at what happens to firms uh, that are in this state in the data and they do, they do accumulate uh, assets. Um, so, and we, we can have a story of what happens to the income that they receive from these assets. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting avenue. Um, the, the debt currency denomination, this is a huge uh, topic. We're actually thinking uh, we will have a, a, complement, a complementary paper, a short paper, on, on just the international aspect of this. Let me just advertise, there have been other papers uh, uh, from people uh, at the bank that have looked at uh, currency denomination, uh, and in particular, how firms, for instance, during COVID, were able to switch the, their, uh, uh, their finances, either domestically or externally. Right? So th there is very interesting work here uh, done uh, in, in the international dimension. Um, now, going to Jonathan's uh, comment, um, thank you, uh, the, the, we will. One thing that we do um, is we, we see what are the characteristics of firms that have debt and firms that do not have debt. And they're the usual, right? So they're intuitive. So firms with debt are bigger. Uh, they are older. Um, a, and um, they, they tend to uh, borrow at, uh, at low rates. Um, now, one thing that I didn't mention is some of the controls that we have in the dynamic uh, investment uh, and employment regressions, local projections, is so we control for age, and you get age is one of the controls. So you get the typical or the intuitive uh, results, which is firms, as, as they age, they invest less. Uh, as they are older, they invest less as well. Um, so some of the 
topics that you touched upon, we, we are exploring them, um, but we agree that, or I agree, that we, we, will, we should benefit from looking at uh, uh, larger firms versus smaller firms, um, whether that makes a difference. Uh, Stephanie, um, thanks again. The, I think you have a much richer model than what we have. <laughs> so these, these are firms that uh, in the steady state are all, all the same. They just have differential uh, uh, productivity shocks. Um, so some might uh, reach this optimal level faster than others, but they all, they're, they're all the same, right? We could think of more elaborate a financial development type of models where, where there is a differential steady state. Um, uh, uh, Marco, thanks a lot for, for this. We'll, we'll think about it. Rodrigo as well and, and, uh, and Carlos. Very, very good suggestion. We'll, we'll think about that too. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's any other questions from the audience. Here we go. Hi. Because we have a few minutes left and we can take advantage of that. Hello. Hi, Andres. Thank you very much. So I just have a question regarding the sample. I mean, this is supposed to be the universe, but the numbers is like uh, 57,000 firms, a uh, medium uh, size of 14 employees. So what was the, how, what's the total uh, labor force that is represented in the... In the, in the sample, I think uh, it might help us to somehow have an idea whether we can extract or begin to extract some conclusions from micro data or from micro uh, evidence to the macro level impact. Because uh, we, we know in Chile we have a important, in a large part of the, of the labor force concentrated and investment is concentrated in large firms. So whether we are capturing those big firms and maybe they are not represented by these uh, numbers that you, that you get. So thinking of the way in which we can connect your findings with the micro, with the macro uh, level impact of these findings. Yes, so uh, because we don't have yet a general equilibrium set up, it's hard for us to talk about aggregate outcomes yet, right? Eventually we, we will get there. One thing that your question reminds me, reminded me is that we are looking at, uh, and this touches upon what Jonathan mentioned, we, are, we do see what happens to listed firms. I didn't get the chance to, to look at that, which is the big bulk of the investment. And we do this following your work, uh, that looked at, at listed firms, and there is also a dampening effect. effect. Uh, so you do see uh, this financial channel also taking place uh, through listed firms. Eventually, we will get there um, in terms of being able to say something about aggregate investment, and most likely it will say uh, something about how these big firms are or account most of the, the investment in Chile. We're not there yet. Okay, I think we're going to be following that future work. So I'll, I, it's time to finish the session to thank Andres and, and Pablo, and we'll have time for a 15-minute coffee break.
Okay. So after our very short water break, we're gonna conclude with the with the, um, the last academic session. Um, we're gonna cha change gears a little bit, and we're gonna talk about bank lending channel across the time and space. Uh, this paper by Dean Corvey and Pablo Drasmo studies monetary policy design in a detailed model of banking sector with heterogeneous banks. So. I'm gonna talk a, lot, a little bit about Dean. Dean is the William Celery Trackable Chair in Finance and Professor in the Department of Finance, Investment and Banking at the Wisconsin School of Business. He also holds a tenure appointment in the Economics Department at UW. Um, Dean earned a BA in Economics from Colgate University and his PhD from Yale University. His current research projects focus on consumer credit and bankruptcy, foreclosures and banking industry dynamics. His research in macroeconomics and econometric has been published in top journals as, to, as Econometrica, the Journal of Political Economy, among others. Dean, you have 45 minutes. Um, thank you very much. Thanks uh, to the organizers for, um, for inviting me. It's a really, I've learned a lot in this conference. I, I'm not a, uh, a New Keynesian a Hank person. <laughs> uh, I do think a lot about uh, about heterogeneity, but I've never done that, so I've learned a ton, and uh, I appreciate being here. Uh, this is joint work with Pablo Durasmo. I have to say, we started working on this about two months ago, <laughs> so this is really, really preliminary. Some of the, I mean, it's not, the model is not calibrated fully, et cetera. So I would say that when you see results from the model, uh, take it with a grain of salt. We need to do a better calibration. I just want to step back for one second. So, um, so it was good that uh, the preceding paper was all about heterogeneity across non-financial firms. This is going to be about heterogeneity in financial firms. And you know, we've, we've sort of, in the evolution of heterogeneity, because this is a heterogeneity uh, conference, um, you know, we kind of started with Buley, Huggett, and Iagari, where it was firm, uh, household le level heterogeneity. That went back a long time ago. Hoppenheide had uh, firm level heterogeneity back to 1992. Um, so, but then when, uh, when I started, so uh, in 2008, uh, Ben Bernanke said the biggest problem for the US financial system was too big to fail. And so then as a macro person, I kind of said to myself, you know, what macro models do we have to think about too big to fail? And when you start thinking about big, I mean, there was no size, in most of the models, if it even had a bank in the DSG model, there was perfect competition, constant returns to scale, size is indeterminate. So, you know, even thinking too big, you know, big, there was no size distribution in our banks, in our models. And so that's what got uh, Pablo and I thinking about uh, introducing a size distribution into the banking industry. So, um, and, and then, you know, frankly, uh, in 2018, the, the Jackson, you know, Jackson Hole had a whole conference on um, changing market structures and implications for monetary policy. So, um, Ross Levine and I did a paper there, kind of thinking about how does market structure affect bank um, profitability and in the presence of, uh, you know, uh, deposit insurance, limited liability, there's this moral hazard problem. So that a little bit too much competition, banks can chase yield and become more risky. So there becomes a, you know, stability-wise, that, that can be an issue. Though market efficiency-wise, it might be good. So there's a potential trade-off between stability and market efficiency. And, and that's, you know, sort of one of the things that uh, we wanted to explore in this kind of agenda. So that all being said, um, so this, this paper is uh, kind of going to start. Um, there's both a cross time and space in the title, so I have to kind of motivate those two things. Uh, in, in the US, let me go through this a little bit because uh, not a lot of people necessarily know that uh, here. There was this thing called the Regal Neal Act of 1994. Prior to that, uh, banks could not cross state boundaries. 
And I mean, there was actually a little bit of uh, independent state changes before 1994, but it became national that you could go across boundaries. So, um, and then, you know, as I'll document, the distribution of bank size as time went on has become extremely right skewed. And so the two questions we kind of want to ask in, in, this, uh, in this paper and in, and in more generally is how does uh, geographic diversification affect bank lending and financial stability across time? And then, um, you know, we kind of saw in the previous paper, um, in some sense there was a, 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 I would say like a little bit of a black box. There was a loan demand, but there wasn't loan supply in the monetary transmission mechanism. There was a perfectly competitive lender that priced assets, but it, just anything you want, you get at that price. And so this kind of starts to unpack the loan supply side instead of the loan demand side. So they're complementary. <laughs> uh, so I think it was really good to put the two papers together. Okay, so what am I gonna do today? So I'm gonna document some facts about the cross-sectional, this is about, <laughs> whenever I teach my heterogeneous agent class, all I do is start by showing uh, distributions. So here I'm gonna start with distributions. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a model. Um, it's, uh, I would say there are gonna be some equations. I'll, I'll walk you through in words the equations. It might be a little, I mean, Tom Sargent said things about being geeky. I can't help it, I'm a little geeky. Um, and then I'm gonna do two simple uh, applications. One is to think about regional spillovers, and then the other is to actually kind of start thinking about the bank lending channel. You should have in mind, I mean, there's a, there's a I think of uh, both the paper before and this paper or ap applications of corporate finance theory, whether you apply it to non-financial firms or financial firms, uh, that's the connection between the, the papers. Okay, so here's, here's uh, the first, this is kind of probably the most important figure from the standpoint of, of the title of the paper. So, um, whoa, this is, so down here is, uh, I was visiting the, new, the Minneapolis Fed uh, right before COVID, and I always went to Ellen's class. Ellen taught their students to always like point at the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. So I'll do, I'm gonna do that. So down on the, uh, I learned a lot while I was there. So uh, the horizontal axis is just years. Whoops, I didn't know, I didn't learn how to do this though. Wow. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay, maybe I shouldn't even use this. So, uh, so on, on, the horiz on the vertical axis is uh, the number of states with uh, active branches, okay? So what we did here is um, the top 35 banks sometimes get called uh, the systemically important banks. So we broke up the top 35 banks into two sets. One are gonna be the top four banks. The other is top five to 35. And the top, top four are the blue. The top uh, five to 35 are the red. The top 36 to 2% of the banks is yellow. And then the rest of the banks are in purple. And so the, f the first graph is just literally saying, you can see, this is 1994. Oh, Jesus. Uh, this is 1994. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna point. So here, 1994 um, is when Regal Neal happened, okay? And, uh, and what you see is just, as time goes on, you see this would be a perfect application of Tom Holmes has a paper about, about Walmart and geographic expansion of Walmart. We, we don't have that, this is a, a version of that. But you see the big banks, you know, getting up to you know, the top four, this is an average across the four top four. They're, Chase, uh, Citi, um, uh, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. That's the top four. Um, and, and you see there, uh, on average, they're in 40 different states, okay? And then, you know, there's a big difference, and, and you'll see it when I show you these other graphs, 
which is how they grew, there is actually a pretty big difference between the top five to 35. This is aggregated at the, uh, at the bank holding company level. What we constructed in the bottom graph is again across year, but uh, along this dimension is something that we'll call the diversification index. And it really kind of measures the market share, like how many banks, how many states you're in, as well as how deep you're in those states. So if you have a very small um, presence in another state, it's going to be a, a large number, okay? And the more presence you have in other states and the more, uh, you know, you have going on in each of the states, it becomes a very small number. And again, here you can see that, uh, that there's been a, uh, you know, the, there's been a huge amount of diversification on the part of, of these top four banks. Okay, this is just a, a, a graph of, uh, again, it's, it's year. On the, uh, on the vertical axis on the, on the left-hand side are the number of banks, and uh, the red line is just the number of banks, okay? Um, and you see that the number of banks uh, fell from here. We started in 1984. That's the first, we, we're using call report data. That's the first, uh, that's the best data for, the, we can get that's, that's publicly available. Um, and it, it, the best data starts in 1984 from the call report data. So you see that the, uh, the number of banks has just fallen tremendously. Okay? At the same time, the t this is on the left-hand axis is the uh, top four deposit share. We're gonna be, I'm, I'm talking about this all in terms of deposit shares, but it's the same with loans and assets, and there's a reason why I'm focusing on deposit shares. The other data is really the good geographic data is at the, at the deposit level. The FDIC has that, and we can, we can use that. Uh, what you see is um, up until, so here's 1994. So Regal, you know, kind of during Regal Neal, the top four deposit share was, um, you know, let's say 15%. After Regal Neal, uh, you see a transition. And then uh, starting in about 2008, you see a leveling off again, okay? So one of the ways that we're gonna think about doing the modeling is uh, think about kind of like a stochastic steady state here and a stochastic steady state there and a transition in between those two steady states. The transition comes because regulation changed. So you know, one way to think about this is we're gonna have a ladder model you know, like these are used in I.O. a lot. So you kind of invest to get to a higher rung of a ladder, okay? And that's what's gonna be happening along this transition path, um, okay? This is that picture, I mean, you can't see this well. What we did was we took um, in, in real dollars, uh, basically we, we have, we just ranked uh, the top 35 banks in terms of deposits and, uh, and you know, this is at the sort of the midpoint of those two transition or those two stochastic steady states that we were kind of thinking about. This is uh, in 1989. Here's the distribution in terms of, of uh, the bank size, you know, distribution according to deposits. And then, you know, if, if, if it worked well on my, uh, on my website, there's like an animated slide that's kind of like Tom Holmes's stuff you know, you see this huge branching, um, you know, kind of uh, the top, these are the top four banks I was saying before, Chase, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citibank. So they're just separating um, tremendously. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of uh, firm dynamics models. They focus on, uh, they kind of say, uh, the, the firm, let's say non-financial firms, are very well approximated by power law distribution. The power law distribution is the um, sort of the dashed um, uh, yellow line. That's what uh, you know would be uh, the case for for if the bank size distribution followed uh, what's called Ziff's law. Uh, and and you can see so on the left hand side is 1980 plotting the actual. Uh, deposits in millions of dollars on a log scale. 
that's on the left-hand side, and you see that the green, you know, in some sense, the biggest banks are down here, and you see that the distribution is below what's predicted by uh, Zipf's law. And then you see, I mean, unsurprisingly, you see that the, the right tail, which is basically what's a, that up <laughs> there, um, uh, it, it's just growing very, very strongly. Okay, so, uh, and then, and then uh, one measure um, that e even the, the antitrust department at the, in the U.S., they use things like Herfindahl indices to understand whether a uh, market is very, very concentrated. <clears throat> and um, so the, the one that, since everything we've been talking about, the red is, is the national Herfindahl, but the blue is really the one you kind of want to think about. And you see, you know, through time, uh, starting in, here's again, Regal Neal, um, you see a run-up in, uh, in Herfindahl's at the state level. So, you know, uh, concentration in Herfindahl's are not perfect measures of lack of competition or anything, but this is somewhat suggestive. And so this kind of stuff is also going to uh, motivate us to um, kind of write down a model that has elements of, of uh, imperfect competition in it. So then, you know, kind of motivated by that, <laughs> um, we're gonna, we, what we did was, this is gonna be a, there's gonna be, in, in some sense, um, one of the four, in, in uh, heterogeneous agent models for households, you know, if you, um, you, typical ways we do things, we feed in a stochastic process for income, and we think about what happens in terms of savings and stuff like that. Here we're gonna feed in a stochastic process for deposits and think about what happens to bank lending and things like that as a consequence of the, because the deposits are like a cheap form. Because of deposit insurance, a very cheap form of external funding, okay? So what we did was, remember, I, there, we're kind of thinking about two uh, stochastic steady states. So um, prior in 1984 to 93, we estimated, you know, just Ariano Bond uh, AR panel uh, model. And the only thing, I don't want you to take, uh, you know, there's only one set of, pic one set of numbers I want to kind of focus on, and, and they're here. So, um, so we, you know, in, consistent with how we were thinking about the model, prior to Regal Neal, everybody was in the same state. Um, so that's why we just put all the banks in the same state. I mean, we took the bank, what I mean by in the same state, any bank was restricted to their state. We estimate the deposit process for those banks. And then in this size, side, we actually allow, I mean, it's just to kind of give you an idea and, you know, the mapping between the model and the data, we, we then go to the latter pe period, run the same AR panel uh, regressions, and then, you know, figure out what's happening to uh, the mean, which you can see, and we normalized all these, but you, see, you can see that, you know, big banks have a much larger, and these are in, um, in logs and stuff, of a much larger mean set funding inflow. But the important thing is to kind of see, in terms of diversification, how the, the variance of the deposit inflows has dropped, um, has dropped a lot. And the other thing is looking at it, you know, the bigger banks have a lot smaller variance of their deposit inflows, okay? So, you know, in, a, in the paper, uh, that we have in another paper where we kind of look at capital buffers and capital requirements, that's kind of an important way to get bigger banks. If you look at the data, bigger banks have lower uh, capital buffers than smaller banks on average. But that's just like kind of using Iagari ideas, right? If you have a large amount of variation, you're gonna save a lot. And that's, that's how the model can generate that endogenously. So this is one, you know, here's a part of diversification that comes with being big. This is, uh, for the next few ones, because I don't want to run out of time, um, it just kind of is documenting, here are loan returns 
that are less uh, variable for, um, for big banks. Here are interest margins that are also less variable for big banks. Um, the average, the actual, av you know, like average interest margin is not all that different between the different banks. In the other paper we have markup, you can show markups are actually bigger for bigger banks. Um, and, and that's something, you know, given that there's been this big revolution of thinking about markups uh, after ECOUT and DeLocker's paper, uh, this, we're trying to kind of, there's some sense in which we're trying to do some of that for the banking industry. Uh, this is just charge off rates. So, you know, when, uh, when uh, loans fail, they get charged off. S bigger banks have less variability in that. So, you know, all these things are kind of, uh, kind of pointing to something like there being um, uh, a, a gain to diversification. And then finally, uh, the only, I guess, the, the point I want to bring out in this, uh, so these are, are bank costs. You have to estimate like a translog cost function, et cetera, um, to kind of get at this. But, but the point just to take out of this is that uh, average costs are decreasing in size. So that's a, that is a, um, you know, a suggestion for um, increasing returns to scale. We're not the first, Loretta Mester and, and co-authors have found increasing returns to scale uh, as well, but this is just, in our data set, we just wanted to think about that. Now, in, um, in my mind, Doug Diamond could have won for many different papers. So he has a paper uh, called Delegated Monitoring. Uh, in that model, it's efficient because there are in, uh, there's basically fixed costs. It's efficient for banks to do, to be delegated monitors on loans. And it's actually a, 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 mo a model which suggests that, you know, banks should be very big <laughs> to economize on those costs. And then the delegated monitoring is that, uh, that you have to get the right bank uh, contract in order to satisfy the incentive problems that banks might have. But anyway, that, that paper is all about increasing returns and diversification, and we're gonna have a sense of that in this paper. Okay, and then the final thing that, uh, that we're gonna kind of have in the model is, uh, so in the black is, um, is uh, just detrended GDP. The other graphs, the, the red graph is just exit rates. But banks can exit for two reasons, one through merger and one through uh, failure. And so what you can see here is that here's, again, like here's 1994, you start to see a big run up in exit by merger. So as, as banks you know, cross state lines, they're, they're starting to buy up other banks. So you get lots of mergers, that's uh, exit by merger. That turns out exit by merger uh, is, is pro-cyclical, as you might, uh, you might think. And then here's, you know, here's the 2008 crisis, uh, here's the downturn in GDP, here's the upturn in bank failures. Okay, so, uh, and then when you, you know, just get a very simple correlation between uh, GDP and failure, you know, it's, it's uh, counter-cyclical, okay? So this is the data, so th let me just kind of summarize the data. Um, so following Regal O'Neill, there's a rapid geographic expansion in big banks, uh, deposit base translating to substantial industry concentration and larger Herfindals at the state level. Uh, with geographic expansion came geographic diversifications. Uh, banks branching out nationally enjoy lower variance of deposits, loan returns, interest margins, and charge off rates than their smaller competitors. Uh, there were actually not sizable differences in average interest margins across bank size. That kind of suggests that a, a good way to model the imperfect competition is Cournot competition. Uh, there's evidence for increasing returns, and, the, and, and we saw countercyclical bank exit and procyclical mergers. So there's, uh, in some sense, you could think of the uh, procyclical mergers as banks investing to grow uh, as, as there's an upturn. I guess one of the reasons I wanted to focus on this to some degree, we're gonna have um, several different stochastic processes for the, for the model, and one of the, which is aggregate, um, aggregate shocks. 
Okay, so now how do I map, how, how do we think about mapping the data to the model? So we're gonna have a, a in some sense, a delegated monitoring model, like in Diamond. Um, we're, we're gonna model the banking industry, the loan market, as being um, uh, imperfectly competitive. Uh, the way we're gonna, we're gonna model uh, the growth is um, think that like kind of Regal Neal basically lowered the cost of geographic expansion. So they're gonna just invest in order to grow and they're gonna be able to, to when you invest um, and move to, different, um, move to different like types. So we'll think of there being state banks, regional banks and national banks as you grow um, you get that Markov process that I was showing before. So when you go from a, a small state bank to a regional bank, you start getting a different deposit shock process and things like that, different cost processes, et cetera. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, we are going to have the banks can issue, um, uh, whether you want to think of it as a, a, a you know, seasoned equity um, or uh, that they have uh, non-deposit external funding. Um, it's gonna be the case as in standard corporate finance models. I, I, it's kind of a little bit along the lines of what Andres had, um, that they bear lower costs. Okay, and then banks are gonna Corneau compete in the loan market uh, subject to deposit capacity constraints. And then another thing that I think is very important, at least in the United States, there's been a, a big rise in the, um, in the shadow banking sector. So uh, we have, a, you know, the model has that uh, borrowers are gonna make a, dis, uh, a choice between uh, commercial banks and shadow, I'm calling them, the paper says non-banks, think of shadow banks, whatever you wanna, sounds better to say shadow banks, I don't know. Um, and then there's gonna be endogenous bank exit and entry, and, and then that's gonna allow us to kind of focus on how, um, uh, you know, both monetary policy and regulatory policies can affect the bank size distribution. Okay, so here's the basics of the model. Uh, the economy is segmented into two regions, um, and you know, what the regions are, are, we're not gonna just think of it as, you could segment it into three regions, whatever you want to apply you know, the methodology. But just to keep it simple, it's gonna be two regions. There are gonna be a lot of uh, identical entrepreneurs who borrow to operate a risky project. They're gonna be the ones that wanna make you know, loan demand, that are gonna demand loans. There's gonna be a risk uh, neutral representative household. They're gonna be supplying deposits and supplying uh, equity to the, um, to the banks. Um, we're gonna have a, a world where, um, you know, uh, um, the exit decisions on the part of borrowers in Andres' paper, you know, that's a, an endogenous uh, uh, process, and, and we're gonna have a sense of that happening here. There's gonna be a um, sort of a selection problem that we wanted to account for that, that we're able to do that uh, this way. There are gonna be three different possible types of banks, national, regional, and state. They're gonna receive uh, persistent idiosyncratic inflows of deposits, and they're gonna compete in these uh, loan markets. Um, they can expand their base by investing at a cost from internal funds or, or costly seasoned equity. And um, there's gonna be aggregate regional and idiosyncratic shocks, and that's gonna generate, uh, along with policy, um, you know, this endogenous size distribution of banks. Okay, I just wanna kinda, this is a lot on one slide, but I, I, I think it's good to kinda say, what is stochastic in the model? So there's aggregate uncertainty. It's gonna be a, there's gonna be a Markov process that we match to the uh, business cycle, um, you know, standard business cycle stuff. There's gonna be these region specific shocks. We take them as IID over time um, but uh, uh, they, you know, that's to keep the model simple. They can be correlated across uh, regions. You just don't want perfect correlation or else they're just an aggregate shock. Um, and then what I was saying about the, the kind of um, risk-taking process, so when 
Um, so in a given state, uh, which uh, you know a, a, um, a lender or borrower, I'm sorry, is going to take an action of how much um, how much they want to um, uh, run uh, the scale of their project. So they take a loan and they decide, you know, how how risky a project do I want to invest in? This is to get a risk return trade off. It's a very simple way. You know, I just have to say, again, this is kind of from uh, corporate finance guys, Al uh, Franklin Allen and Douglas Gale. They have a very simple way of doing this, and, and we're just borrowing that part from them. Um, and, and all I, the only reason, so the, you know, the different exogenous shocks, these exogenous shocks, uh, I guess I could point to them. These exogenous shocks affect uh, um, profitability or the likelihood of success but also this endogenous choice, and that, that's what gets the, the success probabilities actually endogenous. This is what I was saying before, that we wanted to introduce a, um, uh, both you know, the ability to borrow from banks and from shadow banks. It's just gonna follow a very simple discrete choice problem as people do in the IO literature. And then we have these uh, funding shocks. That was the table one I showed you before. Okay, so let me be a little bit more specific about the loan demand problem. So, um, so depending on what type of uh, borrower you're ch you uh, face, there's some, you know, you get a payoff of uh, this top part uh, with some probability P, um, and then if the project fails with probability one minus P, there's a charge off associated with that. Um, and the, the risk return trade-off is just, if I choose something that I'm gonna get a higher return, so RK is higher, that gives me a higher return, but it means that the success probability is gonna fall, okay? Um, and the, the charge-offs that we think about are just gonna be a, a IID across borrowers and time. Um, you, gotta, you have to get a demand curve. <laughs> so one way to get a demand, uh, loan demand curve is to have the borrowers have an outside option. So we just let there be some kind of an outside option. It's, it's uh, unobservable so that you don't have price discrimination along the demand curve. Um, uh, and, and also, to motivate, in some sense, uh, the monitoring costs, uh, both the project success and the scale are gonna be private information. So, you know, since, uh, no payoff is in the, the possibilities, uh, everybody would always claim to have failed unless you monitor them. That's in uh, Diamond and Bernanke and Gertler. Um, so, you know, what happens, entrepreneurs are gonna decide whether to fund the project, and if so, who to borrow from, and, uh, and the type of risky project that they're gonna take. Okay, so what are banks? Banks are gonna be three possible types of banks. Um, they, uh, you know, uh, these state and regional banks only uh, operate in one region. The national banks can uh, operate across both regions. Um, they get the, um, you know, depending upon your size or your type, uh, bigger national banks get, have a higher inflow of these, uh, you know, insured low cost funds than small banks. They also have less variability in it. That's what's consistent with table one. And then uh, a bank can invest uh, to become larger. So uh, depending upon your, your current type and how much you invest, you have a probability of becoming larger. That's like in quality ladder models. Okay, so here's, I, I, I promise I'll talk you through, the, through this. Don't worry about the uh, notation. This is just the, um, the profits at the end of the period for a bank. So with probability P, they, uh, the project succeeds, they get paid back the loan return. With probability one minus P, the project fails and they lose the, the charge off on the project. They have to pay monitoring costs. And then uh, depending upon, so we let banks be able to uh, save, you know, in a risk, in a sort of a risk-free asset like securities, or we let them borrow, think of this as like the Fed funds rate. Okay, so if they don't have enough deposits, 
they can increase, uh, they can get more external funding, but it's gonna be at a higher cost. So they don't want to borrow at the Fed funds rate. This is higher than the deposit rate. And then uh, they pay interest on their deposits and they bear fixed costs associated with this, you know, that's, I, sh I didn't show you the fixed costs, but they vary across uh, uh, type as well. There's a you know, simple balance sheet <laughs> in some sense. Deposits are gonna be equal to the loans you make and any securities or Fed funds that uh, you borrow. The big bank gets to uh, sum their loans over both, uh, both regions. And then there's, uh, you know, what this is gonna generate is a cross-sectional distribution of banks. <clears throat> so here's, you know, in just solving for the loan supply problem, so as I was saying, uh, Andres' paper is about loan demand, this is about loan supply. So all, I mean, banks are trying to maximize their expected uh, profitability by choosing loans. The, the thing that's different here than in a model with perfect competition is that um, you know, all banks are gonna have some degree of market power, so it's gonna internalize its impact on loan supply. <laughs> so here's, I, this, I thought about this last night. This could be wrong. I mean, the, the, the equation's not wrong, but the interpretation might not be. But you know, all the Hank stuff got me really excited so here's my, here's my attempt. I, I'm calling this marginal propensity to lend, okay? So this is like the marginal propensity to lend out of uh, deposits, okay? So uh, this is just a, I mean, I, and this is the sense in which it may, the mapping may not be perfect. But if you take the first order condition with respect to loans, so w what are you getting? This is basically the return you get on loans. You're, you're not gonna be in if you always have negative returns. Right? So these, these are the returns to making loans. You get, with, you know, with success, you get the return on it. You, uh, if, you, if there's failure on the project, you lose uh, the charge off and you have to pay to monitor. So that's kind of that's standard. But what's different is the thing in red, okay? And, uh, and down below in red. So, so this is, um, this is kind of taking into account, the important thing here is to think that the, a bank is internalizing its effect on interest rates. So, you know, just as in standard imperfect competition models, if, they, if a bank makes more loans, it's gonna have an impact and lower the interest rate. So this is a term that's negative, okay? This, uh, you know, so bank size matters. So that's, that's a sense in which an MPL, there's gonna be a distribution of these so we should, we sh I'm gonna, when I go back, I'm gonna start to plot these things in some sense. Um, and, and, and this is just uh, the fact that banks are internalizing that if they in increase interest rates too much, there's gonna be selection of bad borrowers to their bank, okay? And that's, that's why it comes in negative, okay? If they borrow, so um, you can think of there being a multiplier the, the, uh, the fact that there's constraints um, on, on um, you know, how much they can get of insured debt, if they wanna over uh, get more external funding, they have to pay for it. So it's almost like a little uh, shadow cost multiplier, okay? So I'll talk to anybody who wants to talk about, but I think this is, this is the bank version of MPCs. Okay, and it's type dependent. Um, all right, so banks, uh, given that I have thir seven minutes, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. All this is saying is that uh, if I wanna grow, I can invest. It depends upon you know, uh, what my profits are right now. This is very similar to what Andres had. You know, I can, uh, if I don't have enough uh, funds from profits today, to match my uh, investment, I'm gonna have to issue seasoned equity. And seasoned equity, there's a cost to seasoned equity, so it's harder for small firms or small banks to grow. That's, that's also consistent with the data, you'll, you'll see. Um, okay, and then uh, banks pay dividends um, net of, of uh, these injections, and banks are trying to maximize the present discounted value of future dividends. 
Uh, there is an exit choice um, if if they're um, you know making negative profits and they expect to be making negative profits, just as in kind of Hoppenheim models, they'll they'll exit. Okay, uh, I'll just say uh, you know if we have bank exit, we also have to allow bank entry. We have bank entry. Um, the timing, I'm going to just. Banks make their uh, supply loans at the beginning of the period. Entrepreneurs, you know, demand loans at the beginning of the period. Uh, the intersection of loan demand and supply is going to determine the loan market interest rate, as in, you know, any kind of standard model. And then at the end of the uh, period, all these shocks happen, determining profitability of banks, and then the choices that banks make about whether to grow or exit happen. This is geeky. When I said this is the geeky part, this is just a transition function for, um, for the cross-sectional distribution. But because this is a, a, a conference on uh, heterogeneity, this is the transition function. And, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is, you know, exit decisions are here, investment decisions are here, uh, and entry is here. So that, that's generating this endogenous distribution of banks. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this. I'll just say we're solving for a Markov perfect uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, so, you know, given that we're using uh, call report data, a model period is one year. Um, and uh, we solve, you know, there's, uh, we solve this model and I, am, I would love to talk to all, you know, Adrian, all you guys that have um, really interesting ways to solve these models. We're using something that IO, the I.O. framework kind of uses to solve these models. And, but there's elements of which uh, that this is very much like a crusell smith method. Okay, and, uh, and then, you know, we're in the process of calibrating the model. We haven't, we haven't uh, done that perfectly yet. So here are, the, here are the two experiments in the last four minutes, just to give you how, you know, an idea of how this model works. So, um, so what we're going to do in this first experiment, remember, we have these national banks. We have very big banks. And so what we're going to think about is what happens if there's a, a, a recession or a bad time in one region? Does that spill over nationally? Okay, and, and you know, you can kind of think about this in, in many, as whatever you define a region to be, uh, you know, it's up to you. But do you get regional spillovers, even though there's no change in uh, productivity in one region, does the recession spill over to the other region? So how we do that is we just take an aggregate shock, it's kept constant at its mean. Um, the regional shock in, in one region is kept high. The regional shock in the other region is high for the initial five periods, and then we decrease it uh, to the lowest uh, productivity for three periods, and then let, just let it go according to its stochastic process. So the only thing that we're doing here is changing, is having, kind of having a recession in uh, the east, okay? Um, and then this is, this is the result, so hopefully I'll get this thing to work. Um, so this is the, the west region and the aggregate shock, you know, has just kept constant, but um, the east region has a downturn, oops, <laughs> in the shocks for three periods, and then we just let, let it go. And so what, what do you see? Because you know, it was, a, it was a good shocks, you saw that lending rises, um, and, and it rises in both, you know, this is, the shocks are good in, in both cases, but then you get this uh, downturn, and you see, I mean, the important point here is that the downturn's in the east. So uh, you see a, a decrease in lending in the East, as you would expect. But you also, because of the national bank, and it's got to deal with the fact that it's facing a downturn in the East, it lowers its uh, lending in the West. Okay, so it's, um, and any time you lower lending, interest rates are going to be rising in both regions, even though there was an, an idiosyncratic shock in, the, in, the, um, uh, in one region. And you see the impact on, you know, here's the, here's in some sense the recession in the east <laughs> is in blue, but you see the recession spilling over to the west in, uh, in the red, 
and and you know uh, the recession has an impact on on exit rates. Um, these are the smaller banks uh, exiting in the the east, not in the west. Okay, that's just what I said here. Okay, so then the final in my last minute, let me just say something about the bank lending channel. So you know, um, I, I really like this Kashup and Stein paper. Uh, Kashup and Stein, uh, what they said was. Because big banks have more access to external funds, um, that when there's an interest rate, you know, the Fed funds rise. I mean, this is, again, somewhat, uh, it's a corporate finance version of what Andres was saying. They can, they can weather, they can get external funding that smaller banks can't. So they have a paper, what do several million observations tell us about the bank lending channel? in the AER, and, and the idea is just, if I can get external funding, I will, um, I, my, I will not be as, um, as uh, exposed to this uh, interest rate rise, okay? It's not, I'm gonna be less sensitive. And so we just run this experiment uh, of changing the uh, interest rate for a certain number of periods, and, and this is, uh, since I'm about to be done, uh, this is the result. So I, I only want to kind of bring up two things. Um, one is, you know, just uh, here, the fact that uh, lending is going down in both cases, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of clear. You know, that's what we think should happen with uh, an increase in Fed funds rates. Um, there's, th this is kind of showing that, uh, that there's a switch from the banking, you know, this is something we kind of have to think about how um, when there are changes that, uh, like from the monetary policy can generate that there's uh, a movement to um, a substitution into non-bank lending, right? So banks, uh, borrowers start to move over because there are higher interest rates that banks are charging, they move over to the shadow bank sector. The part about um, and I'll, this, I'll just end, I won't even do my uh, conclusion. If you, if you look at the, um, the ordering here of loans, uh, the small banks have the biggest impact and relative to the big banks. So that's exactly the cash up Stein kind of result. Okay, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, this is the uh, conclusion, so I should go over here. Very interesting paper, good compliment to the paper presented by Andres before. And so we're gonna hear some comments now by, from David Moreno, your discussant. Uh, David is a senior economist at the Financial Research Department of the Central Bank of Chile. He obtained uh, his PhD in economics at the University of Maryland in 2016. His research just focuses on international finance, macroeconomic computational economics, and David has published in leading journals such as the Journal of International Economics and Journal of International Money and Finance. David, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I'm trying to set up the slides. Um, okay, Control F, I think. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, yeah, actually the, the first time I saw this type of models was a presentation by Pablo of, uh, of the paper with Dean uh, that's now in Econometrica. And um, I really want to extol the importance of, of this model because basically what Dean and Pablo have done is they have consolidated the literature in the banking industry and transformed uh, all these elements that were scattered around uh, theoretical models and empirical models, and come up with a quantitative framework, which, is, which has uh, lots of applications and uh, would help uh, the policy setting answer many questions. For example, they have already answered uh, 
for example, what would be the effects of uh, Basel III capital regulations, uh, the Regul Neal Act, uh, in the paper that uh, has uh, presented now, and the stability competition trade-off. So having said this, um, okay, the, the present paper is trying to approach the, what are the effects of geographic diversification on the bank lending channel of monetary policy, and vice versa, probably. And uh, what we really know now is that bank distribution matters. Uh, we know, Cash and Stein, that the behavior of smaller banks is different from large banks. And this is going to uh, change during the cycle along risk taking. And also, could be some small changes around market structure during the cycle. So, the question is what happens uh, when the banks are allowed to expand across regions? Um, to make the discussion a bit shorter so you can ask your questions, uh, I'm going to skip uh, the overview of the model and I'm going to comment on the, on the main results by Dean. Uh, actually, I, I found it quite puzzling. I, I know uh, he's in the process of, uh, of uh, trying to explain why this is the result for now. Um, but I, I, I was thinking, okay, why does this happen um, even though the, there are much larger banks now? I mean, that would make the, the, the banks less sensitive to monetary policy. But I, I started reading a Kobe and Levine a paper of to, uh, 2018, and in there it is shown that competition increases sensitivity to monetary policy. So that begets the question, does diversification induce greater competition inside states, at least in the short term? Uh, because some banks might enter the other states and that's going to increase competition in our cannot environment, uh, to my knowledge. And the other question is, it may be that short-term effects might be different than long-term effects. Uh, for that, probably, they would have to analyze the, the transition between uh, the two interest rates. Um, the other question is that, could it be as asymmetrical as well? Sorry for the typos. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that, for example, during expansion, one may have a higher uh, interest rate margin, so that it's going to increase bank entry, probably increase competition and increase sensitivity. And on the other hand, contraction may lead to bank exit, lower the competition, and reduce sensitivity. I think this was a discussion that was held uh, during the last uh, global financial crisis. Um, just giving my thoughts here, because um, I was really disconcerted by the results. Um, and the only technical comment I'm going to make on this paper is, um, is the way the monetary policy contraction is, contraction is modeled. Uh, because basically, I, I, I think you are increasing only the interest rate when you have external funding liabilities, but not for all the, the values of A. So I don't know if that might make a difference. Uh, you know, something to bear in mind, probably, for the calibration. And a, a topic that I didn't put in the slides, but actually I came up with those thoughts now, is that uh, perhaps there could be, a, I'm guessing, is it possible to sort of separate the effects, for example, keeping a parametrization constant, and then uh, see what happens with geographical uh, diversification, and then go the other step, uh, changing the parameterization, and maybe that's going to, uh, that's going to help clarifying the, the results. But um, I'm really looking forward to see the results um, on monetary policy, and even more so, uh, given that you are thinking about this, uh, this decision of banks are going into other states, why not thinking about going into other countries? And, say what are the implications for, for domestic monetary policy or uh, international macro macroeconomic policy implications, and not only macroeconomic policy, even uh, financial policy across borders. So I'm going to end up here and leave the floor open for some questions if there is time. Two questions from the audience, uh, because uh, you raised a lot of interesting issues on international organization, competition, and I know there's a lot of people here interested in those issues. Uh, please go ahead. Hey, I, I thought this was a super fascinating paper. So I have uh, kind of three questions. So one is, uh, is it the case that uh, financial cycles have become 
uh, less correlated uh, regionally uh, over time now that, that the banks uh, no longer have to lend out of local deposits? Is it kind of a fact, something that you observe in the data, which I think is an implication of the model? Um, a, a, another qu a question I have more like uh, thoughts that you have, this is an industry equilibrium model. So if you were to go to a, a general equilibrium uh, model, thinking about implications for monetar monetary policy, say, what you see uh, is the big challenges that, that you face. And, and in particular, it sounded like the deposit demand here was, was exogenous. And so, so how would you think about making this endogenous? And then a final thing on MPL, I think that's kind of a great way of, of framing the economics of the model um, and, and maybe super useful for interpretation. There is a paper by Johannes Strobel and some co-authors in the QJE uh, that have used this idea too. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the marginal propensity to lend to different types of borrowers and they, they estimate that or measure that and then they, they see how that correlates to the, with the marginal propensity to borrow from these borrowers. So are they actually willing to... Uh, 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 how, how well it correlated is the MPL and the MPB, which is a paper you might be interested in. Do you want to go with uh, comments from David? Please go ahead, Marco. I know I have one of the, one of the same questions as, as Adrienne, which is like, there, was, there is this, this literature right, by Strobel and, 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 and co-authors emphasizing uh, competition for deposits. Uh, but in your model, deposits are exogenous. You know, is there a reason why you think that's not important? Uh, is it too complicated? Why, why these models don't have that? Thank you. Should I go? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, first, uh, Thanks so much. Uh, I, I kept on sending him, like last night, I was probably sending him the paper and stuff. Not at three o'clock in the morning, though. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, I, I think one of the things that we didn't, I didn't have enough time to do is uh, thinking a lot about the decompositions that would be good to do, because there, there are, were multiple things. Everything that were in the different tables um, you know, we fed into the model. So in, in kind of contrasting pre-regal Neil to post, there's really a lot of decompositions that should be done, but that would have been done at three o'clock in the morning and, and I didn't, we didn't get them done. The idea, of, I mean, th this is just a f general framework of kind of thinking about what a region is. So, you know, things can be applied to cross countries and stuff like that. Um, uh, there's actually, we have something in the IMF economic review about thinking about stuff across countries. There's a very different model than this, but, um, but you can do that. On the financial cycles, Adrian, I don't, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that per se. Um, let, let me say a few things uh, about data that, that comes from the Jackson Hole conference. So, um, so Ross um, uh, is, is a great <laughs> empirical guy. So he, um, so uh, we applied, and, and this actually goes to Marco's question to some degree. Uh, there's two different, uh, we decided as a macroeconomist, thinking about um, the crisis in 2008, I was focused on bank lending. What is gonna be the impact on bank lending of the crisis? And so we, when we were looking at data, we were kind of thinking the, the loan market doesn't appear to be perfectly, um, uh, competitive. That's why we put the, the imperfect competition in the loan market. The paper with uh, Ross uh, for Jackson Hole was we had the, um, the imperfect competition on the deposit side. So you can do both. And, and actually, Tony uh, Whitehead has a paper where they do uh, both sides. Um, so that's, uh, you know, we, we wanted to keep focusing. It's a, it's a lot simpler paper in many ways than what we're doing. So we wanted to incorporate things that's not in theirs, but um, I love the idea of doing uh, these MPLs uh, at the at the borrower level. This is what uh, you know, Andres. Is, so call report data does not have a, a, enough degree of um, of you know loan uh, b borrower level loan statistics and. University of Wisconsin is too cheap to buy that kind of stuff. 
that was a joke. I don't want anyone, don't say to any of my colleagues that we, but, um, but yeah, we don't have that same uh, kind of data, so we can't do that. But we could obviously, you know, it would be useful. We could somehow maybe aggregate their stuff up to NPLs. That would be, that's a great, I need to find that paper. Um, you know, one thing I didn't show you, um, you know, given that we have endogenous exit, um, I mean, the, the model is supposed to be, you know, kind of taking into account what are the costs of um, different policies. So, uh, you know, we have endogenous bank exit here, but there is uh, FDIC, um, you know, there's a, a deposit insurance. So you can actually kind of use the model to say, what are the implications for, um, you know, what taxes have to be paid associated with bank failure uh, relative to different types of policies, regulatory policies and monetary policies. You know, the, the, just to, the, the last thing about, um, you know, this was kind of thinking a little bit about uh, the monetary transmission mechanism, but, you know, in um, a very, the very simple way to think about some of this stuff, you know, that's, that's associated with the, the, that Jackson Hole paper is that, you know, if you have very small profit margins at the bank level and you have, you know, this moral hazard problem, um, they're going to start reaching for yield uh, the more competition there is. And so, um, what, uh, you know, and, and, and so you can actually kind of, there's a big literature on competition versus stability. It's typically a, a, an international literature. So uh, people tend to uh, regress things like um, uh, failures and, and stuff like that on concentration across countries. And the, the, the results are, because you don't have a lot of in some sense, good data on that. The results are kind of inconclusive which way it goes. The, the thing that, that Ross did that was, I thought, ingenious was he constructed pre-Regal Neal, I kind of said this a little bit, the certain states uh, before 1994 when it became national that you could branch, certain states opened up before that. So then he was able to kind of take data and say, I'm gonna have state and time level variation but the ingenious thing he did was also kind of take, um, uh, like, d he used a um, gravity model from, like, international trade to say how far away is, you know, the um, bank that is going into the next state, how far away were they? And so that generated both time, state, and bank level variation that generated enough data variation to kind of think about this competition stability stuff uh, very carefully. And so when in, in that Jackson Hole paper, you know, we kind of regressed, um, uh, you know, measures of bank stability, like the variance of stock returns and things like that, both on, you know, even on things like monetary policy shocks, Fed fund shocks. And because if, if Fed fund shocks start uh, dampening profitability of banks, then it raises the, the there, it does lead to more instability. So it's just something to kind of think a little bit about in terms of uh, how regulation and how monetary policy uh, acts through market structures. Um, so that's, and I'm out of time. Thank you very much. This, this was a very interesting paper. A very interesting discussion and a good way to finish the, the, the academic sessions. So Sofia confirms that now there's actually coffee waiting for us. So if anyone uh, end up with some questions they want to pose to to the end, you can approach them at, during the coffee break. Thank you. Lo siento, te hice correr.
use this distinguished panel that uh, will accompany us uh, today. Uh, we have uh, not only one, but two representatives of the FOMC. Uh, we have Jim Bullard. He is the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And as such, he participates in the Federal uh, Reserve's Federal uh, Open Market Committee, uh, which, as you all know, meets regularly to set the direction of monetary policy. He's a noted economist and policymaker. He has made Fed transparency and dialogue a priority on the international and national stage. And uh, he's also the co-editor of the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the National Institute of Economic Review, and a member of the Central Bank Research Association. Uh, he is a native of Forest Lake, Minnesota, and he received his doctorate in economics from Indiana University in Bloomington. We also have Esther George. Esther George is president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and leads a workforce of close to 2,000 employees in Kansas City and its branch offices in Omaha, Denver, and Oklahoma City. He is, uh, she is the regional representative on the FOMC in Washington, in Washington and uh, where she provides a perspective based on more than four decades of experience as a banking regulator. In 2022, President George serves as a voting member of the FOMC, and in addition, she holds the annual Jackson Hole Economic Policy Symposium in Wyoming, which brings together international central bankers, researchers, and policymakers to discuss issues affecting the global economy. And finally, we have uh, Claudio Borio. He, has, he is the head of the Monetary and Economic Department at the Bank of International Settlements since November 2013. 
He has been at the BIS since 1987, covering various responsibilities in the monetary and economic department. He has been the deputy head and director of research and statistics. He has also held the position of head of secretariat for the committee on the global financial system and the gold and foreign exchange committee. He has worked as an economist at the OECD and a lecturer and research fellow at Brazenose College, Oxford University. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy and a Master of Philosophy in Economics uh, and a BA in Politics, Philosophy and Economics from the same uh, university. So I'm very happy to, to have this, this very uh, nice panel here where they will uh, illuminate us on policy implications for, from the topics that we've been discussing over these two days. The idea is to have two rounds of interventions on topics related to heterogeneity. Uh, the first round is related to how heterogeneity uh, affects, in their view, in the view of the, of the members of the panel, the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, how this heterogeneity in the transmission mechanism is considered within the design of monetary policy, and how does it relate, if in any way, to also the mandates that central banks uh, may have. Uh, each of us will have uh, 10 minutes for the first round, and we will start in the same order. So, Jim, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks for having this lovely uh, conference. Uh, I'm learning a lot, and uh, 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 appreciated the opportunity to be here. I thought I'd use my time to talk about uh, this deck here um, about classic policy benchmarks for economies with substantial inequality. This is uh, part of a broader research agenda, which I'm going to summarize briefly here uh, with Ricardo De Cecchio, known under the rubric of monetary, optimal monetary policy for the masses. Um, so see, some slides are fake, see. So it's not actually 30. <laughs> so this is an academic talk uh, that I've presented uh, before in 2021. If you want to see more detail, and some of you techie people here are going to want more detail than what I'm going to give you here. But the Dow lecture in particular uh, has the most detail on it. And that's on my web page if you search for it. So. Um, uh, this conference is about the topic of uh, heterogeneity in macroeconomics, implications for monetary policy, and um, these remarks are going to give the idea that the uh, optimal monetary policy may not be uh, particularly affected by uh, the presence of heterogeneous households, and in particular that the central bank should still strive to achieve the uh, Wixellian natural real rate of interest, uh, just as in the standard New Keynesian model. So let's see if you believe my, uh, my argument here. Um, so we're going to have a heterogeneous agent economy. It's going to have three aggregate shocks uh, to total factor productivity growth, labor supply growth, and aggregate demand growth. So it's a growing economy and it grows stochastically according to these three shocks. Uh, there's going to be both permanent and temporary idiosyncratic risk at the household level. It's going to have uh, either an oversimplified, if you're unkind, or an ingenious uh, symmetric structure, if you're kind to me, uh, that is going to allow for uh, us to answer these questions uh, very clearly in this particular model, despite the presence of lots of aggregate uncertainty and idiosyncratic uncertainty. And they're going to be uh, income, wealth, and consumption equality on the same scale as in observed economies. And then we're going to allow four policymaking authorities in this economy, a monetary authority, a fiscal authority, a labor authority, and most controversially, and education authority. And we'll describe a competitive equilibrium for this system in which the four, the four policymakers, the four horsemen of this story, uh, co combine to achieve the first best allocation of resources. So what's interesting is that the policymaker roles are classic. Uh, the monetary authority uh, achieves the Wixellian natural real rate of interest. 
fiscal authority raises revenue via non-state contingent linear labor income tax on all households. Labor market authority runs an unemployment insurance program. And the education authority minimizes the variance of beginning of life or beginning of economic life, human capital endowments. So the main result is that uh, if the other guys, the other authorities are doing what they're supposed to do, then the uh, monetary authority can concentrate on uh, uh, its, its duties and, and what it's well suited to do. So I like this benchmark because uh, we can figure out what the benchmark is, and then you could put complications into this economy where uh, you know, knowing what the optimum is, and you could see how far you deviate from this optimum in other versions of this. So I'm proposing this as a sort of benchmark. <clears throat> so there are some surprising findings uh, in this. Uh, one is that it, you know, if you take this literally, it looks like most countries are trying to do all these things. So in broad, uh, in broad terms, uh, uh, they're similar to actual policies in place in many economies. Uh, the monetary authority, for instance, meets often and tries to react to current developments, current shocks in the economy. Uh, the fiscal authority uh, is not listed here. Um, uh, you know, will set taxes sort of for the long run, or at least the medium term and doesn't change them on a, on a um, let's say, monthly or quarterly basis. Um, <clears throat> here, the uh, linear labor income taxes will not distort uh, labor supply, so it's a Heckman-type uh, economy in that sense. And uh, the, best uh, the best policy contribution combination, sorry, will drive the consumption genie all the way to zero, but will leave income and financial wealth genie is substantially positive, something I don't think is uh, well understood uh, so because um, some of the observed income and financial wealth inequality is going to be due to life cycle effects alone, even in the social optimum. There are also asset rich and asset poor agents with high marginal propensities to consume, something that has been talked about at length at this conference, so I'll show you a picture of that uh, here. And finally, this has a pencil and paper solution, partly because uh, we chose assumptions to uh, get that result, um, but despite the aggregate shocks and the idiosyncratic risk, so that makes it a helpful benchmark as well. So uh, I'm just gonna use uh, uh, the model in one slide, but it is a life cycle economy and it has these special uh, symmetry assumptions. Those can be relaxed uh, in more uh, other papers that we're writing in this family. Um, we don't use the symmetry assumptions anymore, but uh, for this talk, it's gonna be very helpful. This is overlapping generations. You have a cohort of uh, agents that are coming into economic life at age 20. They're living for 241 quarters until they leave the model at age 80. So I think the spirit of it is that these are the people we're going to track. And if we track these people, we'll have a good idea about how the macroeconomy works. It's not that there aren't other people, but uh, these are the ones we're going to track. Um, critically, as agents enter the model, they're randomly assigned a life cycle productivity profile. They have to use that particular profile for their entire, uh, their entire life. Um, we view that as a proxy for human capital developments that take place before age 20. So there's some unmodeled schooling system, parenting, working, all the things that you would learn up to age 20. Uh, that's not in the model, but we're proxying that by this random process. So you have this one shock uh, at the beginning of your life. It's very determinative of your entire life related to Hun Hug Adventure and your own who said that you could predict 63% uh, of lifetime earnings with a vector of characteristics on people at age 23. Well, I'm gonna talk at length about that. Uh, so uh, in this version, we're gonna use this particular uh, productivity, baseline productivity profile here. It's not very special. Uh, other versions, we have more calibrated cases. But for this discussion, 
you don't, you're not, you're relatively unproductive in the first part of life, or first part of economic life and the last part of economic life, and you have your peak earning years in the middle of the life cycle, and that's what this is uh, going to say. And you're about 50% more productive, according to this one, in the middle. And then uh, you get this random shock when you enter uh, the model and you either scale this up or scale this down. We used a uniform distribution here. So you get this uh, idea that there are some very productive people uh, at the peak here and there are uh, other people that are close to, the, uh, close to zero here. They're less productive, but the shape of their uh, productivity profile is the same uh, for uh, all of these households. So um, some people do well in this lottery, some people do poorly uh, in this lottery. And then um, you can supply your uh, labor, uh, your productivity endowments um, in a labor market competitively by supplying hours. Um, and you can be unemployed, randomly unemployed. It's going to be a IID process that's unrelated to the aggregate shocks. Uh, you can't earn any income in that, in that period if you show up for work and there's no work that day. And then there's a friction in the model uh, that motivates monetary policy. The friction is non-state contingent nominal contracting. This means that we sign, when we borrow and lend, we just uh, lend a nominal amount at a nominal interest, a stated nominal interest rate. There's no default or anything like that. Um, uh, this, the monetary authority is going to be able to fix this friction by converting the non-state contingent nominal contracts into real state contingent contracts, which are optimal under the homothetic preferences that we have here. And then there are these four policymakers, so I'm not going to tell you any more about the model. Uh, there's technology and other factors here. There's just the one asset in this version, so it's just the, uh, the middle-aged people are lending to the relatively young in this, in this story. So the monetary guys can uh, observe the growth shocks in the model and, uh, and set the price level. The fiscal authority can set taxes on labor uh, income or capital income, labor market authority runs, uh, observes household specific sh unemployment shocks and can handle that. And then the education authority can control this initial dispersion of, uh, of productivity that's uh, key to this model. So the policy mix is that the pol monetary policy f maker follows nominal GDP targeting the fiscal policymaker sets a, a linear labor income tax to fund the government. The unemployment, uh, I'm sorry, the labor market authority also sets a linear uh, labor income tax to fund the unemployment insurance scheme. Um, and then the education authority wants to minimize the dispersion uh, by setting this to a minimum. And the full social optimum would be get that minimum all the way down to zero. In that case, you'd have a perfectly equal economy. There is a theorem here under this that this is the first best allocation of resources and that the real interest rate equals the output growth rate, the stochastic output growth rate in this economy in the social optimum. So I'm going to skip the monetary, fiscal, and labor market policy. I'll just talk about this education policy. So uh, the education authority is is going to um, create, try to create this perfectly equal economy. If you don't think that was possible, then they would just want to minimize the amount of dispersion of uh, households as they come into the economy. If you could get it all the way to, if you could set this thing all the way to zero, then you would drive the consumption genie all the way to zero, and that would be the, the full social optimum. So here's, some, uh, here's just some pictures that kind of give you some idea about what's going on. Here's labor income in this model. The blue line is a basic uh, productivity profile. The households are more productive in the middle of life, but they also work more in the middle of life. And so you get this blue blob here for labor income. And if you calculate the Gini coefficient of that, you're going to get something in the 0.5 range. So this is where labor, inequal or labor income inequality comes from. You know, there are just as many people here 
vertically as there are in the middle, you know, vertically, but, um, uh, but, but the people in the peak earning years are earning more income and are more dispersed. Uh, the consumption mass uh, would be the red box here, so credit markets are going to work beautifully. People are going to be able to spread their uh, uneven labor market income across their whole life cycle, and you get this red uh, box here. So, and this is occurring at all these different levels. The Elon Musk is doing that. The doctor is doing that. The labor mark, the manual labor, also doing that. All these people are doing that, but they're doing it at different levels. <coughs> So uh, in this model, there's just the one asset. So the right-hand side is a net asset holders, and the uh, left-hand side is the borrowers. And it's got to integrate to one, and it's all very symmetric. So you get this picture uh, here about the borrowing and lending in the economy. The financial wealth genie will be just the uh, genie coefficient of the right-hand side of this uh, picture, because this always gets zeroed out when we calculate that in the data. And then there's a marginal propensity to consume, which you guys will love. Uh, I didn't introduce this notation, but I'll just show you the picture here. Um, this is the uh, marginal propensity to consume uh, for all households, no matter what uh, uh, level they're at as far as income. You could see uh, you're going to get a value like 0.5 for the people that are between about age 35 and age 65. Uh, and then you're going to get very high uh, marginal propensities to consume uh, for very young uh, and the, and the, the older uh, retired uh, agents that are consuming out of their savings. And then for inequality here are the Gini coefficients that you get in this baseline case here uh, relatively close to the data for Wealth, uh, this is if you use a log normal distribution, said we like to use the log normal, but it doesn't make that much difference on these calculations. Labor income is about a 0.51 as it is in the data. Consumption is about a 0.32. So without trying very hard, you're going to get Gini coefficients that are in the ballpark, and you could do lots of other things uh, in this model. And then I just want to concentrate on this for just a second, and this is my second to last slide. The, um, this is the uh, productivity dispersion parameter. So this is how much, uh, when you come into the model, how, how much dispersion is there in all those life cycle uh, productivity profiles. And as that goes higher and higher, these are the Gini coefficients. Green is the consumption Gini. Blue is the uh, labor income Gini. And red is the wealth Gini. And if you drive that dispersion higher and higher, you're going to drive all those Gini coefficients toward one. So that would be like the most unequal society you could ever think of. Uh, but then as you have this dispersion come down to zero, uh, the, the green line comes all the way down to zero. That's the consumption genie coming all the way down to zero. So you'd have uh, everyone consuming exactly the same amount at every date. However, what's interesting here is that the uh, wealth genie is still a 0.65. And the uh, labor income gene is still a 0.44, even at this full social optimum where you have uh, the uh, education authorities doing a brilliant job and giving us all the, exactly the same uh, skill levels uh, as we go into the economy at age 20. You could calibrate in different ways in order to hit different Gini coefficients. The black line hits the... Um, uh, the labor income genie and the uh, yellow line hits the wealth genie instead. All right, so I'll stop here. Uh, this is my story about how a classic combination of policies uh, could deliver the first best allocation of resources, even when there's a lot of in inequality in income, wealth, and consumption. So I'm saying that optimal policy doesn't change in the sense that the policymaker still has to provide the Wixellian natural real rate of interest, which I think is the kind of thing that would continue to hold no matter how you're going to write down your uh, monetary policy or in your monetary po the friction that monetary policy is trying to solve because it is about the real rate of interest. Uh, but you have to have the other 
parts of the uh, macroeconomic policy handling other aspects of the economy, in particular uh, unemployment insurance and in this uh, example here, a perfectly executed education policy which would drive the consumption genie towards zero uh, but would leave income and wealth genies at positive levels. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, first, uh, let me thank you, Governor Costa, uh, and to the organizers of this conference for the invitation to uh, participate. This has been uh, two days of uh, really full discussion. Uh, these differences around individuals, industries, and geographies within an economy is obviously a particularly relevant consideration for policymakers today as central banks around the world are confronting high inflation and tightening policy. And as the depth of the research that we've heard uh, just here at this conference suggests, the study of heterogeneity and macroeconomics is a rich and an active field. And these models that incorporate heterogeneity are necessarily complex, as we've seen again in the presentations, but I think as I've watched this literature over the past 10 years, our understanding has progressed in recent years. That said, and perhaps as a consequence of the complexity of the models, the role of heterogeneity can often appear to be overlooked in macroeconomics. But in my experience as a central banker, regardless of the state of the academic literature, it has long played an important role in policy making, and it continues to do so today. So my comments here are going to depart from the equations and from the modeling, and I am going to turn to this topic as a consumer of this literature and talk about some of the more qualitative aspects um, of this uh, idea. So in the case of the United States, one could argue that the very structure of the Federal Reserve System is a recognition of regional differences across the United States. In establishing 12 distinct regional banks, the Federal Reserve Act recognized that it was important to monitor a variety and diversity of conditions across the nation and to ensure that a range of communications were connected to the central bank. Monetary policy can affect industries and populations differently, and for a country like the United States, which has a history of skepticism surrounding centralized authority, it's critical for diverse regions of the country to have a voice in the making of policy. The benefits of a central bank that is engaged with diverse stakeholders is also evident in the Federal Reserve's focus on local and targeted outreach and engagement with communities across the country. For example, at the Kansas City Federal Reserve, and I am sure this is true for Jim Bullard's uh, organization. We hold regular symposiums, roundtables, advisory group meetings with representatives from diverse industries, geographies, cultures, and economic backgrounds. And perhaps most visible around the Federal Reserve has been uh, a program that we call Fed Listens, events where the Federal Reserve welcomes voices from a wide range of organizations, unions, small business owners, residents of low and moderate income communities, Native American leaders, and others, so that we can hear how monetary policy affects them and their local communities. Each of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks is also governed by a board of directors that is representative of their region's community business and labor interest. And it's at this regional level where the central bank can build trust and enhance communications in ways that resonate across a range of audiences. And in this regard, heterogeneity is very much central to the way the Federal Reserve operates. Through surveys and face-to-face -face engagement with a wide range of community members, we gain insight into how our policies can affect different groups in different ways. I'll close with this uh, example, I think, because it's been one that you hear a lot about. It's very much in the public's eye, and it has to do with how our policy may affect housing markets, particularly in the United States. 
And I'd start by noting, of course, we are largely constrained to using blunt policy tools, uh, which limits, of course, our ability to fine tune policies to particular segments of the population. But still, the potential distributional consequences, I think, cannot be dismissed. And one of those tools that has raised this question has been the use of our balance sheet policies. Even after some recent declines, house prices in the United States remain some 25% above their pre-pandemic trend. This is largely still an issue of supply, a hangover from the 2008 and 9 financial crisis, but one could argue it is partly due to the magnitude and duration of quantitative easing implemented by the Fed during the course of the last two years, and especially the purchase of more than a trillion dollars in mortgage-backed securities. Though the goal of these, of these purchases was not, of course, to explicitly support housing prices, it has been argued that those actions had that effect. So how are the benefits of supporting housing prices distributed? Of course, people who already own houses, who tend to be wealthier and older, certainly gain. However, their gain may be at the expense of others who cannot get their foot in the door when prices are extremely high, even if interest rates are also low. Loan to income and loan to value limits on mortgages are more likely to bind for people without large down payments. It's particularly true for young people at the beginning of their careers and others with relatively low incomes. So to the question, Pablo, that you asked earlier, heterogeneity certainly matters for policy design and our understanding of its effects are important. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now we have uh, Claudio. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the very kind invitation. It's, um, it's a pleasure for me to be back at this event. And I'm so sorry that I have to do it uh, only uh, remotely. Actually, from, not even from Basel, I'm here in Mexico, another event that we have organized here, a 20th anniversary of uh, the opening of the office. Um, so what I thought I would do, I, I, I get an echo, but I hope that you can hear me well. Um, uh, what I thought I would do would be to say a few words about something which uh, we have been looking at quite closely at the BIS, um, and something that was highlighted in the background paper that um, you, sent, uh, you sent around, which is the nexus between monetary policy and, and inequality. As as we know, this issue has come to the fore, in particular following the great uh, financial crisis, not least because of the perception that interest rates that were kept low for unusually low for unusually long in order to nurture the recovery and to boost inflation back to target were increasing wealth inequality by boosting asset prices, particularly the prices of equities, and at the same time depressing uh, the interest rate on, on deposits. Uh, the issue was further highlighted by the same type of policies that had to be followed in the wake of the COVID crisis. And more recently, they've come to the fore in a slightly different guise, but more familiar, older guise, if you like, as a result of the rise in, uh, in inflation. Um, I don't think it's controversial to say that fundamentally inequality in distributional aspects and long trends in inequality in particular are not related to, to monetary policy. They're way beyond monetary policy's reach because they have to do with structural factors. But um, at the BIS, we have argued that there is a lot that monetary policy can do to foster a more equitable distribution over successive business cycles. Because price, macroeconomic, and financial stability are essential for, uh, which are really what central bank mandates are about are in fact essential to make sure that, the, uh, that inequality does not increase uh, over time. Um, and at the same time, we have also argued that changes in the business cycle uh, that have taken place over time have complicated this task. So let me say a few words about this based on, um, uh, as I said, uh, some work that was put forward in, a, in particular in an annual economic report chapter 
that came uh, came out some some time ago. So I said that monetary policy has a role to play because the two major sources of inequality over business cycles, which are inflation and recessions or downturns, are what uh, central bank mandates are all about, which is to deliver price macroeconomic and financial stability. Um, by the way, in a way, I, I would say that this is probably similar to the point that was uh, that uh, Jim was making before, because effectively in in, the, in his model, as far as I understood it, the, the natural rate was a uh, you know, a summary statistic for the central bank task. Now, the impact, so let me say a few words about inflation and recessions. Now, the impact of inflation and inequality is amply studied, and I don't think I need to spend too much time on that, given that inflation is uh, one of the most regressive taxes that there can be. But what about recessions? Well, intuitively, recessions would increase inequality because, for example, the unskilled are the first to become unemployed. And indeed, there is plenty of evidence that uh, sort of documents this link between recessions and, and inequality. But the relationship actually goes further. First, there is evidence that all else equal, higher inequality deepens the uh, deepens recessions. And possibly a reason for this could be that uh, where inequality is higher, the proportion of vulnerable workers is, is also higher. But importantly, an imbalance higher inequality tends to reduce the impact of the monetary policy on the economy. A plausible explanation is that richer people have a lower marginal propensity to consume and that poorer people find it harder to, to borrow. Now, pu putting these findings together, you can get a certain perverse amplification because on the one hand, recessions increase inequality. On the other hand, inequality deepens recessions and re reduces the power of monetary policy which makes the task of monetary policy harder. Now, what I've just suggested is, uh, implies that if, much, if monetary policy keeps the economy on an even keel in the pursuit of its mandate, it will also keep in check the two major sources of inequality over business cycles, that is inflation and recessions. This will also be important to avoid the intertemporal trade-offs that uh, arise when things do go wrong and monetary policy has to bring the economy back on track because this inevitably generates some short-term costs in order to reap the longer-term benefits that are associated with a non-inflationary and stable growth. Let me say a few words about inflation and recessions in turn. Now, bringing inflation under control, we know, will tend to slow down economic activity, may even cause a recession, and this will increase inequality in the short run. But the whole point is that this will allow the central bank to reap the longer term benefits of lower unemployment and therefore on average lower inequality associated with non-inflationary growth. Now fighting the recession on the other hand raises more subtle trade-offs linked to the need to keep interest rates low in order to nurse a recovery. In this case there is no trade-off between income inequality uh, because higher employment tends to reduce it but there is a trade-off in terms of wealth inequality because, as I mentioned earlier, low for long will tend to increase asset prices, especially the prices of equities. Now, to be precise, this is not necessarily a given. It depends on the structure of asset holdings. One can imagine situations in which, for example, home ownership is sufficiently dispersed so that it is possible that, at least according to some measures, wealth inequality would actually fall when interest rates are kept low. But even then, even if that was the case, and according to some measures, very high house prices would still generate some unwelcome distributional consequences, like, for example, distributional effects between the old and the young. Now, these kinds of trade-offs always, are always present, but I think they have been exacerbated by changes in the nature of the business cycle that we have seen since the mid-1980s. What do I mean by that? Well, until the mid-80s, the key problem, as we know, was inflation and inflation-induced recessions. Central banks had to raise interest rates in order to quell inflationary pressures, which would slow down the economy. But from the mid-1980s onwards, COVID recession aside and the recent experience aside, the problem was not really inflation, but was financial imbalances. What you might call, we moved from financial, from inflation-induced recessions to financial cycle-induced recessions. So that with inflation low and stable, there was no need to raise interest rates, but huge financial expansions turned into contractions, leading to recessions. Like, for example, 
uh, but it's just one example of the great financial crisis. Now, this in some respects exacerbated trade-offs in two ways. First of all, because recessions became deeper and longer, especially if banking crisis uh, took place. So as a result, the central bank had to push harder with a bigger impact on wealth inequality. Second, with inflation expectations well anchored and inflation less responsive to economic slack during economic expansions, the central banks were able to push harder. So that meant that in the short run, they were able to raise employment and therefore reduce inequality, but at the expense of uh, facilitating or encouraging risk-taking, not leaning against the buildup of financial imbalances, and therefore raising the probability or the likelihood of a financial recession further down the road, financial recessions which have a particular a big impact on inequality. Now, with the recent surge in inflation, we're having a, a, a mixture of the two. We have a unique configuration for post-war standards, which is the risk of a recession linked to a monetary policy tightening intended to reduce inflation alongside alongside widespread financial vulnerabilities, particularly in the form of historically high debt levels, both private and public, and as was mentioned before, very high uh, property prices around the world. So this clearly sort of complicates the task for monetary policy. And this is something which maybe we'll come back to in, in the discussion that will follow. But the implication of all this, going back to what I said at the beginning, is that we need a more balanced policy approach, a policy approach that will also relieve some of the pressure on, on monetary policy to do the job. And that means um, having a holistic framework in which prudential, fiscal, but also structural policies have a role to play in what at the BIS we call a macrofinancial stability framework, which will allow uh, authorities to improve the intertemporal trade-offs and central banks face and better reconcile price, financial, and macroeconomic stability, and therefore, in the process, also reducing inequality over business fluctuations. But let me stop here. So let's do a, a second round of uh, interventions, uh, and more related now to communication. Uh, the fact that uh, inequality is part of the everyday political debate uh, as we've seen, it can affect the transmission mechanism. Uh, it will be very interesting to get the views of the panelists on how they, they see the communication of the issues of surrounding inequality uh, and how it interacts with the fulfillment of the, the mandate. So, Jim? I think on uh, this question, and one of the things a conference like this is really doing is um, making macroeconomics conversant and by extension monetary policy conversant on the questions around inequality. And the, the representative household idea, um, as useful as it was, uh, left uh, us macroeconomists stuttering when uh, issues about inequality came up and we didn't really have a clear answer. Now, I do think the earlier generation from which we learned uh, everything that we know uh, did have something in their minds about uh, inequality and it had to do, um, even if they didn't say it this way, it had to do with Gorman uh, aggregation somehow that, that uh, you could uh, write down a model and then it would have a representative household and it would have an analog heterogeneous agent household, but everything would be shared out uh, in the appropriate way. Um, I think that has broken down now. You have a lot of micro data that you want to be able to attack, uh, and you want to uh, be able to say with a straight face that uh, the policy I'm recommending is also a good policy, even when I take into account uh, the many dimensions of heterogeneity that, uh, that we'd like to take into account. So, uh, but this is a long process uh, that uh, involves um, uh, very difficult uh, research and uh, we're seeing a lot of it at this conference and a lot of, a lot of progress is being made. Um, but, but to me, the, the big goal is to be, uh, to be able to be conversant and to be able to say that um, uh, 
you know, you can't just bring up a heterogeneity and say, well, therefore, all kinds of macroeconomic policies must be wrong. Uh, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is if you had the, uh, these various frictions in the economy, and then you want to think about the right tools to address the right frictions, including, uh, you know, sort of credit market frictions the way I drew it up here, and, uh, and then somehow you get this uh, a group of macroeconomic policies to come together, and then that's what's going to get you to the best allocation of resources. So, so I do think it's uh, this uh, conversion this is a critical part of the uh, um, agenda here. I think I'll use the podium again. So I think Jim is right. This, um, the ability to communicate clearly, whether it's to the markets, whether it's to the public, um, about what policy is doing is particularly important. And um, I think about this in the context of some of the dynamics of the economy in the U.S. today. Um, when we think about what happened during the pandemic, uh, the U.S., of course, adopted extraordinary fiscal uh, policy, a response uh, to the pandemic to the tune of roughly $6 trillion, um, a large portion of that which went directly to uh, households and to businesses. And I think relative to previous programs, previous responses that we'd seen, this pandemic stimulus, of course, was distributed widely across the economy, and consequently, you saw a sharp improvement in household balance sheets with households uh, estimated to have some $2.3 trillion in excess savings relative to their pre-pandemic levels. So as the Federal Reserve tightens monetary policy with the aim of closing the imbalances uh, between demand and supply that's pushed up inflation, the dynamics of this excess saving uh, and the distribution of those savings is going to be a key factor, I think, shaping the outlook for output, for inflation, and certainly for interest rates. Higher saving, of course, provides uh, an important buffer to households that can ease the adjustment to economic disruptions. However, uh, as we look today, these higher savings could also provide a further impetus to consumption as the central bank slows the pace of demand growth. And higher saving, of course, can lessen a precautionary pullback in consumption. It could well take a higher interest rate for some time to convince households to hold on to their savings rather than spend it down. And that, of course, adding to inflationary pressure. So how saving affects the outlook is going to be particularly and importantly affected by the distribution of those excess savings across households. Heterogeneity here, of course, is going to matter, and we heard some of that uh, over the past two days. If these savings are concentrated in the upper brackets of the wealth distribution, a group that tends to spend a smaller share of their wealth and income, the higher savings might provide little additional momentum to consumption. However, if those savings are spread more evenly across the population, including households with a higher propensity to spend, out of their wealth, then the effect on the persistence of consumption is likely to be larger. When we look currently at the data, it suggests that this savings remains elevated across the wealth distribution. But I think more recently, we've seen signs that suggest that lower income households are running down their buffers quickly. So monitoring the distribution of that savings is likely to be important as we think about the course of the economy and, of course, the path for policy. So while high savings is likely to provide momentum to consumption and require higher interest rates, it's certainly positive that we see that these households are wealthier, less financially constrained, and better insured. But that said, reduced inflation will mean we have to incent saving over consumption. And the short-run pain from monetary contraction is lowest when demand moderation is progressive across the income distribution. And moderating that demand growth by encouraging high-income households to save more with higher interest rates would certainly be preferable to crashing the consumption of lower-income households. Acknowledging heterogeneity can also improve our understanding of the forces contributing to elevated inflation. 
Overall, wage growth remains strong in the U.S., reflecting what by many measures has been a historically tight labor market. With inflation recently rotating from goods to services prices as supply chain disruptions ease and the labor market remains tight, understanding this wage growth is likely to be important for understanding the overall path of inflation. When we look at nominal wage growth for the median worker, it's tracking at 6% when you look at the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker. But this aggregate number masks, I think, an important difference between job stayers and job movers. The median worker who switches jobs sees more than 7% wage growth, which is substantially higher than those that stay put at their current job. And the rate at which people switch jobs has increased significantly, especially for prime age workers whose average tenure at their current job fell by about three months from 2020 to 2022. So with labor markets historically tight, a calmer labor market with fewer quits and less churn could lower this job switching and reduce inflationary pressures by lowering nominal wage growth. The last thing I'd want to say about this um, is related to labor productivity, which of course is going to also affect uh, inflation dynamics. And in this regard, of course, we saw in the first half of this year a substantial reduction in average labor productivity. If weaker labor markets force people to stay put longer, then they may become more proficient and labor productivity growth may provide some inflationary relief in the near term. Currently, many of my contacts in the Kansas City Fed region report problems with low worker engagement, which is a drag on productivity. If workers who no longer see their current job as replaceable become more engaged, they may also over time become more productive. So again, understanding these effects at this juncture in the cycle I think is particularly important. Um, and certainly, as uh, Jim just said, an important aspect of our communication uh, from the central bank. Thank you. Claudio. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pablo. I, I thought that I would talk a little bit uh, about an aspect of heterogeneity, which I think is quite important in, at the current juncture, which is heterogeneity in, in expectations. Uh, and I think here it's important to distinguish the expectations of professional forecasters from those of financial markets and from those of work workers and, and, and firms. And the key point here is that these types of agents typically form their expectations quite differently and their, own ex their expectations have a very different impact on, on inflation. Um, so, for example, professional forecasters, I mean, they're the closest to central banks. I mean, they largely use the same type of forecasting methods so that there's very little independent information that the central bank can get by, by looking at uh, what the, say, the IMF or the consensus forecast basically tell us. Financial markets actually rely quite a lot on the um, forecast made by professional forecasters and they're strongly influenced by what central banks say the future is going to look like. But of course, they blend these assessments with their own view. You can think of financial markets as a kind of huge machinery to process information and to reflect that on, into, into asset prices. Now, in contrast to the expectations of, say, professional forecasting, those of financial markets do have an important impact on, on inflation. They have it through financial conditions, financial conditions that can affect not just the transmission of monetary policy, but have a first order impact on inflation through, for example, what happens to the exchange rate. And this is something which is quite important in emerging market economies. Finally, we get to workers and firms. Um, and to simplify, all the evidence that we have suggests that their expectations are much more backward looking based on the behavior of inflation itself. And, but they have a much more direct impact on, on inflation because it is wage earners and price setters that basically roughly decide what inflation is going to look like by, because wages and prices uh, are at the core of the inflation process. Now, these differences in the, in the way in which people form expectations has informed a, a, a view of the inflation process that we have put forward in the latest annual economic report documented there, but it will be further documented in a monograph that will be coming out soon 
which is complementary to, to that which is implicit or explicit in the traditional, say, Phillips curve. And this is a view of the inflation process, which sees it as two, uh, two regimes, a high and a low inflation regime, with self-reinforcing transitions from low to high. Why two regimes? Well, first of all, because if you actually look at the data, the behavior of inflation is very different in, in, in the two. In a low inflation regime, what we measure as inflation, in fact, simply largely reflects uncorrelated price changes in a myriad of sector specific prices, which leave only a temporary imprint on the inflation rate itself. And moreover, wages and prices are only rather loosely linked, so that a low inflation regime has a certain self-stabilizing properties. A high inflation regime, by contrast, is quite different. A common component of price changes is much higher. Wages and prices are much more, much more closely linked. And therefore, this regime doesn't have the same self-stabilizing properties as a low inflation regime does. And for example, inflation rate is much more sensitive to one-off large changes in, say, energy prices, food prices, or indeed the, the exchange rate. Now, arguably, a key reason uh, why the low inflation regime is so, seems to be so, has these self-stabilizing properties is that when inflation is low, households, workers, and firms hardly notice it. So that inflation has little impact on, on, on their day-to-day -day behavior. If you recall, the very definition of price stability that Volcker and then Greenspan gave is precisely a situation in which inflation has no material effect on, uh, on, the, uh, on the behavior of agents. And this also helps explain why transitions from low to high inflation regimes can be self-reinforcing. First of all, inflation snaps out of the zone of rational inattention into the uh, region of sharp focus. Second, it becomes more representative of the price indices that are relevant for individual firms, for individual households, because price increases become more synchronized and similar across uh, different categories. So that they can act as inflation, can act as a better coordinating device for agents' uh, decisions, therefore increasing the likelihood of wage and price spirals. And finally, of course, we know that through a number of mechanisms, once inflation be becomes high and persistent enough, then an inflation psychology sets in, which accelerates the process. So what are, this brings me to the implications for communication. Well, we know that communication is key for our policy effectiveness and for policy accountability. And it is especially important when inflation is flaring up, flaring up and you want to avoid this transition from a low to a high inflation regime because you want to steer expectations and because you want to justify your costly actions so that they're better understood and therefore better accepted. Remember this short versus long run trade-offs that I discussed earlier. Now, the fact that the audiences are heterogeneous raises a number of challenges. First of all, take communication with, the, uh, with professional forecasters of financial markets. Now, this communication is important, especially to the extent that it affects financial markets because of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Financial markets indirectly can have an important impact on, on inflation. This communication is facilitated at the same time by the fact that central banks, financial market participants and professional forecasters use very much the same language. Now, the challenge here is not to be lulled into a false sense of security because central banks, professional forecasters, and to some extent financial markets tend to see the future in very, very similar ways because they use the same information very much in, in the same kind of way. So that, uh, but at the same time, they don't have a direct impact on wages and prices. Therefore, the central bank may, if you like, look itself in the mirror think that it is particularly credible, but from the perspective of wages and price setters, uh, that is not that particularly important at that point in time because their own expectations are such that they see higher inflation in, in the pipeline, or indeed they are already trying to catch up with losses in purchasing power of compression in profit margins that they have seen as a result of big and persistent increases in prices. 
So, communication with the uh, households or particular wage, wage earners and firms is particularly important. But at the same time, these, it's harder, ex their expectations are harder to measure reliably. Surveys can take us only that far. These audiences are harder to read. And of course, their expectations are also harder to influence because they're very much backward looking. And to the, the extent to which you can influence these expectations and you can influence these decisions will also partly be determined by institutional arrangements. For example, in, in, in contexts in which you have rather centralized wage bargaining, that's a precise situation in which the central bank can have a more direct impact that could otherwise be the case if you have a, an economy which is very dispersed and wage setting, wage bargaining is, is uh, largely decentralized. Now, what this suggests to me is that at the end of the day, actions speak louder than words. And the best strategy, of course, is to, to walk the talk. And given the self-reinforcing nature of transitions, I think it's important to act in a timely and firm way with a steady hand, while at the same time, of course, being ready to adjust one's decisions in the light of the evolving circumstances until the job is done. Thank you. Now, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Yes, Marco. Uh, yes, I have a few questions. I mean, one is, is for Jim, and, and the other is maybe for, for everybody. The question for Jim is the following. When you started your presentation, and you basically described the first best, I thought you would say, well, and now reality is one in which actually not, not all the four horsemen do their job, and therefore a trade-off arises for monetary policy, and, you know, and, and then discuss that. So I wonder whether, I mean, when, I'm not an expert uh, on, on inequality by any stretch of the imagination, but my sense is that when people look at, say, NPCs, inequality, the control for age effects. Therefore, maybe, you know, it's not all, all these, these, these differences are not all due to the, to the life cycle. And so maybe the, you know, the, the world we live in is one in which um, the other authorities don't uh, necessarily do fully their job. So I, I was wondering whether part of your future research agenda goes in that direction. And then for uh, the second question for all the panels, I mean, you know, to, to me, maybe a key question in terms of communication and, and on, on inequality is asking what, to what extent the central bank, central banks should uh, uh, discuss inequality and the, the, the possible perils that that entails. I mean, the, the new framework to some extent, goes into that, and and uh, um, yeah, and I mean, I was curious to know your your thoughts about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Luca. Yeah. So, so I want to just build a little bit on, on uh, what Marco said about the uh, the question on, on, on you know whether uh, whether central banks should incorporate inequality uh, more or less explicitly. Let's say. So, uh, just to frame to frame the. The, maybe the, the debate a little bit. I think there are like pros and cons, right? I mean, there are clearly advantages of having uh, a very sort of narrowly focused uh, institution, um, an institutional mission, which is that you know the policy goals are very clear, they are very transparent, and it's you know speaking of communication, it's much easier to communicate if your policy goals are, are clear. Um, I mean, the risk, obviously, I think, and and it's. You know, maybe one of the reasons why uh, so, so the, the Fed incorporated more explicitly, certainly, than the ECB, um, uh, you know, a, a broader based, uh, um, you know, employment mandate in, uh, in its goals, it's that, you know, the central bank could appear completely oblivious to uh, what one might say is kind of the central issue of the century. Uh, or at least one of the central issues of the century. The other one is probably climate change, which is, <laughs> in fact, one other, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, if you like, temptation of mission creep. Uh, 
And, and, you know, and if this is the case, then you know, the central banks can become the target of like, political attacks from you know, certain, I think, maybe uh, you know, special interest group. And that would put, at, at, I think, at, at risk the very independence of, of central banks. So, I mean, there, I think there is a trade-off there, and, and just uh, me too, I, I'm also interested in, in, in knowing what you think. And the other, the other question I have is sort of more, um, is also a you know, big picture question. I mean, I'd be curious to know how you, you think about the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, I mean, at, at a, I'm, I'm thinking at the business cycle frequency, obviously. Um, and this goes a little bit beyond the, the you know, heterogeneity macro, because we know since you know, Sargent and Wallace that uh, you know, monetary policy, uh, the effects of monetary policy can be very different depending on whether the, you know, the, the, the fiscal policy follows like a, a you know, more, more or less active um, type of uh, fiscal rule. Uh, but you know, speaking you know, within the heterogeneous agent framework, um, uh, you know, we, in all our models uh, that have been presented in the last couple of days, uh, you know, the sort of the fiscal response, the fiscal reaction to uh, monetary policy matters a lot for the transmission, the, the aggregate effects, and so on. So, if it, if it, you know, how do you think about this interaction in general? Go with Jim. Okay, so Marco, I understood your first question to be, well, what if one of the other policymakers is not doing their job? Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting, but I, you, know, you kind of know what we're gonna find. The monetary policy is correcting the credit market friction by, by moving the price level around in order to influence the real interest rate. That's gonna get exactly the right interest rate for all these intertemporal trades that have to be made in this economy. It's not well suited for uh, providing unemployment insurance through some other mechanism, and it's not well suited to, um, you know, fixing other kinds of frictions that, that might arise if one of the other. Certainly, not well suited to try to pro, uh, make up for human capital issues that have accrued during the uh, as these people were growing up and uh, coming into adulthood. So uh, now you could think about, okay, well, let's do some, you know, let's do something else that would actually address that issue instead of saying, well, because of that, we're going to have keep interest rates lower or something. I'm not even sure you might get make things worse, you know, uh, if you did it that way. Yeah. 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 But this, that's a world where, okay, so I think for this group here, I mean, this, what I wrote down was a model of ex ante differences among uh, agents. And I motivated that with this pre age 20 world where something else is happening. Now, you could put more of a model on that and say, well, what's happening in that world? But here, you're just taking that as given and saying, um, Look, uh, by the time people are age 23, according to Huggett Venture in your own, you can basically predict their whole lifetime income, and the shock part doesn't matter that much. So there's an extreme version of that. No. Um, on the question of communication and the new framework, um, I think uh, you know we definitely tried to make a strides in the direction of uh, you know. To me, it was just, I said this earlier at this conference, was just a recognition that macroeconomics is always about everybody in the whole economy. And it was never intended, I don't think, by anybody that has participated in this profession to say that, oh, we just want to focus on this group or we just want to focus on that group. When you look at the welfare theorems and, and everything, it's all about you know, whoever you've got in your model, you're trying to do the best you can for everybody in the model. So. Um, I thought some of the language that we adopted sort of tried to get to some of that and, and uh, fight back against critics who would say that, you know, this is all about, you know, intersecting with Wall Street or the biggest banks and, and stuff like that. So there is an element of that because of the way monetary policy is implemented because it is an interest rate policy and it does affect asset pricing all around the world. 
So for that reason, it's important. But when we're thinking about macroeconomics, we're, we're trying to think about everybody. And I, I think that that's critical um, to prevent uh, the sort of political attack that uh, Gianluca uh, just mentioned and the risk to independence that could come with that and probably has come with that in other places in the world, including uh, parts of Latin America. Um, and then finally on this take, uh, my take on the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. Well, one of the things I said during my talk here, and I try to get on my high horse about this, but the, why do the monetary policy guys meet so often? Why do we meet so often? <laughs> <laughs> so the notion is that the monetary policy can react quickly uh, to incoming shocks and changes in economic circumstances and I've kind of become a big believer in that. I think that's true. That is what you want to do. You, and you're, t you're spending gobs of time assessing the economy, assessing all the risks that are coming in. And then you're trying to make the right monetary policy adjustment. Fiscal policy, in many ways, is probably much more powerful. But I don't think you want to be changing the taxes every six weeks. Uh, and so the, the notion is, in the, at least in what I wrote down, you would want the policy, the monetary guys to be meeting uh, all the time and assessing what shocks came in. And you could set your uh, fiscal program for the long run, well, literally forever in this model, but you know, certainly for the medium term and the long term, set the taxes the way you want the taxes set and accomplishing whatever you're trying to accomplish with the tax code and then pretty much leave them alone uh, most of the time because it causes a lot of consternation when you try to change taxes and the political system is not fast at reacting uh, to things. Now, we did have the pandemic and the pandemic had a big fiscal reaction so it can be done in a kind of warlike, if there's warlike footing, but um, probably not on a, on a sort of day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So I don't know, that was, that's kind of an older view maybe of uh, the, the distinction between monetary and fiscal policy. I guess I would just uh, <clears throat> add to that thought. So the question about should we be talking about inequality um, as a central bank and tying it to this issue of sticking with your mandate, um, I think what we heard in 2019 when we did this Fed Listens Tour, so this came ahead of adjusting the framework, was how much people cared about jobs, questions they had about how our decision making affected the, had affected the households uh, that we engage with. So I think without suggesting that we would be broadening our mandate, using language like broad and inclusive, as Jim said, was designed to say we are listening, we understand that there are many dynamics in the economy that land differently on people. And so we have to be completely accountable to the mandate we were given. And I think we have to be very careful to always couch our responses in that context. But I also think in order to be credible with the public, to earn their trust, you can't avoid some of the questions I think that, that people generally have. And the only other thing I would add to the monetary fiscal interaction, I think for me, was watching and comparing and contrasting what happened during the great financial crisis and what happened during the pandemic. I think as I watch those two episodes, the very rapid and the very aggressive and large response that came out of the fiscal authority, I think will be interesting as all of you study this and we think about the head, how that might have influenced monetary policy differently at some point because it was widely dispersed, it was pretty direct in terms of its impact uh, there. And that's different than what I might consider to be normal times waiting for fiscal policy. And it's also what led, as you know, during the great financial crisis to the idea the central banks were the only game in town because of their nimbleness uh, in responding. So you kind of saw two extremes, I think, uh, in both of these episodes. So Claudio, any closing thoughts? Um, well, yes, first of all, um, central banking is much more than just monetary policy. Uh, I mean, if you look at mandates across, and the mandate has to be the lodestar of everything that a central bank does. But if you look around the world, uh, depending on which country you are, uh, the central bank operates in, it will have different mandates. But the mandates, and there are many things that central banks can do 
in order to foster a more equal society in in fulfillment of their mandates. And for example, depending uh, depending on what their specific responsibilities and tools are, they could be by promoting financial development, inclusion and uh, literacy, by contributing in some cases even to consumer protection, or even by just by making payments more more efficient and, and, and competitive. And the key is that you know you have a mandate, you pursue your mandate, and you have to explain whether you like it or not in order to be accountable. And when people ask you questions, you will have to explain. If people are concerned about their inequality, you will have to explain to them to what extent pursuing your mandate is conducive or not to that specific objective. And basically what I, what I explained before was precisely designed to do that. It was a way of trying to explain um, what central banks can and what central banks cannot do where the mar- wearing their monetary policy hat in terms of influencing uh, the distribution of income and wealth. Um, on fiscal policy, um, well, this is a very, it's a multifaceted uh, question and issue. I mean, for example, most recently, the, uh, it has come up with the, with the fact that in many countries, uh, fiscal authorities have been trying to shield the population from um, uh, the impact of higher energy prices, higher food prices, and the question is to what extent they have uh, they are targeting that would be the first best the people that need it most or what in fact they tend to do is actually to um, to provide more general subsidies but there is nothing that central bank can do but to take that into into account when it sets policy now something that has been complicated complicating this very neat distinction between monetary and fiscal policy is the fact that balance sheet policies themselves have tended to blur the line be- between the two. And the most obvious example is the fact that uh, large-scale asset purchases have a big impact on the um, on f- on fiscal positions through remittances from the central bank to, to the government. So, for example, while many people say, well, v- very low interest rates, have meant that uh, governments have been able to finance themselves at a very low end and very cheaply so that the the, uh, fiscal positions are not particularly sensitive to higher interest rates. Well, in fact, in in those countries in which uh, central banks have been buying a lot of government debt, it turns out that something like 30 to 50 percent of of, uh, the consolidated public sector balance sheet, which includes the central bank position, has been financed at at uh, index to the short-term overnight rate because it's it's taken the form of excess reserves. So effectively what has happened is that it's as if the government had been retiring long-term debt and um, uh, issuing very short-term debt in, instead. So um, anyway, but, the, but as I say, there is nothing that the, the central bank can do but take fiscal, policy, fiscal positions given and try to pursue its mandate. Uh, we are ending the panel, and uh, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. And we have some closing remarks from Gianluca. On now? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So uh, it's been another intense and long day. <laughs> um, so I have some uh, very quickly, uh, like to officially conclude the conference with some acknowledgement. First of all, I want to uh, thank obviously the Bank of Chile and um, Governor Costa for sponsoring the event. Uh, and uh, um, you know, you, I'm sure you all agree that uh, you know the organization of the conference was absolutely spotless. Uh, so we need to all thank the, the all-star team that made this possible. Um, Alvaro Castillo, Costanza Mantelli, Maria Jose Reyes, and Daniela Gaete. I hope my <laughs> pronunciation was, was good. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, then I want to uh, personally thank uh, Sofia uh, and Andres, uh, uh, my teammates. 
um, who came up with the idea of the conference. And you know, as researchers, we know that the idea is everything. So I've been a, a, a mere array research assistant to their, to their project. So thank you very much uh, for everything. Um, and then finally, finally, uh, the uh, policy uh, panel participants, uh, all the presenters and, and, and discussants, and, and the audience, obviously, for making this uh, a very lively and interesting conference. I think we, we all learned a lot in, in every session. Um, finally, uh, one last thing, there is, there is a volume uh, to put together. Um, we're going to start working on that, and uh, we're going to send you an email with, uh, with follow-up uh, instructions uh, on the timeline. Thanks again. It was great to have you all here, and... Uh, uh, thanks. And safe travels. Safe travels. Yes, ending uh, with a deadline. <laughs> <laughs>